Introduction to The Last of the Mohicans, a narrative of 1757 by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Introduction it is believed that the scene of this tale, and most of the information necessary to understand its illusions, are rendered sufficiently obvious to the reader in the text itself or in the accompanying notes. Still, there is so much obscurity in the Indian traditions, and so much confusion in the Indian names, to render some explanation useful. Few men exhibit greater diversity or, if we may so express it, greater antithesis of character than the native warrior of North America. In war, he is daring, boastful, cunning, ruthless, self-denying, and self-devoted. In peace, just, generous, hospitable, revengeful, superstitious, modest, and commonly chaste. These are qualities, it is true, which do not distinguish all alike, but they are so far the predominating traits of these remarkable people as to be characteristic. It is generally believed that the aborigines of the American continent have an Asiatic origin. There are many physical as well as moral facts which corroborate this opinion, and some few that would seem to weigh against it. The color of the Indian, the writer believes, is peculiar to himself, and while his cheekbones have a very striking indication of Tartar origin, his eyes have not. Climate may have had great influence on the former, but it is difficult to see how it can have produced the substantial difference which exists in the latter. The imagery of the Indian, both in his poetry and his oratory, is oriental, chastened, and perhaps improved, by the limited range of his practical knowledge. He draws his metaphors from the clouds, the seasons, the birds, the beast, and the vegetable world. In this, perhaps, he does no more than any other energetic and imaginative race would do being compelled to set bounds to fancy by experience. But the North American Indian clothes his ideas in a dress which is different from that of the African, and is oriental in itself. His language has the richness and sententious fullness of the Chinese. He will express a phrase in a word, and he will qualify the meaning of an entire sentence by a syllable. He will even convey different significations by the simplest inflections of the voice. Philologists have said that there are but two or three languages, properly speaking, among all the numerous tribes which formerly occupied the country that now composes the United States. They ascribe the known difficulty one people have to understand another to corruptions and dialects. The writer remembers to have been present at an interview between two chiefs of the great prairies west of the Mississippi, and when an interpreter was in attendance who spoke both their languages. The warriors appeared to be on the most friendly terms, and seemingly conversed much together. Yet, according to the account of the interpreter, each was absolutely ignorant of what the other said. They were of hostile tribes, brought together by the influence of the American government. And, it is worthy of remark, that a common policy led them both to adopt the same subject. They mutually exhorted each other to be of use in the event of the chances of war throwing either of the parties into the hands of his enemies. 
Whatever may be the truth as respects the root and genius of the Indian tongues, it is quite certain they are now so distinct in their words as to possess most of the disadvantages of strange languages. Hence much of the embarrassment that has arisen in learning their histories, and most of the uncertainty which exists in their traditions. Like nations of higher pretensions, the American Indian gives a very different account of his own tribal race from that which is given by other people. He is much addicted to overestimating his own perfections and to undervaluing those of his rival or his enemy, a trait which may possibly be thought corroborative of the mosaic account of the creation. The whites have assisted greatly in rendering the traditions of the Aborigines more obscure by their own manner of corrupting names. Thus, the term used in the title of this book has undergone the changes of Mohicani, Mohicans, and Mohegans, the latter being the word commonly used by the whites. When it is remembered that the Dutch, who first settled New York, the English, and the French, all gave appellations to the tribes that dwelt within the country which is the scene of this story, and that the Indians not only gave different names to their enemies, but frequently to themselves, the cause of the confusion will be understood. In these pages, Lenny Lenape, Lenope, Delawares, Wapanachki, and Mohicans all mean the same people, or tribes of the same stock. The Mengwe, the Maquas, the Mingos, and the Iroquois though not all strictly the same, are identified frequently by the speakers being politically confederated and opposed to those just named. Mingo was a term of peculiar reproach, as were Mangue and Maqua to a less degree. The Mohicans were the possessors of the country first occupied by the Europeans in this portion of the continent. They were, consequently, the first dispossessed, and the seemingly inevitable fate of all these people who disappear before the advances, or it might be termed the inroads of civilization, as the vendure of their native forest falls before the nipping frost, is represented as having already befallen them. There is sufficient historical truth in the picture to justify the use that has been made of it. In point of fact, the country which is the scene of the following tale has undergone as little change since the historical events alluded to had place as almost any other district of equal extent within the whole limits of the United States. There are fashionable and well-attended watering places at and near the spring where Hawkeye halted to drink, and roads traverse the forest where he and his friends were compelled to journey without even a path. Glens has a large village, and while William Henry and even a fortress of later date are only to be traced as ruins, there is another village on the shores of the Horican. But, beyond this, the enterprise and energy of a people who have done so much in other places have done little here. The whole of that wilderness in which the later incidents of the legend occurred is nearly a wilderness still, though the red man has entirely deserted this part of the state. Of all the tribes named in these pages, there exist only a few half-civilized beings of the Unitas on the reservations of their people in New York. The rest have disappeared, either from the regions in which their fathers dwelt or altogether from the earth. There is one point on which we would wish to say a word before closing this preface. Hawkeye calls the Lac du Saint Sacrament the Horican. As we believe this to be an appropriation of the name that has its origin with ourselves, the time has arrived, perhaps, when the fact should be frankly admitted. While writing this book, fully a quarter of a century since, it occurred to us that the French name of this lake was too complicated, 
the American too commonplace and the Indian too unpronounceable for either to be used familiarly in a work of fiction. Looking over an ancient map, it was ascertained that the, a tribe of Indians called Les Horicans by the French existed in the neighborhood of this beautiful sheet of water. As every word uttered by Natty Bumpo was not to be received as rigid truth, we took the liberty of putting the horican into his mouth, as the substitute for Lake George. The name has appeared to find favor, and, all things considered, it may possibly be quite as well to let it stand, instead of going back to the House of Hanover for the appellation of our finest sheet of water. We relieve our conscience by the confession, all events leaving it to exercise its authority as it may see fit. End of Introduction This recording by Gary W. Sherwin of Yukon, Pennsylvania, in the summer of 2007. Chapter 1 of The Last of the Mohicans a narrative of 1757 by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 1 Quote, Mine ear is open and my heart prepared. The worst is worldly loss thou canst unfold. Say, is my kingdom lost? Unquote. Shakespeare. It was a feature peculiar to the colonial wars of North America that the toils and dangers of the wilderness were to be encountered before the adverse host could meet. A wide and apparently an impervious boundary of forest severed the possessions of the hostile provinces of France and England. The hardy colonist and the trained European who fought at his side frequently expended months in struggling against the rapids of the streams or in effecting the rugged passes of the mountains in quest of an opportunity to exhibit their courage in a more martial conflict. But, emulating the patience and self-denial of the practiced native warriors, they learned to overcome every difficulty and, it would seem that, in time, there was no recess of the woods so dark, nor any secret place so lovely, that it might claim exemption from the inroads of those who had pledged their blood to satiate their vengeance, or uphold the cold and selfish policy of the distant monarchs of Europe. Perhaps no district throughout the wide extent of the intermediate frontiers can furnish a livelier picture of the cruelty and fierceness of the savage warfare of those periods, than the country which lies between the headwaters of the Hudson and the adjacent lakes. The facilities which nature had there offered to the march of the combatants were too obvious to be neglected. The lengthened sheet of the Champlain stretched from the frontiers of Canada deep within the borders of the neighboring province of New York, forming a natural passage across half the distance that the French were compelled to master in order to strike their enemies. Near its southern termination, it received the contributions of another lake, whose waters were so limpid as to have been exclusively selected by the Jesuit missionaries to perform the typical purification of baptism, and to obtain for it the title of Lake du Saint-Sacrement. The less zealous English thought they conferred a sufficient honor on its unsullied fountains when they bestowed the name of their reigning prince, the second of the House of Hanover. The two united to rob the untutored possessors of its wooded scenery of their native right to perpetuate its original appellation of Horican. Footnote. As each nation of the Indians had its language or its dialect, they usually gave different names to the same places, though nearly all of their appellations were descriptive of the object. Thus, a literal translation of the name of this beautiful sheet of water 
used by the tribe that dwelt on its banks, would be the tail of the lake. Lake George, as it is vulgarly and now indeed legally called, forms a sort of tail to Lake Champlain when viewed on the map. Hence the name. End of footnote. Winding its way among countless islands and embedded in mountains, the holy lake extended a dozen leagues still further to the south. With the high plain that there interposed itself to the further passage of water, commenced a portage of as many miles, which conducted the adventurer to the banks of the Hudson, at a point where the usual obstructions of the rapids, or rifts as they were termed in the language of the country, the river became navigable to the tide. While in the pursuit of their daring plans of annoyance, the restless enterprise of the French even attempted the distant and difficult gorges of the Allegheny. It may easily be imagined that their proverbial acuteness would not overlook the natural advantages of the district we have just described. It became, emphatically, the bloody arena in which most of the battles for the mastery of the colonies were contested. Forts were erected at the different points that commanded the facilities of the route, and were taken and retaken, raised and rebuilt, as victory alighted on the hostile batters. While the husbandmen shrank back from the dangerous passes within the safer boundaries of the more ancient settlements, armies larger than those that had often deposed of the scepters of the mother countries were seen to bury themselves in these forests, whence they rarely returned but in skeleton bands that were haggard with care or dejected by defeat. Though the arts of peace were unknown to this fatal region, its forests were alive with men, its shades and glens rang with the sounds of martial music, and the echoes of its mountains threw back the laugh, or repeated the wanton cry, of many a gallant and reckless youth as he hurried by them, in the noontide of his spirits, to slumber in a long night of forgetfulness. It was in this scene of strife and bloodshed that the incidents we shall attempt to relate occurred, during the third year of the war which England and France last waged, for the possession of a country that neither was destined to retain. The imbecility of her military leaders abroad, and the fatal one of energy in her councils at home, had lowered the character of Great Britain from the proud elevation on which it had been placed by the talents and enterprise of her former warriors and statesmen. No longer dreaded by her enemies, her servants were fast losing the confidence of self-respect. In this mortifying abasement, the colonists, though innocent of her imbecility, and too humble to be the agents of her blunders, were but the natural participators. They had recently seen a chosen army from that country, which, reverencing as a mother, they had blindly believed invincible. An army led by a chief who had been selected from a crowd of trained warriors for his rare military endowments, disgracefully routed by a handful of French and Indians, and only saved from annihilation by the coolness and spirit of a Virginia boy, whose riper fame has since diffused itself with the steady influence of moral truth to the uttermost confines of Christendom. Footnote. Washington, who, after uselessly admonishing the European general of the danger into which he was heedlessly running, saved the remnants of the British army on this occasion by his decision and courage. The reputation earned by Washington in this battle was the principal cause of his being selected to command the American armies at a later day. It is a circumstance worthy of observation that while all America rang with his well-merited reputation, his name does not occur in any European account of the battle. At least, the author has searched for it without success. In this manner does the mother country absorb even the fame under that system of rule. End footnote. A wide frontier had been laid naked by this unexpected disaster. 
and more substantial evils were preceded by a thousand fanciful and imaginary dangers. The alarmed colonists believed that the yells of the savages mingled with every fitful gust of wind that issued from the interminable forest of the West. The terrific character of their merciless enemies increased immeasurably the natural horrors of warfare. Numberless recent massacres were still vivid in their recollections, nor was there any ear in the provinces so deaf as not to have drunk in with avidity the narrative of some fearful tale of midnight murder, in which the natives of the forest were the principal and barbarous actors. As the credulous and excited traveler related the hazardous chances of the wilderness, the blood of the timid curdled with terror, and mothers cast anxious glances even at those children which slumbered within the security of the largest towns. In short, the magnifying influence of fear began to set at naught the calculations of reason, and to render those who should have remembered their manhood the slaves of the basest passions. Even the most confident and stoutest hearts began to think the issue of the contest was becoming doubtful, and that abject class was hourly increasing in numbers who thought they foresaw all the possessions of the English crown in America, subdued by their Christian foes, or laid waste by the inroads of their relentless allies. When, therefore, intelligence was received at the fort which covered the southern termination of the portage between the Hudson and the Lakes, that Montcalm had been seen moving up the Champlain, with an army, numerous as the leaves on the trees, its truth was admitted with more of the craven reluctance of fear than with the stern joy that a warrior should feel in finding an enemy within reach of his blow. The news had been brought, toward the decline of a day in midsummer, by an Indian runner, who also bore an urgent request from Monroe, the commander of a work on the shore of the Holy Lake, for a speedy and powerful reinforcement. It has already been mentioned that the distance between these two posts was less than five leagues. The rude path which originally formed their line of communication had been widened for the passage of wagons, so that the distance which had been traveled by the son of the forest in two hours might easily be effected by a detachment of troops with their necessary baggage between the rising and setting of a summer sun. The loyal servants of the British crown had given to one of these forest fastnesses the name of William Henry, and to the other that of Fort Edward, calling each after a favorite prince of the reigning family. The veteran Scotchman just named held the first with a regiment of regulars and a few provincials, a force really by far too small to make head against the formidable power that Montcalm was leading to the foot of his earthen mounds. At the latter, however, lay General Webb, who commanded the armies of the king in the northern provinces, with a body of more than five thousand men. By uniting the several detachments of his command, this officer might have arrayed nearly double that number of combatants against the enterprising Frenchman, who had ventured so far from his reinforcements, with an army but little superior in numbers. But, under the influence of their degraded fortunes, both officers and men appeared better disposed to wait the approach of their formidable antagonists within their works, than to resist the progress of their march by emulating the successful example of the French at Fort Duquesne, and striking a blow on their advance. After the first surprise of the intelligence had a little abated, a rumor was spread through the entrenched camp which stretched along the margin of the Hudson, forming a chain of outworks to the body of the fort itself, that a chosen detachment of 1,500 men was to depart with the dawn for William Henry, the post at the northern extremity of the portage. That, which at first was only a rumor, soon became certainty. As orders passed from the quarters of the commander-in-chief to the several corps he had selected for his service to prepare for their speedy departure. 
all doubts as the intention of Webb now vanished, and an hour or two of hurried footsteps and anxious faces succeeded. The novice in the military art flew from point to point, retarding his own preparations by the excess of his violent and somewhat distempered zeal, while the more practiced veteran made his arrangements with a deliberation that scorned every appearance of haste. Though his sober lineaments and anxious eye sufficiently betrayed that he had no very strong professional relish for the yet untried and dreaded warfare of the wilderness. At length, the sun set in a flood of glory behind the distant western hills, and as darkness drew its veil around the secluded spot, the sounds of preparation diminished. The last light finally disappeared from the log cabin of some officer. The trees cast their deeper shadows over the mounds and the rippling stream, and a silence soon pervaded the camp as deep as that which reigned in the vast forest by which it was environed. According to the orders of the preceding night, the heavy sleep of the army was broken by the rolling of the warning drums, whose rattling echoes were heard issuing on the damp morning air out of every vista of the woods. Just as day began to draw the shaggy outlines of some tall pines of the vicinity, on the opening brightness of a soft and cloudless eastern sky. In an instant, the whole camp was in motion, the meanest soldier arising from his lair to witness the departure of his comrades and to share the excitement and incidents of the hour. The simple array of the chosen band was soon completed. While the regular and trained hirelings of the king marched with haughtiness to the right of the line, the less pretending colonists took their humbler position on its left, with a docility that long practice had rendered easy. The scouts departed. Strong guards preceded and followed the lumbering vehicles that bore the baggage, and before the gray light of morning was mellowed by the rays of the sun, the main body of the combatants wheeled into column and left the encampment with a show of high military bearing that served to drown the slumbering apprehensions of many of novice, who was now about to make his first essay in arms. While in view of their admiring comrades, the same proud front and ordered array was observed, until the notes of their fifes growing fainter in distance, the forest at length appeared to swallow up the living mass, which had slowly entered its bosom. The deepest sounds of the retiring and invisible column had ceased to be borne in the breeze of the listeners, and the latest straggler had already disappeared in pursuit. But there still remained the signs of another departure, before a log cabin of unusual size and accommodations, in front of which those sentinels placed their rounds who were known to guard the person of the English general. At this spot were gathered some half-dozen horses, comparisoned in a manner which showed that two at least were destined to bear the persons of females of a rank that was not usual to meet, so far in the wilds of the country. A third were trapping and arms of an officer of the staff, while the rest, from the plainness of the housing and the traveling mails with which they were encumbered, were evidently fitted for the reception of as many menials, who were seemingly already waiting the pleasure of those they served. At a respectful distance from this unusual show were gathered diverse groups of curious idlers, some admiring the blood and bone of the high-mettled military charger, and others gazing at the preparations with the dull wonder of vulgar curiosity. There was one man, however, who by his countenance and actions formed a marked exception to those who composed the latter class of spectators, being neither idle nor seemingly very ignorant. The person of this individual was to the last degree ungainly, without being in any particular manner deformed. He had all the bones and joints of other men, without any of their proportions. Erect, his stature surpassed that of his fellows. Though seated, he appeared reduced within the ordinary limits of the race. The same contrariety of his members seemed to exist throughout the whole man. His head was large, his shoulders narrow, his arms long and dangling, 
while his hands were small, if not delicate. His legs and thighs were thin, nearly to emaciation, but of extraordinary length. And his knees would have been considered tremendous, had they not been outdone by the broader foundation on which this false superstructure of blended human orders was so profanely reared. The ill-assorted and injudicious attire of the individual only served to render his awkwardness more conspicuous. A sky-blue coat with short and broad skirts, and a low cape exposed a long thin neck and longer and thinner legs to the worst animaversions of the evil disposed. His nether garment was a yellow nankeen, closely fitted to the shape, and tied at his bunches of knees by large knots of white ribbon, a good deal sullied by use. Clouded cotton stockings and shoes, on one of the latter of which was a plated spur, completed the costume of the lower extremity of this figure, no curve or angle of which was concealed, but on the other hand studiously exhibited through the vanity or simplicity of its owner. From beneath the flap of an enormous pocket of a soiled vest of embossed silk, heavily ornamented with tarnished silver lace, projected an instrument which, from being seen in such martial company, might have been easily mistaken for some mischievous and unknown implement of war. Small as it was, this uncommon engine had excited the curiosity of most of the Europeans in the camp. Though several of the provincials were seen to handle it, not only without fear, but with the utmost familiarity. A large, civil-cocked hat, like those worn by clergymen within the last thirty years, surmounted the whole, furnishing dignity to a good-natured and somewhat vacant countenance that apparently needed such artificial aid to support the gravity of some high and extraordinary trust. While the common herd stood aloof, in deference to the quarters of Webb, the figure we described stalked into the center of the domestics, freely expressing his censures and commendations on the merits of the horses, as, by chance, they displeased or satisfied his judgment. This beast, I rather conclude, friend, is not of home-raising, but is from foreign lands, or perhaps from the little island itself over the blue water, he said, in a voice as remarkable for the softness and sweetness of its tones, as was his person for its rare proportions. I may speak of these things, and be no braggart, for I have been down at both havens, that which is situate at the mouth of Thames, and is named after the capital of old England, and that which is called haven, with the addition of the word new, and have seen the scowls and brigantines collecting their droves, like the gathering to the ark, being outward bound to the island of Jamaica for the purpose of barter and traffic in four-footed animals. But never before have I beheld a beast which verified the true scripture war-horse like this. He paweth in the valley and rejoiceth in his strength. He goeth on to meet the armed men. He saith among the trumpets, Ha, ha! And he smelleth the battle afar off the thunder of the captains, and the shouting. It would seem that the stock of the horse of Israel had descended to our time, would it not, friend? Receiving no reply to this extraordinary appeal, which in truth, as it was delivered with the vigor of full and sonorous tones, merited some sort of notice, he who had thus sung forth the language of the holy book turned to the silent figure to whom he had unwittingly addressed himself, and found a new and more powerful subject of admiration in the object that encountered his gaze. His eyes fell on the still upright and rigid form of the Indian runner who had borne to the camp the unwelcome tidings of the preceding evening. Although in a state of perfect repose, and apparently disregarding, with characteristic stoicism, the excitement and bustle around him, there was a sullen fierceness mingled with the quiet of the savage, that was likely to arrest the attention of much more experienced eyes than those which now scanned him in unconcealed amazement. The native bore both the tomahawk and knife of his tribe, and yet his appearance was not altogether that of a warrior. On the contrary, there was an air of neglect about this person, 
like that which might have proceeded from great and recent exertion, which he had not yet found leisure to repair. The colors of the war paint had blended in dark confusion about his fierce countenance, and rendered his swarthy lineaments still more savage and repulsive than if art had attempted an effect which had been thus produced by chance. His eye alone, which glistened like a fiery star amid lowering clouds, was to be seen in its state of native wildness. For a single instant, his searching and yet wary glance met the wondering look of the other, and then, changing its direction, partly in cunning and partly in disdain, it remained fixed as if penetrating the distant air. It is impossible to say what unlooked-for remark this short and silent communication between two such singular men might have elicited from the white man, had not his active curiosity been again drawn to other objects. A general movement among the domestics and a low sound of gentle voices announced the approach of those whose presence alone was wanted to enable the cavalcade to move. The simple admirer of the war-horse instantly fell back to a low, gaunt, switch-tailed mare, which was unconsciously gleaning the faded herbage of the camp nigh-by, where, leaning with one elbow on the blanket that concealed an apology for a saddle, he became a spectator of the departure, while a foal was quietly making its morning repast on the opposite side of the same animal. A young man, in the dress of an officer, conducted to their steeds two females, who, as it was apparent by their dresses, were prepared to encounter the fatigues of a journey in the woods. One, and she was the more juvenile in her appearance, though both were young, permitted glimpses of her dazzling complexion, fair golden hair, and bright blue eyes, to be caught, as she artlessly suffered the morning air to blow aside the green veil which descended low from her beaver. The flush which still lingered above the pines of the western sky was not more bright nor delicate than the bloom of her cheek. Nor was the opening day more cheering than the animated smile which she bestowed on the youth as he assisted her into the saddle. The other, who appeared to share equally in the attention of the young officer, concealed her charms from the gaze of the soldiery with a care that seemed better fitted to the experience of four or five additional years. It could be seen, however, that her person, though molded with the same exquisite proportions of which none of the graces were lost by the traveling dress she wore, was rather fuller and more mature than that of her companion. No sooner were these females seated than their attendants sprang lightly into the saddle of the war-horse. When the whole three bowed to Webb, who in courtesy awaited their parting on the threshold of his cabin, and turning their horses' heads, they proceeded at a slow amble, followed by their train toward the northern entrance of the encampment. As they traversed that short distance, not a voice was heard among them, but a slight exclamation proceeded from the younger of the females, as the Indian runner glided by her unexpectedly and led the way along the military road in her front. Though this sudden and startling movement of the Indian produced no sound from the other, in the surprise her veil also was allowed to open its folds, and betrayed an indescribable look of pity, admiration, and horror, as her dark eye followed the easy motions of the savage. The tresses of this lady were shining and black, like the plumage of a raven. Her complexion was not brown, but it rather appeared charged with the color of the rich blood that seemed ready to burst its bounds. And yet there was neither coarseness nor want of shadowing in a countenance that was exquisitely regular and dignified and surpassingly beautiful. She smiled as if in pity at her own momentary forgetfulness, discovering by the act a row of teeth that would have shamed the purest ivory, when replacing the veil, she bowed her face and rode in silence, like one whose thoughts were abstracted from the scene around her. End of chapter 1 This reading by Gary W. Sherwin of Yukon, Pennsylvania, in the summer of 2007.
Chapter 2 of The Last of the Mohicans, a narrative of 1757 by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 2 Quote, Sola, sola, wo, ha, ho, sola. Unquote. By Shakespeare. While one of the lovely beings we have so curiously presented to the reader was thus lost in thought, the other quickly recovered from the alarm which had induced the exclamation, and, laughing at her own weakness, she inquired of the youth who rode by her side, Are such spectres frequent in the woods, Hayward? Or is this sight an especial entertainment, ordered on our behalf? If the latter, gratitude must close our mouths. But if the former, both Cora and I shall have need to draw largely on that stock of hereditary courage which we boast, even before we were made to encounter the redoubtable Montcalm. Yon Indian is a runter of the army, and after the fashion of his people, he may be accounted a hero, returned the officer. He has volunteered to guide us to the lake, by a path but little known, sooner than if we followed the tardy movements of the column, and, by consequence, more agreeably. I like him not, said the lady, shuddering, partly in assumed yet more in real terror. You know him, Duncan, or would you not trust yourself so freely to his keeping? Say rather, Alice, that I would not trust you. I do know him, or he would not have my confidence, and least of all at this moment. He is said to be a Canadian, too, and yet he served with our friends the Mohawks, who, as you know, are one of the six allied nations. He was brought among us, as I have heard, by some strange accident in which your father was interested, and in which the savage was rigidly dealt by but I forget the idle tale. It is enough he is now our friend. If he has been my father's enemy, I like him still less, exclaimed the now really anxious girl. Will you not speak to him, Major Hayward, that I may hear his tones? Foolish though it may be, you have often heard me avow my faith in the tones of the human voice. It would be in vain, and answered most probably by an ejaculation. Though he may understand it, he affects, like most of his people, to be ignorant of the English. And least of all will he condescend to speak it, now that the war demands the utmost exercise of his dignity. But he stops. The private path by which we are to journey is doubtless at hand. The conjecture of Major Hayward was true. When they reached the spot where the Indians stood pointing into the thicket that fringed the military road, a narrow and blind path, which might with some little inconvenience receive one person at a time, became visible. Here then lies our way, said the young man in a low voice. Manifest no distress, or you may invite the danger you appear to apprehend. Cora, what think you? asked the reluctant fair one. If we journey with the troops, though we may find their presence irksome, shall we not feel better assurance of our safety? Being little accustomed to the practices of the savages, Alice, you mistake the place of real danger, said Hayward. If enemies have reached the portage at all, a thing by no means probable, as our scouts are abroad, they will surely be found skirting the column, where scalps abound most. The route of the detachment is known, while ours, having been determined within the hour, must still be secret. Should we distrust the man? "'Because his manners are not our manners, and that his skin is dark?' coldly asked Cora. Alice hesitated no longer, but giving her Narragansett a smart cut of the whip, she was the first to dash aside the slight branches of the bushes and to follow the runner along the dark and tangled pathway. Footnote. In the state of Rhode Island there is a bay called Narragansett, so named after a powerful tribe of Indians which formerly dwelt on its banks. Accident? or one of those unaccountable freaks which nature sometimes plays in the animal world, gave rise to a breed of horses which were once well known in America, 
and distinguished by their habit of pacing. Horses of this race were, and are still, in much request as saddle horses, on account of their hardiness and the ease of their movements. As they were also sure of foot, the Narragansett were greatly sought for by females who were obliged to travel over the roots and holes in the new countries. End of footnote. The young man regarded the last speaker in open admiration, and even permitted her fair, though certainly not more beautiful, companion to proceed unattended, while he sedulously opened the way himself for the passage of her, who has been called Cora. It would seem that the domestics had been previously instructed, for, instead of penetrating the thicket, they followed the route of the column, a measure which Hayward stated had been dictated by the sagacity of their guide in order to diminish the marks of their trail, if, haply, the Canadian savages should be lurking so far in advance of their army. For many minutes the intricacy of the route admitted of no further dialogue after which they emerged from the broad border of underbrush which grew along the line of the highway, and entered under the high but dark arches of the forest. Here their progress was less interrupted, and the instant the guide perceived that the females could command their steeds, he moved on at a pace between a trot and a walk, and at a rate which kept the sure-footed and peculiar animals they rode at a fast yet easy amble. The youth had turned to speak to the dark-eyed Cora, when the distant sound of horses' hoofs, clattering over the roots of the broken way in its rear, caused him to check his charger, and, as his companions drew their reins at the same instant, the whole party came to a halt, in order to obtain an explanation of the unlooked-for interruption. In a few moments a colt was seen gliding like a fallow deer among the straight trunks of the pines, and in another instant the person of the ungainly man described in the preceding chapter came into view, with as much rapidity as he could excite his meager beast to endure, without coming to an open rupture. Until now, his personage had escaped the observation of the travelers. If he possessed the power to arrest any wandering eye when exhibiting the glories of his altitude on foot, his equestrian graces were still more likely to attract attention. Notwithstanding a constant application of his one-armed heel to the flanks of the mare, the most confirmed gait that he could establish was a Canterbury gallop with the hind legs, in which those more forward assisted for doubtful moments, and generally content to maintain a loping trot. Perhaps the rapidity of the changes from one of these paces to the other created an optical illusion, which might thus magnify the powers of the beast, for it is certain that Hayward, who possessed a true eye for the merits of a horse, was unable with his utmost ingenuity to decide by what sort of movement his pursuer worked his sinuous way on his footsteps with such persevering hardihood. The industry and the movements of the rider were not less remarkable than those of the ridden. At each change in the evolutions of the latter, the former raised his tall person in the stirrups, producing in this matter, by the undue elongation of his legs, such sudden growths and diminishings of the stature as baffled every conjecture that might be made as to his dimensions. If to this be added the fact, in consequence of the ex parte application of the spur, one side of the emir appeared to journey faster than the other, and that the aggrieved flank was resolutely indicated by unremitted flourishes of a bushy tail, we finish the picture of both horse and man. The frown which had gathered around the handsome, open, and manly brow of Hayward gradually relaxed, and his lips curled into a slight smile as he regarded the stranger. Alice made no very powerful effort to control her merriment, and even the dark, thoughtful eye of Cora lighted with the humor that it would seem the habit rather than nature of its mistress repressed. "'Seek you any here?' demanded Hayward, when the other had arrived sufficiently nigh to abate his speed. I trust you are no messenger of evil tidings. Even so, replied the stranger, making diligent use of his triangular caster to produce a circulation in the close air of the woods, and leaving his hearers in doubt to which of the young man's questions he responded. When, however, he had cooled his face and recovered his breath, he continued, I hear you are riding to William Henry. 
as I am journeying thitherward myself, I concluded good company would seem consistent to the wishes of both parties. You appear to possess the privilege of a casting vote, returned Hayward. We are three while you have consulted no one but yourself. Even so, the first point to be obtained is to know one's own mind. One sure of that, and where women are concerned, it is not easy. The next is to act up to the decision. I have endeavored to do both, and here I am. If you make the journey to the lake, you have mistaken your route, said Hayward haughtily. The highway thither is at least a half a mile behind you. Even so, replied the stranger, nothing daunted by his cold reception. I have tarried at Edward a week, and I should be dumb not to have inquired the road I was to journey. And if dumb, there would be an end to my calling. After simpering in a small way, like one whose modesty prohibited a more open expression of his admiration, of a witticism that was perfectly unintelligible to his hearers, he continued, Is it not prudent for any one of my profession to be too familiar with those he has to instruct, for which reason I follow not the line of the army? Besides which, I conclude that a gentleman of your character is the best judgment in matters of wayfaring. I have therefore decided to join company, in order that the ride may be made agreeable and partake of social communion. A most arbitrary, if not a hasty decision, exclaimed Hayward, undecided whether to give vent to his growing anger or to laugh in the other's face. But you speak of instruction, and of a profession. Are you an adjunct to the provincial corps, as a master of the noble science of defense and offense, or perhaps... You are the one who draws lines and angles under the pretense of expounding the mathematics? The stranger regarded his interrogator for a moment in wonder, and then, losing every mark of self-satisfaction, in an expression of solemn humility, he answered, Of offense I hope there is none to either party. Of defense I make none. By God's good mercy, having committed no palpable sin since last entreating his pardon and grace, I understand not your illusions about lines and angles, and I leave expounding to those who have been called and set apart for that holy office. I lay claim to no higher gift than a small insight into the glorious art of petitioning and thanksgiving as practice in psalmody. This man is most manifestly a disciple of Apollo, cried the amused Alice, and I take him under my own especial protection. Nay, throw aside that frown, Hayward, and in pity to my longing ears, suffer him to journey in our trade. Besides, she added in a low and hurried voice, casting a glance at the distant Cora, who slowly followed the footsteps of their silent but sullen guide, it may be a friend added to our strength in the time of need. Think you, Alice, that I would trust those I love by this secret path? Did I imagine such need could happen? Nay, nay, I think not of it now. But this strange man amuses me, and if he hath music in his soul, let us not curlishly reject his company. She pointed persuasively along the path with her riding whip, while her eyes met in a look which the young men lingered a moment to prolong. Then, yielding to her gentle influence, he clapped his spurs to his charger, and in a few bounds was again at the side of Cora. I am glad to encounter thee, friend, continued the maiden waving her hand to the stranger to proceed, as she urged her Narragansett to renew its amble. Partial relatives have almost persuaded me that I am not entirely worthless in a duet myself, and we may enliven our wayfaring by indulging in our favorite pursuit. It might be of signal advantage to one ignorant as I, to hear the opinions and experience of a master of the art. It is refreshing both to the spirits and the body to indulge in psalmody in befitting seasons, returned the master of song, unhesitatingly complying with her intimation to follow, and nothing would relieve the mind more than such a consoling communion. But four parts are altogether necessary for the perfection of melody. You have all the manifestations of a soft and rich treble. I can, by a special aid, carry a full tenor to the highest letter, but we lack counter and bass. Yon officer of the king who hesitated to admit me to his company might fill the letter, if one may judge from the intonations of his voice in common dialogue. 
"'Judge not too rashly from hasty and deceptive appearances,' said the lady, smiling. "'Though Major Hayward can assume such deep notes on occasion, believe me, his natural tones are better fitted to a mellow tenor than the bass you heard.' "'Is he, then, much practiced in the art of psalmody?' demanded her simple companion. Alice felt disposed to laugh, though she succeeded in suppressing her merriment ere she answered. "'I apprehend that he is rather addicted to profane song. The chances of a soldier's life are but little fitted to the encouragement of more sober inclinations.' "'Man's voice was given to him, like his other talents, to be used, and not to be abused.' None can say they have ever known me to neglect my gifts. I am thankful that through my boyhood may be said to have been set apart, like the youth of the royal David for the purposes of music. No syllable of rude verse has ever profaned my lips. You have then limited your efforts to sacred song? Even so. As the psalms of David exceed all other language, so does the psalmody, that has been fitted to them by the divines and sages of the land, surpass all vain poetry. Happily, I may say, that I utter nothing but the thoughts and wishes of the king of Israel himself. For though the times may call for some slight changes, yet does this version which we use in the colonies of New England so much exceed all other versions, that by its richness, its exactness, and its spiritual simplicity, it approaches as near as may be the great work of the inspired writer. I never abide in any place, sleeping or waking, without an example of this gifted work. Tis the sixth and twentieth edition, promulgated at Boston, Agno Domini, 1744, and is entitled, The Psalms, Hymns, and Spiritual Songs of the Old and New Testaments, faithfully translated into English meter for the use edification, and comfort of the saints, in public and private, especially in New England. During his eulogium on the rare production of his native poets, the stranger had drawn the book from his pocket, and fitting a pair of iron-rimmed spectacles to his nose, opened the volume with a care and veneration suited to its sacred purposes. Then, without circumlocution or apology, first pronounced the word Standish, and placing the unknown engine already described to his mouth, from which he drew a high shrill sound that was followed by an octave below from his own voice, he commenced singing the following words in full, sweet, and melodious tones that set the music, the poetry, and even the uneasy motion of his ill-trained beast at defiance. How good it is, O sea, and how it pleaseth well, together e'en in unity, for brethren so to dwell. It's like the choice ointment, from the head to the beard did go, down Aaron's head that downward went, his garment skirts unto. The delivery of these skillful rhymes was accompanied on the part of the stranger by a regular rise and fall of his right hand, which terminated at the descent by suffering the fingers to dwell a moment on the leaves of the little volume, and on ascent by a flourish of the member, as none but the initiated might ever hope to imitate. It would seem long practice had rendered this manual accompaniment necessary, for it did not cease until the proposition which the poet had selected for the close of his verse had been duly delivered, like a word of two syllables. Such an innovation on the silence and the retirement of the forest could not fail to enlist the ears of those who journeyed at so short a distance in advance. The Indian muttered a few words in broken English to Hayward, who in his turn spoke to the stranger, at once interrupting and for the time closing his musical efforts. Though we are not in danger, common prudence would teach us to journey through this wilderness in as quiet a manner as possible. You will then pardon me, Alice, should I diminish your enjoyments by requesting this gentleman to postpone his chant until a safer opportunity? You will diminish them indeed, returned the arch girl. For never did I hear a more unworthy conjunction of execution and language than that to which I have been listening. And I was far gone in a learned inquiry into the causes of such an unfitness between sound and sense when you broke the charm of my musing by that bass of yours, Duncan. I know not what you call my bass, said Hayward, piqued at her remark, but I know that your safety in that of Cora, 
is far dearer to me than could be any orchestra of Handel's music. He paused and turned his head quickly toward a thicket, and then bent his eyes suspiciously on their guide, who continued his steady pace in undisturbed gravity. The young man smiled to himself, for he believed he had mistaken some shining berry of the woods for the glistening eyeballs of a prowling savage, as he rode forward continuing the conversation which had been interrupted by the passing thought. Major Hayward was mistaken only in suffering his youthful and generous pride to suppress his act of watchfulness. The cavalcade had not long passed before the branches of the bushes that formed the thicket were cautiously moved asunder, and a human visage, as fiercely wild as savage art and unbridled passions could make it, peered out on the retiring footsteps of the travelers. A gleam of exultation shot across the darkly painted lineaments of the inhabitant of the forest, as he traced the route of his intended victims, who rode unconsciously onward, the light and graceful forms of the females waving among the trees in the curvatures of their path, followed at each bend by the manly figure of Hayward, until finally the shapeless person of the singing master was concealed behind the numberless trunks of trees that rose in dark lines in the intermediate space. End of chapter 2 This reading by Gary W. Sherwin of Yukon, Pennsylvania, in the summer of 2007. Chapter 3 of The Last of the Mohicans A Narrative of 1757 by James Fenimore Cooper This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 3 Quote, Before these fields were shorn and tilled, full to the brim our rivers flowed. The melody of waters filled the fresh and boundless wood, and torrents dashed, and rivulets played, and fountains spouted in the shade. Unquote. By Bryant. Leaving the unsuspecting Hayward and his confiding companions to penetrate still deeper into a forest that contained such treacherous inmates, we must use an author's privilege and shift the scene a few miles to the westward of the place where we have last seen them. On that day, two men were lingering on the banks of a small but rapid stream within an hour's journey of the encampment of Webb, like those who awaited the appearance of an absent person or the approach of some expected event. The vast canopy of woods spread itself to the margin of the river, overhanging the water and shadowing its dark current with a deeper hue. The rays of the sun were beginning to grow less fierce, and the intense heat of the day was lessened, as the cooler vapors of the springs and fountains rose above their leafy beds, and rested in the atmosphere. Still, that breathing silence which marks the drowsy sultriness of an American landscape in July pervaded the secluded spot, interrupted only by the low voices of the men, the occasional and lazy tap of a woodpecker, the discordant cry of some gaudy jay, or a swelling on the ear from the dull roar of a distant waterfall. These feeble and broken sounds were, however, too familiar to the foresters to draw their attention from the more interesting matter of their dialogue. While one of these loiterers showed the red skin and wild accoutrements of a native of the woods, the other exhibited, through the mask of his rude and nearly savage equipments, the brighter, though sunburned, and long-faced complexion of one who might claim descent from a European parentage. The former was seated on the end of a mossy log, in a posture that permitted him to heighten the effect of his earnest language by the calm but expressive gestures of an Indian engaged in debate. His body, which was nearly naked, presented a terrific emblem of death, drawn in intermingled colors of white and black. His closely shaved head, on which no other hair and the well-known and chivalrous scalping tuft was preserved, was without ornament of any kind, with the exception of a solitary eagle's plume that crossed his crown and depended over the left shoulder. Footnote. 
the north american warrior caused the hair to be plucked from his whole body a small tuft was left on the crown of his head in order that his enemy might avail himself of it in the wrenching off the scalp in the event of his fall the scalp was the only admissible trophy of victory thus it was deemed more important to obtain the scalp than to kill the man some tribes lay great stress on the honor of striking a dead body these practices have nearly disappeared among the indians of the atlantic states End footnote. a tomahawk and scalping knife of english manufacture were in his girdle while a short military rifle of that sort with which the policy of the whites armed their savage allies lay carelessly across his bare and sinewy knee the expanded chest full-formed limbs and grave countenance of this warrior would denote that he had reached the vigor of his days though no symptoms of decay appeared to have yet weakened his manhood the frame of the white man judging from such parts as were not concealed by his clothes was like that of one who had known hardships and exertion from his earliest youth his person though muscular was rather attenuated than full but every nerve and muscle appeared strung and indurated by unremitted exposure and toil he wore a hunting shirt of forest green fringed with faded yellow and a summer cap of skins which had been shorn of their fur footnote the hunting shirt is a picturesque smock frock being shorter and ornamented with fringes and tassels the colors are intended to imitate the hues of the wood with a view to concealment many corps of american riflemen have been thus attired and the dress is one of the most striking of modern times the hunting shirt is frequently white he also bore a knife in a girdle of wampum like that which confined the scanty garments of the indian but no tomahawk his moccasins were ornamented after the gay fashion of the natives while the only part of his underdress which appeared below the hunting frock was a pair of buckskin leggings that laced at the sides and which were guarded above the knees with the sinews of a deer a pouch and horn completed his personal accoutrements though a rifle of great length which the theory of the more ingenious whites had taught them was the most dangerous of all firearms leaned against a neighboring sapling footnote the rifle of the army is short that of the hunter is always long End footnote the eye of the hunter or scout whichever he might be was small quick keen and restless roving while he spoke on every side of him as if in quest of game or distrusting the sudden approach of some lurking enemy notwithstanding the symptoms of habitual suspicion his countenance was not only without guile but at the moment at which he is introduced it was charged with an expression of sturdy honesty even your traditions make the case in my favor chingachgook he said speaking in the tongue which was known to all the natives who formerly inhabited the country between the hudson and the potomac and of which we shall give a free translation for the benefit of the reader endeavoring at the same time to preserve some of the peculiarities both of the individual and of the language your fathers came from the setting sun crossed the big river fought the people of the country and took the land and mine came from the red sky of the morning over the salt lake and did their work much after the fashion that had been set them by yours then let god judge the matter between us and friends spare their words footnote the mississippi the scout alludes to a tradition which is very popular among the tribes of the atlantic states evidence of their asiatic origin is deduced from the circumstances the great uncertainty hangs over the whole history of the indians End footnote. my fathers fought with the naked red man returned the indian sternly in the same language is there no difference hawkeye between the stone-headed arrow of the warrior and the leaden bullet with which you kill 
"'There is reason in an Indian, though nature has made him with a red skin,' said the white man, shaking his head like one on whom such an appeal to his justice was not thrown away. For a moment he appeared to be conscious of having the worst of the argument. Then, rallying again, he answered the objection of his antagonist in the best manner his limited information would allow. I am no scholar, and I care not who knows it. But, judging from what I've seen at deer chases and squirrel hunts of the sparks below, I should think a rifle in the hands of their grandfathers was not so dangerous as a hickory bow and a good flint head might be if drawn with Indian judgment and sent by an Indian eye. You have told the story told by your fathers, returned the other coldly, waving his hand. What say your old men? Do they tell the young warriors that the pale faces met the red men, painted for war and armed with the stone hatchet and wooden gun? I am not a prejudiced man, nor one who vaunts himself on his natural privileges. Though the worst enemy I have on earth, and he is an Iroquois, daren't deny I am genuine white, the scout replied, surveying with secret satisfaction the faded color of his bony and sinewy hand. And I'm willing to own that my people have many ways of which, as an honest man, I can't approve. It is one of their customs to write in books what they have done and seen, instead of telling them in their villages, where the lie can be given to the face of a cowardly boaster, and a brave soldier can call on his comrades to witness for the truth of his words. In consequence of this bad fashion, a man who is too conscientious to misspend his days among the women in learning the names of black marks, may never hear the deeds of his fathers, nor feel a pride in striving to outdo them. For myself, I conclude the Bumpos could shoot, for I have a natural turn with a rifle, which must have been handed down from generation to generation. As our holy commandments tell us, all good and evil gifts are bestowed, though I should be loath to answer for other people in such a matter. But every story has its two sides. So I ask you, Chinchgachkuk, what passed according to the traditions of the red men, when our fathers first met? A silence of a minute succeeded, during which the Indian sat mute. Then, full of the dignity of his office, he commenced his brief tale, with a solemnity that served to heighten its appearance of truth. Listen, Hawkeye, and your ear shall drink no lie. Tis what my fathers have said, and what the Mohicans have done. He hesitated a single instant, and bending a cautious glance toward his companion, he continued in a manner that was divided between interrogation and assertion. Does not this stream at our feet run toward the summer until its waters grow salt and the current flows upward? It can't be denied that your traditions tell you true in both these matters, said the white man, for I have been there and have seen them. The why water, which is so sweet in the shade, should become bitter in the sun, is an alteration for which I have never been able to account. And the current? demanded the Indian, who expected his reply with that sort of interest that a man feels in the confirmation of testimony, at which he marvels even while he respects it. The fathers of Chingachgook have not lied. The Holy Bible is not more true, and that is the truest thing in nature. They call this upstream current the tide, which is a thing soon explained, and clear enough. Six hours the waters run in, and six hours they run out. And the reason is this. When there is higher water in the sea than in the river, they run in until the river gets to be highest, and then it runs out again. The waters in the woods and on the great lakes run downward until they lie like my hand 
said the Indian, stretching the limb horizontally before him. And then they run no more. No honest man will deny it, said the scout, a little nettled at the implied distrust of his explanation on the mystery of the tides. And I grant that it is true on the small scale and where the land is level. But everything depends on what scale you look at things. Now on the small scale, the earth is level. But on the large scale, it is round. In this manner, pools and ponds, and even the great freshwater lakes, may be stagnant, as you and I both know they are, having seen them. But when you come to spread water over a great tract like the sea, where the earth is round, how in reason can the water be quiet? You might as well expect the river to lie still on the brink of those black rocks a mile above us, though our own ears tell you that it is tumbling over them at this very moment. If unsatisfied by the philosophy of his companion, the Indian was far too dignified to betray his unbelief. He listened like one who was convinced, and resumed his narrative in his former solemn manner. We came from the place where the sun is hid at night, over great plains where the buffaloes live, until we reached the big river. There we fought the Aligui, till the ground was red with their blood, from the banks of the big river to the shores of the salt lake. There was none to meet us. The Maquas followed at a distance. We said the country should be ours, from the place where the water runs up no longer on this stream, to a river twenty suns' journey toward the summer. We drove the Maquas into the woods with the bears. They only tasted salt at the licks. They drew no fish from the great lake. We threw them the bones. All this I have heard and believe, said the white man, observing that the Indian paused. But it was long before the English came into the country. A pine grew then, where this chestnut now stands. The first pale faces who came among us spoke no English. They came in a large canoe, when my fathers had buried the tomahawk with the red men around them. Then Hawkeye he continued, betraying his deep emotion only by permitting his voice to fall to those low guttural tones which render his language as spoken at times so very musical. Then, Hawkeye, we were one people, and we were happy. The salt lake gave us its fish, the wood its deer, and the air its birds. We took wives who bore us children. We worshipped the Great Spirit, and we kept the Maquas beyond the sound of our songs of triumph. Know you anything of your own family at that time? demanded the White. But you are just a man for an Indian, and I suppose you hold their gifts. Your fathers must have been brave warriors, and wise men at the council fire. My tribe is the grandfather of nations, but I am an unmixed man. The blood of chiefs is in my veins, where it must stay forever. The Dutch landed and gave my people the fire water. They drank until the heavens and earth seemed to meet, and they foolishly thought they had found the great spirit. Then they parted with their land. Foot by foot they were driven back from the shores, until I, that am a chief and a sagamore, have never seen the sunshine but through the trees, and have never visited the graves of my fathers. Graves bring solemn feelings over the mind, returned the scout, a good deal touched at the calm suffering of his companion, and they often aid a man in his good intentions, though, for myself, I expect to leave my own bones unburied, to bleach in the woods, or be torn asunder by the wolves. But where are to be found those of your race who came to their kin in the Delaware country so many summers since? Where are the blossoms of those summers? Fallen, one by one. 
so all of my family departed, each in his turn to the land of spirits. I am on the hilltop, and must go down into the valley. And when Uncas follows in my footsteps, there will no longer be any of the blood of the Sagamores, for my boy is the last of the Mohicans. Uncas is here, said another voice in the same soft guttural tones near his elbow. Who speaks for Uncas? The white man loosened his knife in his leathern sheath, and made an involuntary movement of the hand toward his rifle at this sudden interruption. But the Indian sat composed and without turning his head at the unexpected sounds. At the next instant, a youthful warrior passed between them with a noiseless step, and seated himself on the bank of the rapid stream. No exclamation of surprise escaped the father, nor was any question asked or reply given for several minutes, each appearing to await the moment when he might speak, without betraying womanish curiosity or childish impatience. The white man seemed to take counsel from their customs, and, relinquishing his grasp of the rifle, he also remained silent and reserved. At length, Chingachgook turned his eyes slowly toward his son and demanded, Do the Maquas dare to leave the print of their moccasins in these woods? I have been on their trail, replied the young Indian, and know that they number as many as the fingers of my two hands. But they lie hid like cowards. The thieves are outlying for scalps and plunder, said the white man, whom we shall call Hawkeye, after the manner of his companions. That busy Frenchman, Montcalm, will send his spies into our very camp. But he will know what road we travel. "'Tis enough," returned the father, glancing his eye toward the setting sun. "'They shall be driven like deer from their bushes. Hawkeye, let us eat tonight, and show the Maquas that we are men tomorrow. I am as ready to do one as the other. But to fight the Iroquois, tis necessary to find the skulkers. And to eat, tis necessary to get the game. Talk of the devil, and he will come. There's a pair of the biggest antlers I have seen this season, moving the bushes below the hill. Now, Uncas, he continued in a half-whisper, and laughing with a kind of inward sound, like one who had learned to be watchful, I will bet my charger. Three times full of powder, against a foot of wampum, that I take him atwixt the eyes, and nearer to the right than the left. It cannot be, said the young Indian, springing to his feet with youthful eagerness. Oh, but the tips of his horns are hid. He's a boy, said the white man, shaking his head while he spoke, and addressing the father. Does he think when a hunter sees a part of a creature... He can't tell where the rest of him should be. Adjusting his rifle, he was about to make an exhibition of that skill on which he so much valued himself, when the warrior struck up the piece with his hand, saying, Hawkeye, will you fight the Maquas? These Indians know the nature of the woods as it might be by instinct, returned the scout, dropping his rifle and turning away like a man convinced of his error. I must leave the buck to your arrow, Uncas, or we may kill a deer for them thieves, the Iroquois, to eat. The instant the father seconded this intimation, by an expressive gesture of the hand, Uncas threw himself on the ground and approached the animal with weary movements. When within a few yards of the cover, he fitted an arrow to his bow with the utmost care, while the antlers moved as if their owner snuffed an enemy in the tainted air. In another moment, the twang of the cord was heard, a white streak was seen glancing into the bushes, and the wounded buck plunged from the cover to the very feet of his hidden enemy. Avoiding the horns of the infuriated animal, Uncas darted to his side, and passed his knife across the throat. When bounding to the edge of the river, it fell, dying the water with its blood. "'Twas done with Indian skill,' 
said the scout, laughing inwardly, but with vast satisfaction. And t'was a pretty sight to behold, though an arrow is a near shot, and needs a knife to finish the work. Huh! <laughs> ejaculated his companion, turning quickly, like a hound who scented game. By the Lord, there's a drove of them! exclaimed the scout, whose eyes began to glisten with the ardor of his usual occupation. If they come within range of a bullet, I will drop one, though the whole six nations should be lurking within sound. What do you hear, Chinchgotchcook? For to my ears the woods are dumb. There is but one deer, and he is dead, said the Indian, bending his body till his ear nearly touched the earth. I hear the sounds of feet. Perhaps the wolves have driven the buck to shelter, and are following on his trail. No, the horses of white men are coming, returned the other, raising himself with dignity, and resuming his seat on the log with his former composure. Hawkeye, they are your brothers. Speak to them. That I will, and in English that the king needn't be ashamed to answer, returned the hunter, speaking in the language of which he boasted. But I see nothing, nor do I hear the sounds of man or beast. Tis strange that an Indian should understand white sounds, better than a man who his very enemies will own has no cross in his blood. Although he may have lived with the redskins long enough to be suspected. Ha! There goes something like the crackling of a dry stick, too. Now I hear the bushes move. Yes, yes. There is a trampling that I mistook for the falls, and— But here they come themselves. God keep them from the Iroquois. End of Chapter 3 This recording by Gary W. Sherwin of Yukon, Pennsylvania, in the summer of 2007. Chapter 4 of The Last of the Mohicans a narrative of 1757 by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 4 Quote, Well, go thy way, thou shalt not from this grove, till I torment thee for this injury. Unquote. Midsummer Night's Dream The words were still in the mouth of the scout when the leader of the party, whose approaching footsteps had caught the vigilant ear of the Indian, came openly into view. A beaten path, such as those made by the periodical passage of deer, wound through a little glen at no great distance, and struck the river at the point where the white man and his red companions had posted themselves. Along this track, the travelers who had produced a surprise so unusual in the depths of the forest advanced slowly toward the hunter, who was in front of his associates, in readiness to receive them. "'Who comes?' demanded the scout, throwing his rifle carelessly across his left arm, and keeping the forefinger of his right hand on the trigger, though he avoided all appearance of menace in the act. Who comes hither through the beast and dangers of the wilderness? Believers in religion, and friends of the law, and to the king, returned he who rode foremost. Men who have journeyed since the rising sun in the shades of this forest, without nourishment, and are sadly tired of their wayfaring. You are then lost, interrupted the hunter, and have found how helpless tis not to know whether to take the right hand or the left? Even so... Sucking babes are not more dependent on those who guide them than we who are of larger growth, and who may now be said to possess the stature without the knowledge of men. Know you the distance to a post of the crown called William Henry? <laughs> shouted the scout, who did not spare his open laughter, though instantly checking the dangerous sound he indulged, his merriment, at risk of being overhead by any lurking enemies. You are as much off the scent as a hound would be, with Horican atwixt him and the deer. William Henry, man, if you are friends to the king and have business with the army, your way would be to follow the river down to Edward, 
and lay the matter before a web who tarries there, instead of pushing into the defiles, and driving this saucy Frenchman back across Champlain into his den again. Before the stranger could make any reply to this unexpected proposition, another horseman dashed the bushes aside, and leaped his charger into the pathway in front of his companion. "'What then may be our distance from Fort Edward?' demanded a new speaker. "'The place you advise us to seek we left this morning, and our destination is the head of the lake. Then you must have lost your eyesight afore losing your way, for the road across the portage is cut to a good two rods, and is as grand as the path, I calculate, as any that runs into London, or even before the palace of the king himself. "'We will not dispute concerning the excellence of the passage,' returned Hayward, smiling, for, as the reader has anticipated, it was he. "'It was enough for the present that we trusted to an Indian guide to take us by a near though blinder path, and that we are deceived in his knowledge.' In plain words, we know not where we are. "'An Indian lost in the woods,' said the scout, shaking his head doubtingly. "'When the sun is scorching the treetops, and the watercourses are full, when the moss on every beach he sees will tell him in what quarter the North Star will shine at night, the woods are full of deer paths which run to the streams and licks.' places well known to everybody, nor have the geese done their flight to the Canada waters altogether. Tis strange that an Indian should be lost atwixt Horrigan and the bend in the river. Is he a Mohawk? Not by birth, though adopted by that tribe. I think his birthplace was farther north, and he is one of those you call Huron. Huh! <gasps> exclaimed the two companions of the scout who had continued until this part of the dialogue, seated immovable, and apparently indifferent to what passed, but who now sprang to their feet with an activity and interest that had evidently got the better of their reserve by surprise. "'A Huron?' repeated the sturdy scout, once more shaking his head in open distrust. "'They are a thievish race, nor do I care by whom they are adopted.' You can never make anything of them but skulls and vagabonds. Since you trusted yourself to the care of one of that nation, I only wonder that you have not fallen in with more. Of that there is little danger, since William Henry is so many miles in our front. You forgot that I have told you our guide is now a Mohawk, and that he serves with our forces as a friend. And I tell you that he who is born a Mingo will die a mingo returned the other positively a mohawk no give me a delaware or a mohican for honesty and when they will fight which they won't all do having suffered their cunning enemies the mock was to make them women but when they will fight at all look to a delaware or a mohican for a warrior enough of this said hayward impatiently I wish not to inquire into the character of a man that I know, and to whom you must be a stranger. You have not yet answered my question. What is our distance from the main army at Edward? It seems that may depend on who is your guide. One would think such a horse as that might get over a good deal of ground atwixt sun-up and sundown. I wish no contention of idle words with you, friend, said Hayward curbing his dissatisfied manner, and speaking in a more gentle voice. If you will tell me the distance to Fort Edward, and conduct me thither, your labor shall not go without its reward. And in doing so, how know I that I don't guide an enemy and a spy of Montcalm to the works of the army? It is not every man who can speak the English tongue that is an honest subject. If you serve with the troops of whom I judge you to be a scout, you should know of such a regiment of the king as the 60th. The 60th? You can tell me little of the Royal Americans that I don't know, though I do wear a hunting shirt instead of a scarlet jacket. Well, then, among other things, you may know the name of its major. Its major, interrupted the hunter, elevating his body like one who was proud of his trust. 
if there is a man in the country who knows Major Effingham, he stands before you. It is a corps which has many majors. The gentleman you name is the senior. But I speak of the junior of them all, he who commands the companies in garrison at William Henry. Yes, yes. I have heard that a young gentleman of vast riches from one of the provinces far south has got the place. He is over young, too, to hold such rank, and to be put above men whose heads are beginning to bleach. And yet they say he is a soldier in his knowledge and a gallant gentleman. Whatever he may be, or however he may be qualified for his rank, he now speaks to you, and, of course, can be no enemy to dread. The scout regarded Hayward in surprise, and then lifting his cap he answered in a tone less confident than before though still expressing doubt. I have heard a party was to leave the encampment this morning for the lake shore. You have heard the truth, but I preferred a nearer route, trusting to the knowledge of the Indian I mentioned. And he deceived you and then deserted? Neither, as I believe, certainly not the latter, for he is to be found in the rear. I should like to look at the creature if it is a true Iroquois, I can tell him by his knavish look, and by his paint, said the scout, stepping past the charger of Hayward, and entering the path behind the mare of the singing master, whose foal had taken advantage of the halt to extract the maternal contribution. After shoving aside the bushes and proceeding a few paces, he encountered the females, who awaited the result of the conference with anxiety, and not entirely without apprehension. Behind these, the runner leaned against a tree, where he stood the close examination of the scout, with an air unmoved, though with a look so dark and savage that it might in itself excite fear. Satisfied with his scrutiny, the hunter soon left him. As he repassed the females, he paused a moment to gaze upon their beauty. Answering to the smile and nod of Alice, with a look of open pleasure, Thence he went to the side of the motherly animal, and spending a minute in a fruitless inquiry into the character of her rider, he shook his head and turned to Hayward. A Mingo is a Mingo, and God having made him so, neither the Mohawks nor any other tribe can alter him, he said, when he had regained his former position. If we were alone, and you would leave that noble horse at the mercy of the wolves tonight, I could show you the way to Edward myself within an hour, for it lies only about an hour's journey hence. But with such ladies in your company, tis impossible. And why? They are fatigued, but they are quite equal to a ride of a few more miles. Tis a natural impossibility, repeated the scout. I wouldn't walk a mile in these woods after night gets into them in company with that runner, for the best rifle in the colonies. They are full of outlying Iroquois, and your mongrel mohawk knows where to find them too well to be my companion. Thank you so, said Hayward, leaning forward in the saddle and dropping his voice nearly to a whisper. I confess, I have not been without my own suspicions, though I have endeavored to conceal them and effected a confidence I have not always felt, on account of my companions. It was because I suspected him that I would follow no longer, making him, as you see, follow me. I knew he was one of the cheats as soon as I laid eyes on him, returned the scout, placing a finger on his nose in sign of caution. The thief is leaning against the foot of the sugar sapling that you can see over them bushes. His right leg is in a line with the bark of the tree and tapping his rifle. I can take him from where I stand, between the ankle and the knee, with a single shot, putting an end to his tramping through the woods for at least a month to come. If I should go back to him, the cunning varmint would suspect something, and be dodging through the trees like a frightened deer. It will not do. He may be innocent, and I dislike the act. Though if I felt confident of his treachery— "'Tis a safe thing to calculate on the knavery of an Iroquois,' said the scout, throwing his rifle forward by a sort of instinctive movement. "'Hold!' interrupted Hayward. "'It will not do. 
we must think of some other scheme, and yet I have much reason to believe the rascal has deceived me. The hunter, who had already abandoned his attention of maiming the runner, mused for a moment, and then made a gesture which instantly brought his two red companions to his side. They spoke together earnestly in the Delaware language, though in an undertone and by the gestures of the white man, which were frequently directed toward the top of the sapling, it was evident he pointed out the situation of their hidden enemy. His companions were not long in comprehending his wishes, and laying aside their firearms, they parted, taking opposite sides of the path, and burying themselves in the thicket, with such cautious movements that their steps were inaudible. "'Now go you back,' said the hunter, speaking again to Hayward, "'and hold the imp in talk. "'These Mohicans here will take him without breaking his paint.' "'Nay,' said Hayward proudly, "'I will seize him myself.' "'Hist! "'What could you do mounted against an Indian in the bushes? "'I will dismount. "'And thank you?' When he saw one of your feet out of the stirrup, he would wait for the other to be free? Whoever comes into the woods to deal with the natives must use Indian fashions if he would wish to prosper in his undertakings. Go, then, talk openly to the miscreant, and seem to believe him the truest friend you have on earth. Hayward prepared to comply though with strong disgust at the nature of the office he was compelled to execute. Each moment, however, pressed upon him a conviction of the critical situation in which he had suffered his invaluable trust to be involved through his own confidence. The sun had already disappeared, and the woods, suddenly deprived of his light, were assuming a dusky hue, which keenly reminded him that the hour the savage usually choose for his most barbarous and remorseless acts of vengeance for hostility was speedily drawing near. Footnote. The scene of this tale was in the forty-second degree of latitude, where the twilight is never of long continuation. End footnote. Stimulated by apprehension, he left the scout, who immediately entered into a loud conversation with the stranger who had so unceremoniously enlisted himself in the party of the travelers that morning. In passing his gentler companions, Hayward uttered a few words of encouragement, and was pleased to find that, though fatigued with the exercise of the day, they appeared to entertain no suspicion that their present embarrassment was other than the result of accident. Giving them reason to believe he was merely employed in a consultation concerning the future route, he spurred his charger, and drew the reins again when the animal had carried him within a few yards of the place where the sullen runner still stood, leaning against the tree. "'You may see, Maqua, he said, endeavoring to assume an air of freedom and confidence, "'that the night is closing around us, and yet we are no nearer to William Henry than when we left the encampment of Webb.' with the rising sun. You have missed the way, nor have I been more fortunate. But happily we have fallen in with a hunter, he whom you hear talking to the singer that is acquainted with the deer paths and byways of the woods, and who promises to lead us to a place where we may rest securely till the morning. The Indian riveted his glowing eyes on Hayward as he asked in his imperfect English, is he alone? Alone? Hesitatingly answered Hayward, to whom deception was too new to be assumed without embarrassment. Oh, not alone. Surely, Maqua, for you know that we are with him. Then Le Renard Subtil will go, returned the runner, coolly raising his little wallet from the place where it had lain at his feet, and the pale faces will see none but their own color. Go, whom you call Le Renard? "'Tis the name his Canadian fathers have given to Maqua," returned the runner, with an air that manifested his pride at the distinction. "'Night is the same as day to Le Subtil, when Monroe waits for him. And what account will Le Renard give the chief of William Henry concerning his daughters? Will he dare to tell the hot-blooded Scotsman that his children are left without a guide? Does Maqua promise to be one?' 
Though the gray head has a loud voice and a long arm, Le Renaud will not hear him, nor feel him in the woods. But what will the Mohawks say? They will make him petticoats and bid him stay in the wigwam with the women, for he is no longer to be trusted with the business of a man. Le Savir knows the path to the Great Lakes, and he can find the bones of his fathers, was the answer of the unmoved runner. Enough, Maqua, said Hayward. Are we not friends? Why should there be bitter words between us? Munro has promised you a gift for your services, when performed, and I shall be your debtor for another. Rest your weary limbs, then, and open your wallet to eat. We have a few moments to spare. Let us not waste them in talk like wrangling women. When the ladies are refreshed, we will proceed. The pale faces make themselves dogs to their women, muttered the Indian in his native language. And then when they want to eat, their warriors must lay aside the tomahawk to feed their laziness. What say you, Renard? Le Subtil says, it is good. The Indian then fastened his eyes keenly on the open countenance of Hayward. But meeting his glance, he turned them quickly away, and seating himself deliberately on the ground, he drew forth the remnant of some former repast and began to eat, though not without first bending his look slowly and cautiously around him. This is well, continued Hayward, and the Renaud will have strength and sight to find the path in the morning. He paused, for sounds like the snapping of a dried stick, and the rustling of leaves rose from the adjacent bushes. But recollecting himself instantly, he continued, We must be moving before the sun is seen, or Montcalm may lie in our path, and shut us out from the fortress. The hand of Maqua dropped from his mouth to his side and though his eyes were fastened on the ground, his head was turned aside, his nostrils expanded, and his ears seemed to stand even more erect than usual, giving him the appearance of a statue that was made to represent intense attention. Hayward, who watched his movements with a vigilant eye, carelessly extricated one of his feet from the stirrup while he passed the hand toward the bearskin covering of his holsters. Every effort to detect the point most regarded by the runner was completely frustrated by the tremulous glances of his organs, which seemed not to rest a single instant on any particular object, and which at the same time could be hardly said to move. While he hesitated how to proceed, Le Subtil cautiously raised himself to his feet, though with a motion so slow and guarded that not the slightest noise was produced by the change. Hayward felt it had now become incumbent on him to act. Throwing his leg over the saddle, he dismounted with a determination to advance and seize his treacherous companion, trusting the result to his own manhood. In order, however, to prevent unnecessary alarm, he still preserved an air of calmness and friendship. Le Renard subtils does not eat he said, using the appellation he had found most flattering to the vanity of the Indian. His corn is not well parched, and it seems dry. Let me examine. Perhaps something may be found among my own provisions that will help his appetite. Maqua held out the wallet to the proffer of the other. He even suffered their hands to meet, without betraying the least emotion or varying his riveted attitude of attention. But when he felt the fingers of Hayward moving gently along his own naked arm, he struck up the limb of the young man, and uttering a piercing cry, he darted beneath it, and plunged at a single bound into the opposite thicket. At the next instant the form of Chingotkuk appeared from the bushes, looking like a specter in its paint, and glided across the path in swift pursuit. Next followed the shout of Uncas when the woods were lighted by a sudden flash that was accompanied by the sharp report of the hunter's rifle. End of chapter 4 This reading by Gary W. Sherwin of Yukon, Pennsylvania in the summer of 2007
by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 5 Quote, In such a night did this be fearfully o'ertrip the dew, and saw the lion's shadow ere himself. Unquote. Merchant of Venice The suddenness of the flight of his guide, and the wild cries of the pursuers, caused Hayward to remain fixed for a few moments in inactive surprise. Then, recollecting the importance of securing the fugitive, he dashed aside the surrounding bushes, and pressed eagerly forward to lend his aid in the chase. Before he had, however, proceeded a hundred yards, he met the three foresters already returning from their unsuccessful pursuit. "'Why so soon disheartened?' he exclaimed. "'The scoundrel must be concealed behind some of these trees, and may yet be secured. We are not safe while he goes at large.' "'Would you set a cloud to chase the wind?' returned the disappointed scout. I heard the imp brushing over the dry leaves like a black snake, and blinking a glimpse of him just over again yon big pine, I pulled as it might be on the scent. But twouldn't do. And yet, for a reasoning aim, if anybody but myself had touched the trigger, I should call it a quick sight, and I may be accounted to have experience in these matters, and one who ought to know. Look at this sumac. Its leaves are red, though everybody knows the fruit is yellow blossom in the month of July. Tis the blood of subtil. He is hurt and may yet fall. No, no, returned the scout in decided disappropriation of his opinion. I rubbed the bark off a limb, perhaps, but the creature leaped the longer for it. A rifle bullet acts like a running animal when it barks him, much the same as one of your spurs on a horse. That is, it quickens motion and puts life into the flesh instead of taking it away. But when it cuts the ragged hole after a bound or two, there is commonly a stagnation of further leaping, be it Indian or be it deer. We are four able bodies to one wounded man. Is life grievous to you, interrupted the scout? Yon red devil would draw you within swing of the tomahawks of his comrades, before you were heeded in the chase. It was an unthoughtful act in a man who has so often slept with the war-hoop ringing in the air, to let off his peace within sound of ambushment. But then it was a natural temptation. T'was very natural. Come, friends, let us move our station, and in such fashion, too, as will throw the cunning of a mingo on a wrong scent. Or our scalps will be drying in the wind in front of Montcalm's marquee. Again this hour tomorrow. This appalling declaration, which the scout uttered with the cool assurance of a man who fully comprehended, while he did not fear to face the danger, served to remind Hayward of the importance of the charge with which he himself had been entrusted. Glancing his eyes around with a vain effort to pierce the gloom that was thickening beneath the leafy arches of the forest, he felt as if cut off from human aid. His unresisting companions would soon lie at the entire mercy of those barbarous enemies, who, like beasts of prey, only waited till the gathering darkness might render their blows more fatally certain. His awakened imagination, deluded by the deceptive light, converted each waving bush or the fragment of some fallen tree into human forms and twenty times he fancied he could distinguish the horrid visages of his lurking foes peering from their hiding-places in never-ceasing watchfulness of the movements of his party. Looking upward, he found that the thin fleecy clouds, which evening had painted on the blue sky, were already losing their faintest tints of rose-color, while the embedded stream which glided past the spot where he stood was to be traced only by the dark boundary of its wooded banks. "'What is to be done?' he said, feeling the utter helplessness of doubt in such a pressing strait. "'Desert me not, for God's sake. Remain to defend those I escort, and freely name your own reward.' His companions, who conversed apart in the language of their tribe, heeded not his sudden and earnest appeal. 
though their dialogue was maintained in low and cautious sounds, but little above a whisper, Hayward, who now approached, could easily distinguish the earnest tones of the younger warrior from the more deliberate speeches of his seniors. It was evident that they debated on the propriety of some measure that nearly concerned the welfare of the travelers. Yielding to his powerful interest in the subject, and impatient of a delay that seemed fraught with so much additional danger, Hayward drew still nigher to the dusky group, with an intention of making his offers of compensation more definite. When the white man, motioning with his hand as if he conceded the disputed point, turned away, saying in a sort of soliloquy, and in the English tongue, Ancus is right. It would not be the act of men to leave such harmless things to their fate, even though it breaks up the harboring place forever. If you would save these tender blossoms from the fangs of the worst serpents, gentlemen, you have neither time to lose nor resolution to throw away. How can such a wish be doubted? Have I not already offered? Offer your prayers to him who can give us wisdom to circumvent the cunning of the devils who fill these woods, calmly interrupted the scout. But spare your offers of money, which neither you may live to realize, nor I to profit by. These Mohicans and I will do what man's thoughts can invent to keep such flowers which, though so sweet, were never made for the wilderness from harm and that without hope of any other recompense but such as God always gives to upright dealings. First, you must promise two things, both in your own name and for your friends, or without serving you, we shall only injure ourselves. Name them. The one is to be still as these sleeping woods, let what will happen, and the other is to keep the place where we shall take you forever a secret from all mortal men. I will do my utmost to see both these conditions fulfilled. Then follow, for we are losing moments that are as precious as the heart's blood to a stricken deer. Hayward could distinguish the impatient gesture of the scout through the increasing shadows of the evening, and he moved in his footsteps swiftly toward the place where he had left the remainder of the party. When they rejoined the expecting and anxious females, he briefly acquainted them with the conditions of their new guide, and with the necessity that existed for their hushing every apprehension in instant and serious exertions. Although his alarming communication was not received without much secret terror by the listeners, his earnest and impressive manner, aided perhaps by the nature of the danger, succeeded in bracing their nerves to undergo some unlooked-for and unusual trial. Silently and without a moment's delay, they permitted him to assist them from their saddles, and when they descended quickly to the water's edge, where the scout had collected the rest of the party, more by the agency of expressive gestures than by any use of words. "'What to do with these dumb creatures?' muttered the white man, on whom the sole control of their future movements appeared to devolve. "'It would be time lost to cut their throats and cast them into the river. "'And to leave them here would be to tell the Mingos that they have not far to seek to find their owners.' "'Then give them their bridles and let them range in the woods,' Hayward ventured to suggest. "'No, it would be better to mislead the imps.' and make them believe they must equal a horse's speed to run down their chase. Ay, ay, that will blind their fireballs of eyes. Chinkach, hitch. What stirs in the bush? The colt. That colt at least must die, muttered the scout, grasping at the mane of the nimble beast, which easily eluded his hand. Uncas, your arrows. Hold! exclaimed the proprietor of the condemned animal aloud, without regard to the whispering tones used by the others. Spare the foal of Miriam. It is the comely offspring of a faithful dame, and would willingly injure not. When men struggle for the single life God has given them, said the scout sternly, even their own kind seem no more than the beast of the wood. If you speak again, I shall leave you at the mercy of the Maquas. Draw to your arrow's head, Uncas. We have no time for second blows. 
The low, muttering sounds of his threatening voice were still audible when the wounded foal, first rearing on its hinder legs, plunged forward to its knees. It was met by Chinchgotchkuk, whose knife passed across its throat quicker than thought, and then, precipitating the motions of the struggling victim, he had dashed into the river, down whose stream it glided away, gasping audibly for breath with its ebbing life. This deed of apparent cruelty, but of real necessity, fell upon the spirits of the travelers like a terrific warning of the peril in which they stood. Heightened as it was by the calm though steady resolution of the actors in the scene, the sisters shuddered and clung closer to each other, while Hayward instinctively laid his hand on one of his pistols he had just drawn from their holsters, as he placed himself between his charge and those dense shadows that seemed to draw an impenetrable veil before the bosom of the forest. The Indians, however, hesitated not a moment, but taking the bridles, they led the frightened and reluctant horses into the bed of the river. At a short distance from the shore they turned, and were soon concealed by the projection of the bank under the brow of which they moved, in a direction opposite to the course of the waters. In the meantime, the scout drew a canoe of bark from its place of concealment beneath some low bushes, whose branches were waving with the eddies of the current, into which he silently motioned for the females to enter. They complied without hesitation, though many a fearful and anxious glance was thrown behind them toward the thickening gloom, which now lay like a dark barrier along the margin of the stream. So soon as Cora and Alice were seated, the scout, without regarding the element, directed Hayward to support one side of the frail vessel, and posting himself at the other, they bore it up against the stream, followed by the dejected owner of the dead foal. In this manner they proceeded for many rods in a silence that was only interrupted by the rippling of the water, as its eddies played around them, or the low dash made by their own cautious footsteps. Hayward yielded the guidance of the canoe implicitly to the scout, who approached or receded from the shore to avoid the fragments of rocks or deeper parts of the river, with a readiness that showed his knowledge of the route they held. Occasionally he would stop, and in the midst of a breathing stillness that the dull but increasing war of the waterfall only served to render more impressive, he would listen with painful intenseness to catch any sounds that might arise from the slumbering forest. When assured that all was still, and unable to detect, even by the aid of his practiced senses, any sign of his approaching foes, he would deliberately resume his slow and guarded progress. At length they reached a point in the river where the roving eye of Hayward became riveted on a cluster of black objects, collected at a spot where the high banks through a deeper shadow than usual on the dark waters. Hesitating to advance, he pointed out the place to the attention of his companion. I returned the composed scout. The Indians have hid the beast with the judgment of natives. Water leaves no trail, and an owl's eyes would be blinded by the darkness of such a hole. The whole party was soon reunited, and another consultation was held between the scout and his new comrades, during which they whose fates depended on the faith and ingenuity of these unknown foresters had a little leisure to observe their situation more minutely. The river was confined between high and cragged rocks, one of which impended above the spot where the canoe rested. As these again were surmounted by tall trees, which appeared to totter on the brows of the precipice, it gave the stream the appearance of running through a deep and narrow dell all beneath the fantastic limbs and ragged treetops, which were here and there dimly painted against the starry zenith, lay alike in shadowed obscurity. Behind them, the curvature of the bank soon bounded the view by the same dark and wooded outline. But in front, and apparently at no great distance, the water seemed piled against the heavens, whence it tumbled into caverns, out of which issued those sullen sounds which had loaded the evening atmosphere. It seemed in truth to be a spot devoted to seclusion, 
and the sisters imbibed a soothing impression of security as they gazed upon its romantic, though not unappalling beauties. A general movement among their conductors, however, soon recalled them from a contemplation of the wild charms that night had assisted to lend the place to a painful sense of their real peril. The horses had been secured to some scattering shrubs that grew in the fissures in the rocks, where, standing in the water, they were left to pass the night. The scout directed Hayward and his disconsolate fellow-travelers to seat themselves in the forward end of the canoe, and took possession of the other himself, as erect and steady as if he floated in a vessel of much firmer materials. The Indians warily retraced their steps toward the place they had left, when the scout, placing his pole against a rock, by a powerful shove, sent his frail bark directly into the turbulent stream. For many minutes the struggle between the light bubble in which they floated and the swift current was severe and doubtful. Forbidden to stir even a hand, and almost afraid to breathe lest they should expose the frail fabric to the fury of the stream, the passengers watched the glancing waters in feverish suspense. Twenty times they thought the whirling eddies were sweeping them to destruction, when the master hand of their pilot would bring the bows of the canoe to stem the rapid. Along a vigorous, and as it appeared to the females, a desperate effort closed the struggle. Just as Alice veiled her eyes in horror under the impression that they were about to be swept within the vortex at the foot of the cataract, the canoe floated stationary at the side of a flat rock that lay on a level with the water. "'Where are we? And what is to be done?' demanded Hayward, perceiving that the exertions of the scout had ceased. "'You are at the foot of Glens,' returned the other, speaking aloud, without fear of consequences within the roar of the cataract. "'And the next thing is to make a steady landing, lest the canoe upset, and you should go down again the hard road we have traveled, faster than you came up. "'Tis a hard rift to stem, when the river is a little swelled, and five is an unnatural number to keep dry, in a hurry-scurry, with a little birch and bark and gum. There, go you all on the rock, and I will bring up the Mohicans with the venison. A man had better sleep without his scalp than famish in the midst of plenty. His passengers gladly complied with these directions. As the last foot touched the rock, the canoe whirled from its station. When the tall form of the scout was seen for an instant, gliding above the waters before it disappeared in the impenetrable darkness that rested on the bed of the river. Left by their guide, the travelers remained a few minutes in helpless ignorance, afraid even to move among the broken rocks, lest a false step should precipitate them down some one of the many deep and roaring caverns into which the water seemed to tumble on every side of them. Their suspense, however, was soon relieved, for, aided by the skill of the natives, the canoe shot back into the eddy, and floated again at the side of the low rock, before they thought the scout had time to even rejoin his companions. "'We are now fortified, garrisoned, and provisioned,' cried Hayward cheerfully, "'and may set Montcalm and his allies at defiance. How now, my vigilant sentinel?' can see anything of those you call the Iroquois on the mainland. I call them Iroquois because to me every native who speaks a foreign tongue is accounted an enemy, though he may pretend to serve the king. If Webb wants faith and honesty in an Indian, let him bring out the tribes of the Delawares, and send these greedy and lying Mohawks and Oneidas with their six nations of varlets where in nature they belong, among the French. We should then exchange a warlike for a useless friend? I have heard that Delawares have laid aside the hatchet, and are content to be called women. Aye, shame on the Hollanders and Iroquois who circumvented them by their deviltries into such a treaty. But I have known them for twenty years, and I call him liar that says cowardly blood runs in the veins of a Delaware. You have driven their tribes from the seashore, and would now believe what their enemies say, that you may sleep at night upon an easy pillow. No, no, to me, every Indian who speaks a foreign tongue 
is an Iroquois, whether the castle of his tribe be in Canada or be in York. Footnote. The principal villages of the Indians are still called castles by the whites of New York. Oneida Castle is no more than a scattered hamlet, but the name is in general use. End footnote. Hayward, perceiving the stubborn adherence of the scout to the cause of his friends the Delawares or Mohicans, for they were branches of the same numerous people, was likely to prolong a useless discussion, change the subject. Treaty or no treaty, I know full well that your two companions are brave and cautious warriors. Have they heard or seen anything of our enemies? An Indian is a mortal to be felt afore he is seen, returned the scout, ascending the rock and throwing the deer carelessly down. I trust to other signs than such as come in at the eye when I am outlying on the trail of the Mingos. Do your ears tell you that they have traced our retreat? I should be sorry to think they had, though this is a spot that stout courage might hold for a smart scrimmage. I will not deny, however, but the horses cowered when I passed them, as though they scented the wolves, and a wolf is a beast that is apt to hover about an Indian ambushment, craving the offals of the deer the savages kill. You forget the buck at your feet, or may we not owe their visit to the dead colt? Ha! Huh, what noise is that? Poor Miriam, murmured the stranger, thy foal is foreordained to become prey to ravenous beast. Then suddenly lifting up his voice amid the eternal din of the waters, he sang aloud, First born of Egypt, smite did he, of mankind and of beast also. O Egypt, wonder sent midst thee, O Pharaoh and his servants too. The death of the cult sits heavy on the heart of its owner, said the scout. But it's a good sign to see a man account upon his dumb friends. He has the religion of the matter, in believing what is to happen will happen. And with such a consolation, it won't be long before he submits to the rationality of killing a four-footed beast to save the lives of human men. It may be as you say, he continued, reverting to the purport of Hayward's last remark, and the greater the reason why we should cut our stakes and let the carcass drive down the stream, or we shall have the pack howling along the cliffs, begrudging every mouthful we swallow. Besides, Though the Delaware tongue is the same as a book to the Iroquois, the cunning varlets are quick enough at understanding the reason of a wolf's howl. The scout, while making his remarks, was busied in collecting certain necessary implements. As he concluded, he moved silently by the group of travelers, accompanied by the Mohicans, who seemed to comprehend his intentions with instinctive readiness. When the whole three disappeared in succession, seeming to vanish against the dark face of a perpendicular rock that rose to the height of a few yards within as many feet of the water's edge. End of chapter 5 This reading by Gary W. Sherwin of Yukon, Pennsylvania in the summer of 2007《The Last of the Mohicans — A Narrative of 1757 — by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 6 Quote, Those strains that once did sweet in Zion glide, he wills a portion with judicious care. And let us worship God, he says, with solemn air. Unquote. Burns. Hayward and his female companions witnessed this mysterious movement with secret uneasiness, for though the conduct of the white man had hitherto been above reproach, his rude equipments, blunt address, and strong antipathies together with the character of his silent associates, were all causes for exciting distrust in minds that had been so recently alarmed by Indian treachery. The stranger alone disregarded the passing incidents. He seated himself on a projection of the rocks, whence he gave no other signs of consciousness than by the struggles of his spirit, as manifested in the frequent and heavy sighs. 
Smothered voices were next heard, as though men called to each other in the bowels of the earth, when a sudden light flashed upon those without and laid bare the much-prized secret of the place. At the further extremity of a narrow, deep cavern in the rock, whose length appeared much extended by the perspective and the nature of the light by which it was seen, was seated the scout, holding a blazing knot of pine. The strong glare of the fire fell full upon his sturdy, weather-beaten countenance and forest attire, lending an air of romantic wildness to the aspect of an individual who, seen by the sober light of day, would have exhibited the peculiarities of a man remarkable for the strangeness of his dress, the iron-like inflexibility of his frame, and the singular compound of quick, vigilant sagacity and of exquisite simplicity that by turns usurped the possession of his muscular features. At a little distance in advance stood Uncas, his whole person thrown powerfully into view. The travelers anxiously regarded the upright, flexible figure of the young Mohican, graceful and unrestrained in the attitudes and movements of nature. Though his person was more than usually screened by a green and fringed hunting shirt like that of the white man, there was no concealment of his dark, glancing, fearless eye, alike terrible and calm, the bold outline of his high, haughty features, pure in their native red, or to the dignified elevation of his receding forehead, together with all the finest proportions of a noble head, bared to the generous scalping tuft. It was the first opportunity possessed by Duncan and his companions to view the marked lineaments of either of their Indian attendants and each individual of the party felt relieved from a burden of doubt, as the proud and determined, the wild expression of the features of the young warrior forced itself on their notice. They felt it might be a being partially benighted in the veil of ignorance, but it could not be one who would willingly devote his rich natural gifts to the purpose of wanton treachery. The ingenuous Alice gazed at his free air and proud carriage, as she would have looked upon some precious relic of the Grecian chisel to which life had been imparted by the invention of a miracle, while Hayward, though accustomed to see the perfection of form which abounds among the uncorrupted natives, openly expressed his admiration at such an unblemished specimen of the noblest proportions of man. "'I could sleep in peace,' whispered Alice in reply. With such a fearless and generous-looking youth for my sentinel. Surely, Duncan, those cruel martyrs, those terrific scenes of torture, of which we read and hear so much, are never acted in the presence of such as he. This is certainly a rare and brilliant instance of those natural qualities in which these peculiar people are said to excel, he answered. I agree with you, Alice in thinking that such a front and eye were formed rather to intimidate than to deceive. But let us not practice a deception upon ourselves by expecting any other exhibition of what we esteem virtue than according to the fashion of the savage. As bright examples of great qualities are but too uncommon among Christians, so they are singular and solitary with Indians. Though for the honor of our common nature, Neither are incapable of producing them. Let us then hope that this Mohican may not disappoint our wishes, but prove what his looks assert him to be, a brave and constant friend. Now Major Hayward speaks as Major Hayward should, said Cora. Who that looks at this creature of nature remembers the shade of his skin? A short and apparently an embarrassed silence succeeded this remark which was interrupted by the scout calling to them aloud to enter. This fire begins to show too bright a flame, he continued, as they complied, and might light the Mingos to our undoing. Uncas, drop the blanket and show the knaves its dark side. This is not such a supper as a major of the Royal Americans has right to expect, but I've known stout detachment of the Corps glad to eat their venison raw, and without a relish too, Footnote. In vulgar parlance, the condiments of a repast are called by the American a relish, substituting the thing for its effect. These provincial terms are frequently put in the mouths of the speakers 
according to their several conditions in life. Most of them are of local use, and others quite peculiar to the particular class of men to which the character belongs. In the present instance, the scout uses the word with immediate reference to the salt, with which his own party was so fortunate as to be provided. End footnote. Here, you see, we have plenty of salt, and can make a quick broil. There's fresh sassy frass boughs for the ladies to sit on, which may not be as proud as their my hog guinea chairs, but which sends up a sweeter flavor than the skin of any hog can do, be it of guinea or be it of any other land. Come, friend, don't be mournful for the colt. T'was an innocent thing, and had not seen much hardship. Its death will save the creature, many a sore back and weary foot. Uncas did as the other had directed, and when the voice of Hawkeye ceased, the roar of the cataract sounded like the rumbling of distant thunder. "'Are we quite safe in this cavern?' demanded Hayward. "'Is there no danger of surprise? A single-armed man at its entrance would hold us at his mercy.' A spectral-looking figure stalked out of the darkness behind the scout, and, seizing a blazing brand, held it toward the further extremity of their place of retreat. Alice uttered a faint shriek, and even Cora rose to her feet as this appalling object moved into the light. But a single word from Hayward calmed them, with the assurance it was only their attendant, Chingachgook, who, lifting another blanket, discovered that the cavern had two outlets. Then, holding the brand, he crossed a deep, narrow chasm in the rocks, which ran at right angles with the passage they were in, but which, unlike that, was open to the heavens, and entered another cave, answering to the description of the first in every essential particular. Such old foxes as Chingachgook and myself are not often caught in a bear with one hole, said Hawkeye, laughing. You can easily see the cunning of the place. The rock is black limestone, which everyone knows is soft. It makes no uncomfortable pillow where brush and pine wood is scarce. Well, the fall was once a few hundred yards below us, and I dare to say was in its time as regular and as handsome a sheet of water as any along the Hudson. But old age is a great injury to good looks, as these sweet young ladies have yet to learn. The place is sadly changed. These rocks are full of cracks, and in some places they are softer than at othersome, and the water has worked out deep hollows for itself until it has fallen back by some hundred feet, breaking here and wearing there, until the falls have neither shape nor consistency. "'In what part of them are we?' asked Hayward. "'Why, we are nigh the spot that Providence first placed them at, but where it seems they were too rebellious to stay. The rock proved softer on each side of us, and so they left the center of the river bare and dry, first working out these two little holes for us to hide in. We are on an island? Aye, there are falls on two sides of us, and the river above and below. If you had daylight, it would be worth the trouble to step on the height of this rock, and look at the perversity of the water. It falls by no rule at all. Sometimes it leaps, sometimes it tumbles. There it skips, here it shoots. In one place tis white as snow, and in another tis green as grass. Hereabouts it pitches into deep hollows that rumble and crush the earth, and there are ways it ripples and sings like a brook, fashioning whirlpools and gullies in the old stone as if twas no harder than trodden clay. The whole design of the river seems disconcerted. First it runs smoothly, as if meaning to go down the descent as things were ordered. Then it angles about and faces the shores, nor... Are there places wanting where it looks backward, as if unwilling to leave the wilderness to mingle with the salt? Aye, lady, the fine cobweb-looking cloth you wear at your throat is coarse and like a fishnet. To the little spots I can show you where the river fabricates all sorts of images, as if having broke loose from order, it would try its hand at everything. And yet, what does it amount to? 
after the water has been suffered so to have its will for a time, like a headstrong man, it is gathered together by the hand that made it, and a few rods below you may see it all, flowing on steadily toward the sea, as was foreordained from the first foundation of the earth. While his auditors received a cheering assurance of the security of their place of concealment from this untutored description of Glen's, they were much inclined to judge differently from Hawkeye of its wild beauties. Footnote. Glen's Falls are on the Hudson, some forty or fifty miles above the head of tide, or that place where the river becomes navigable for sloops. The description of this picturesque and remarkable little cataract, as given by the scout, is sufficiently correct, though the application of the water to uses in civilized life has materially injured its beauties. The rocky island and the two caverns are known to every traveler, since the former sustains the pier of a bridge, which is now thrown across the river immediately above the fall. In explanation of the taste of Hawkeye, it should be remembered that men always prize that most, which is least enjoyed. Thus, in a new country, the woods and other objects, which in an old country would be maintained at great cost, are got rid of, simply with a view of improving, as it is called. End footnote. They were not in a situation to suffer their thoughts to dwell on the charms of natural objects, and, as the scout had not found it necessary to cease his culinary labors while he spoke, unless to point out with a broken fork the direction of some particularly obnoxious point in the rebellious stream, they now suffered their attention to be drawn to the necessary the more vulgar consideration of their supper. The repast, which was greatly aided by the addition of a few delicacies that Hayward had the precaution to bring with him when they left their horses, was exceedingly refreshing to the weary party. Uncas acted as attendant to the females, performing all the little offices within his power, with a mixture of dignity and anxious grace, that served to amuse Hayward who well knew that it was an utter innovation on the Indian customs, which forbid their warriors to descend to any menial employment, especially in favor of their women. As the rites of hospitality were, however, considered sacred among them, this little departure from the dignity of manhood excited no audible comment. Had there been one sufficiently disengaged to become a close observer, he might have fancied that the services of the young chief were not entirely impartial, that, while he tendered to Alice the gourd of sweet water and the venison in a trencher, neatly carved from the knot of a pepperidge, with sufficient courtesy, in performing the same offices to her sister, his dark eye lingered on her rich, speaking countenance. Once or twice he was compelled to speak, to command her attention of those he served. In such cases, he made use of English, broken and imperfect, but sufficiently intelligible, and which he rendered so mild and musical by his deep guttural voice, that it never failed to cause both ladies to look up in admiration and astonishment. In the course of these civilities, a few sentences were exchanged that served to establish the appearance of an amicable intercourse between the parties. In the meanwhile, the gravity of Chingachgook remained immovable. He had seated himself more within the circle of light, where the frequent uneasy glances of his guest were better enabled to separate the natural expression of his face from the artificial terrors of the war-paint. They found a strong resemblance between father and son, with the difference that might be expected from age and hardships. The fierceness of his countenance now seemed to slumber, and in its place was to be seen the quiet, vacant composure which distinguishes an Indian warrior when his faculties are not required for any of the greater purposes of his existence. It was, however, easy to be seen by the occasional gleams that shot across his swarthy visage that it was only necessary to arouse his passions in order to give full effect to the terrific device which he had adopted to intimidate his enemies. On the other hand, the quick roving eye of the scout seldom rested. He ate and drank with an appetite that no sense of danger could disturb, but his vigilance seemed never to desert him. 
Twenty times the gourd of the venison was suspended before his lips, while his head was turned aside, as though he listened to some distant and distrusted sounds. A movement that never failed to recall his guest from regarding the novelties of their situation to a recollection of the alarming reasons that had driven them to seek it. As these frequent pauses were never followed by any remark, the momentary uneasiness they created quickly passed away, and for a time was forgotten. "'Come, friend,' said Hawkeye, drawing out a keg from beneath a cover of leaves toward the close of the repast, and addressing the stranger who sat at his elbow, doing great justice to his culinary skill. "'Try a little spruce. Twill wash away all thoughts of the colt, and quicken the life in your bosom. I drink to our better friendship, hoping that a little horse-flesh may leave no heart-burnings atween us. How do you name yourself? Gamut. David Gamut, returned the singing master, preparing to wash down his sorrows in a powerful draught of the woodsman's high-flavored and well-laced compound. A very good name, and I dare say, handed down from honest forefathers. I am an admirator of names, though the Christian fashions fall far below savage customs in this particular. The biggest coward I ever knew was called Lion, and his wife Patience would scold you out of hearing in less time than a hunted deer would run a rod. With an Indian, tis a matter of conscience what he calls himself. He generally is, not the Chingachcook, which signifies big sarpent, is really a snake, big or little but that he understands the windings and turnings of human nature, and is silent and strikes his enemies when they least expect him. What may be your calling? I am an unworthy instructor in the art of psalmody. Anan, I teach singing to the youths of the Connecticut levy. You might be better employed. The young hounds go laughing and singing, too much already through the woods, when they ought not to breathe louder than the fox in his cover. Can you use the smooth bore or handle the rifle? Praise be to God, I have never had occasion to meddle with murderous implements. Perhaps you understand the compass, and lay down the water courses and mountains of the wilderness on paper, in order that they who follow may find places by their given names? I practice no such employment. You have a pair of legs that might make a long path seem short. You journey sometimes, I fancy, with tidings for the general? Never. I follow no other than my own high vocation, which is instruction in sacred music. Tis a strange calling, muttered Hawkeye with an inward laugh, to go through life like a catbird, mocking all the ups and downs that may happen to come out of other men's throats? Well, friend, I suppose it is your gift, and mustn't be denied any more than if t'was shooting or some other better inclination. Let us hear what you can do in that way. T'will be a friendly manner of saying good night, for tis time that these ladies should be getting strength for a hard and long push in the pride of the morning, afore the maquas are stirring. With joyful pleasure... Do I consent, said David, adjusting his iron-rimmed spectacles, and producing his beloved little volume, which he immediately tendered to Alice. What can be more fitting and consolatory than to offer up evening praise, after a day of such exceeding jeopardy? Alice smiled, but regarding Hayward, she blushed and hesitated. Indulge yourself, he whispered. Ought not the suggestion of the worthy namesake of the psalmist to have its weight at such a moment? Encouraged by his opinion, Alice did what her pious inclinations and her keen relish for gentle sounds had before so strongly urged. The book was opened at a hymn not ill-adapted to their situation, and in which the poet, no longer goaded by his desire to expel the inspired king of Israel, had discovered some chastened and respectable powers. Korah, betrayed a disposition to support her sister, and the sacred song proceeded, after the indispensable preliminaries of the pitch-pipe, and the tune had been duly attended by the methodical David. The air was solemn and slow, 
At times it rose to the fullest compass of the rich voices of the females, who hung over their little book in holy excitement, and again it sank so low that the rushing of the waters ran through their melody like a hollow accompaniment. The natural taste and true ear of David governed and modified the sounds to suit the confined cavern, every crevice and cranny of which was filled with the thrilling notes of their flexible voices. The Indians riveted their eyes on the rocks and listened with an attention that seemed to turn them into stone. But the scout, who had placed his chin in his hand with an expression of cold indifference, gradually suffered his rigid features to relax, until, as verse succeeded verse, he felt his iron nature subdued, while his recollection was carried back to boyhood, when his ears had been accustomed to listen to similar sounds of praise in the settlements of the colony. His roving eyes began to moisten, and before the hymn was ended, scalding tears rolled out of fountains that had long seemed dry, and followed each other down those cheeks that had oftener felt the storms of heaven than any testimonials of weakness. The singers were dwelling on one of those low, dying chords, which the ear devours with such greedy rapture, as if conscious that it was about to lose them, when a cry that seemed neither human nor earthly rose in the outward air, penetrating not only the recesses of the cavern, but to the inmost hearts of all who heard it. It was followed by a stillness, apparently as deep as if the waters had been checked in their furious progress at such a horrid and unusual interruption. "'What is it?' murmured Alice, after a few moments of terrible suspense. "'What is it?' repeated Hayward aloud. Neither Hawkeye nor the Indians made any reply. They listened, as if expecting the sound would be repeated, with a manner that expressed their own astonishment. At length they spoke together earnestly in the Delaware language, when Uncas, passing by the inner and most concealed aperture, cautiously left the cavern. When he had gone, the scout first spoke in English. What it is or what it is not, none here can tell. Though two of us have ranged the wood for more than thirty years, I did believe there was no cry that Indian or beast could make that my ears had not heard. But this has proved that I was only a vain and conceited mortal. Was it not, then, the shout warriors make when they wish to intimidate their enemies? asked Cora, who stood drawing her veil about her person, with a calmness to which her agitated sister was a stranger. No, no, this was bad and shocking, and had a short of unhuman sound. But when you once hear the war hoop, you will never mistake it for anything else. Well, Uncas, speaking in the Delaware to the young chief as he re-entered, what see you? Do our lights shine through the blankets? The answer was short and apparently decided, being given in the same tongue. There is nothing to be seen without, continued Hawkeye, shaking his head in discontent, and our hiding place is still in darkness. Pass into the other cave, you that need it, and seek for sleep. We must be afoot long before the sun, and make the most of our time to get to Edward while the Mingos are still taking their morning nap. Cora set the example of compliance with a steadiness that taught the more timid Alice the necessity of obedience. Before leaving the place, however, she whispered a request to Duncan that he would follow. Uncas raised the blanket for the passage and as the sisters turned to thank him for his act of attention, they saw the scout seated again before the dying embers, with his face resting on his hands, in a manner which showed how deeply he brooded on the unaccountable interruption which had broken their evening devotions. Hayward took with him a blazing knot, which threw a dim light through the narrow vista of their new apartment. Placing it in a favorable position, he joined the females, who now found themselves alone with him, for the first time since they had left the friendly ramparts of Fort Edward. "'Leave us not, Duncan,' said Alice. "'We cannot sleep in such a place as this, with that horrid cry still ringing in our ears.' First, let us examine into the security of our fortress,' he answered. "'And then we will speak of rest.' He approached the further end of the cavern, to an outlet which, like the others, was concealed by blankets, and, removing the thick screen, 
breathe the fresh and reviving air from the cataract. One arm of the river flowed through a deep, narrow ravine, which its current had worn in the soft rock directly beneath his feet, forming an effectual defense, as he believed, against any danger from that quarter. The water, a few rods above them, plunging, glancing, and sweeping along in its most violent and broken manner. Nature has made an impenetrable barrier on this side, he continued, pointing down the perpendicular declivity into the dark current before he dropped the blanket. And as you know that good men and true are on guard in front, I see no reason why the advice of our honest host should be disregarded. I am certain Cora will join me in saying that sleep is necessary to you both. Cora may submit to the justice of your opinion, though she cannot put it in practice, returned the elder sister, who had placed herself by the side of Alice on a couch of sassafras. There would be other causes to chase away sleep, though we had been spared the shock of this mysterious noise. Ask yourself, Hayward, can daughters forget the anxiety a father must endure, whose children lodge he knows not where or how in such a wilderness, and in the midst of so many perils? He is a soldier and knows how to estimate the chances of the woods. He is a father and cannot deny his nature. How kind has he ever been to all my follies! How tender and indulgent to all my wishes! sobbed Alice. We have been selfish, sister, in urging our visit at such hazard. I had been rash in pressing his consent in a moment of such embarrassment that I would have proved to him that however others might neglect him in his strait, his children at least were faithful. When he heard of your arrival at Edward, said Hayward kindly, there was a powerful struggle in his bosom between fear and love. Though the latter, heightened if possible, by so long a separation, quickly prevailed. It is the spirit of my noble-minded Cora that leads them, Duncan, he said, and I would not balk it. Would to God that he who holds the honor of our royal master in his guardianship would show but half her firmness. And did he not speak of me, Hayward? demanded Alice with jealous affection. Surely he forgot not altogether his little Elsie. That were impossible, returned the young man. He called you by a thousand endearing epithets that I may not presume to use, but to the justice of which I can warmly testify. Once, indeed, he said, Duncan ceased speaking, for while his eyes were riveted on those of Alice, who had turned toward him with the eagerness of filial affection to catch his words, the same strong, horrid cry as before filled the air and rendered him mute. A long, breathless silence succeeded, during which each looked at the others in fearful expectation of hearing the sound repeated. At length the blanket was slowly raised, and the scout stood in the aperture with a countenance whose firmness evidently began to give way before a mystery that seemed to threaten some danger, against which all his cunning and experience might prove to no avail. End of chapter 6 This reading by Gary W. Sherwin of Yukon, Pennsylvania in the summer of 2007Chapter 7 of The Last of the Mohicans, a narrative of 1757 by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 7 Quote they do not sleep. On yonder cliffs a grizzly band. I see them sit. Unquote. Gray. T'would be neglecting a warning that is given for our good to lie hid any longer, said Hawkeye, when such sounds are raised in the forest. These gentle ones may keep close, but the Mohicans and I will watch upon the rock, where I suppose a major of the sixtieth would wish to keep us company. Is then our danger so pressing? asked Cora. He who makes strange sounds and gives them out for man's information alone knows our danger. 
I should think myself wicked unto rebellion against his will, was I to burrow with such warnings in the air. Even the weak soul who passes his days in singing is stirred by the cry, and, as he says, is ready to go forth to the battle. If twere only a battle, it would be a thing understood by us all and easily managed. But I have heard that when such shrieks are atween heaven and earth, it betokens another sort of warfare. If all our reasons for fear, my friend, were confined to such as proceed from supernatural causes, we have but little occasion to be alarmed, continued the undisturbed Cora. Are you certain that our enemies have not invented some new and ingenious method to strike us with terror, that their conquest may become more easy? Lady, returned the scout solemnly, I have listened to all the sounds of the woods for thirty years, as a man will listen whose life and death depend on the quickness of his ears. There is no whine of the panther, no whistle of the catbird, nor any invention of the devilish mingos that can cheat me. I have heard the forest moan like mortal men in their affliction. Often and again have I listened to the wind playing its music in the branches of the girdled trees, and I have heard the lightning crackling in the air like the snapping of blazing brush as it spitted forth sparks and forked flames. But never have I thought that I heard more than the pleasure of him who sported with the things of his hand. But neither the Mohicans nor I, who am a white man without a cross, can explain the cry just heard. We therefore believe it a sign given for our good. It is extraordinary, said Hayward, taking his pistols from the place where he had laid them on entering. Be it a sign of peace or a signal of war, it must be looked to. Lead the way, my friend. I follow. On issuing from their place of confinement, the whole party instantly experienced a grateful renovation of spirits by exchanging the pent air of the hiding place for the cool and invigorating atmosphere which played around the whirlpools and pitches of the cataract. A heavy evening breeze swept along the surface of the river and seemed to drive the roar of the falls into the recesses of their own cavern, whence it issued heavily and constant, like thunder rumbling beyond the distant hills. The moon had risen, and its light was already glancing here and there on the waters above them. But the extremity of the rock where they stood still lay in shadow. With the exception of the sounds produced by the rushing waters, and the occasional breathing of the air as it murmured past them in fitful currents, the scene was as still as night and solitude could make it. In vain were the eyes of each individual bent along the opposite shores, in quest of some signs of life that might explain the nature of the interruption they had heard. Their anxious and eager looks were baffled by the deceptive light, or rested only on naked rocks and straight and immovable trees. Here is nothing to be seen but the gloom and quiet of a lovely evening, whispered Duncan. How much should we prize such a scene, and all this breathing solitude at any other moment? Cora, fancy yourselves in security and what now perhaps increases your terror, may be made conducive to enjoyment. Listen! interrupted Alice. The caution was unnecessary. Once more the same sound arose, as if from the bed of the river, and, having broken out of the narrow bounds of the cliffs, was heard undulating through the forest in distant and dying cadences. Can any here give a name to such a cry? demanded Hawkeye, when the last echo was lost in the woods. If so, let him speak. For myself, I judge it not to belong to Arth. Here, then, is one who can undeceive you, said Duncan. I know the sound full well, and have often heard it on the field of battle, and in situations which are frequent in a soldier's life. Tis the horrid shriek that a horse will give in his agony, oftener drawn from him in pain, though sometimes in terror. My charger is either a prey to the beast of the forest, 
or he sees his danger without the power to avoid it. The sound might deceive me in the cavern, but in the open air I know it too well to be wrong. The scout and his companions listened to this simple explanation with the interest of men who imbibe new ideas at the same time that they get rid of old ones, which had proved disagreeable inmates. The two latter uttered their usual expressive exclamation, huh! as the truth first glanced upon their minds, while the former, after a short musing pause, took upon himself to reply. I cannot deny your words, he said, for I am little skilled in horses, though born where they abound. The wolves must be hovering above their heads on the bank, and the timorsome creatures are calling on man for help in the best manner they are able. Uncas, he spoke in Delaware, Uncas, drop down to the canoe and whirl a brand among the pack, or fear may do what the wolves can't get at to perform, and leave us without horses in the morning, when we shall have so much need to journey swiftly. The young native had already descended to the water to comply, when a long howl was raised on the edge of the river, and was borne swiftly off into the depths of the forest, as though the beast of their own accord were abandoning their prey in sudden terror. Uncas, with instinctive quickness, receded, and the three foresters held another of their low, earnest conferences. We have been like hunters who have lost the points of the heavens, and from whom the sun has been hid for days, said Hawkeye, turning away from his companions. Now we begin again to know the signs of our course, and the paths are cleared from briars. Seat yourselves in the shade which the moon throws from yonder beach. Tis thicker than that of the pines. And let us wait that which the Lord may choose to send next. Let all your conversation be in whispers, though it would be better, and perhaps in the end wiser, if each one held discourse with his own thoughts for a time. The manner of the scout was seriously impressive, though no longer distinguished by any signs of unmanly apprehension. It was evident that his momentary weakness had vanished, with the explanation of a mystery which his own experience had not served to fathom. And though he now felt all the realities of their actual condition, that he was prepared to meet them with the energy of his hardy nature. This feeling seemed also common to the natives, who placed themselves in positions which commanded a full view of both shores, while their own persons were effectually concealed from observation. In such circumstances, common prudence dictated that Hayward and his companions should imitate a caution that proceeded from so intelligent a source. The young man drew a pile of sassafras from the cave, and placing it in the chasm which separated the two caverns, it was occupied by the sisters, who were thus protected by the rocks from any missiles, while their anxiety was relieved by the assurance that no danger could approach without a warning. Hayward himself was posted at hand, so near that he might communicate with his companions without raising his voice to a dangerous elevation, while David, in imitation of the woodsman, bestowed his person in such a manner among the fissures of the rocks that his ungainly limbs were no longer offensive to the eye. In this manner, hours passed without further interruption. The moon reached the zenith and shed its mild light perpendicularly on the lovely sight of the sisters slumbering peacefully in each other's arms. Duncan cast the wide shawl of Cora before a spectacle he so much loved to contemplate, and then suffered his own head to seek a pillow on the rock. David began to utter sounds that would have shocked his delicate organs in more wakeful moments. In short, all but Hawkeye and the Mohicans lost every idea of consciousness in uncontrollable drowsiness. But the watchfulness of these vigilant protectors neither tired nor slumbered. Immovable as that rock, of which each appeared to form a part, they lay with their eyes roving, without intermission, along the dark margin of trees that bounded the adjacent shores of the narrow stream. 
not a sound escaped them. The most subtle examination could not have told they breathed. It was evident that this excess of caution proceeded from an experience that no subtlety on the part of their enemies could deceive. It was, however, continued without any apparent consequences, until the moon had set, and a pale streak above the treetops, at the bend of the river a little below, announced the approach of day. Then, for the first time, Hawkeye was seen to stir. He crawled along the rock and shook Duncan from his heavy slumbers. "'Now is the time to journey,' he whispered. "'Awake the gentlemen's, and be ready to get into the canoe, when I bring it to the landing-place.' "'Have you had a quiet night?' said Hayward. "'For myself, I believe sleep has gotten the better of my vigilance. "'All is yet still as midnight. "'Be silent, but be quick.' By this time Duncan was thoroughly awake, and he immediately lifted the shawl from the sleeping females. The motion caused Cora to raise her hand as if to repulse him, while Alice murmured in her soft, gentle voice, "'No, no, dear father. We were not deserted. Duncan was with us.' "'Yes, sweet innocence,' whispered the youth. "'Duncan is here. And while life continues, or danger remains.' He will never quit thee. Cora, Alice, awake. The hour has come to move. A loud shriek from the younger of the sisters, and the form of the other standing upright before him in bewildered horror, was the unexpected answer he received. While the words were still on the lips of Hayward, there had arisen such a tumult of yells and cries as served to drive the swift currents of his own blood back from its bounding course into the fountains of his heart. It seemed for near a minute as if the demons of hell had possessed themselves of the air about them, and were venting their savage humors in barbarous sounds. The cries came from no particular direction, though it was evident they filled the woods, and as the appalled listeners easily imagined, the caverns of the falls, the rocks, the bed of the river, and the upper air. David raised his tall person in the midst of the infernal din, with a hand on either ear, exclaiming, Whence comes this discord? Has hell broke loose that man should utter sounds like these? The bright flashes and the quick reports of a dozen rifles from the opposite banks of the stream followed this incautious exposure of his person, and left the unfortunate singing master senseless on that rock where he had been so long slumbering. The Mohicans boldly sent back the intimidating yell of their enemies, who raised a shout of savage triumph at the fall of Gamut. The flash of rifles was then quick and close between them, but either party was too well skilled to leave even a limb exposed to the hostile aim. Duncan listened with intense anxiety for the strokes of the paddle, believing that flight was now their only refuge. The river glanced by with its ordinary velocity, but the canoe was nowhere to be seen on its dark waters. He had just fancied they were cruelly deserted by their scout, as a stream of flame issued from the rock beneath them, and a fierce yell, blended with a shriek of agony, announced that the messenger of death, sent from the fatal weapon of Hawkeye, had found a victim. At this slight repulse, the assailants instantly withdrew, and gradually the place became as still as before the sudden tumult. Duncan seized the favorable moment to spring to the body of Gamut which he bore within the shelter of the narrow chasm that protected the sisters. In another minute, the whole party was collected in the spot of comparative safety. The poor fellow has saved his scalp, said Hawkeye, coolly passing his hand over the head of David. But he is proof that a man may be born with too long a tongue. Twas downright madness to show six feet of flesh and blood on a naked rock to the raging savages. I only wonder he has escaped with life. Is he not dead? demanded Cora, in a voice whose husky tone showed how powerfully natural horror struggled with her assumed firmness. Can we do aught to assist the wretched man? No, no. The life is in his heart yet, and after he has slept a while, he will come to himself, and be a wiser man for it. 
till the hour of his real time shall come, returned Hawkeye, casting another oblique glance at the insensible body, while he filled his charger with admirable nicety. Carry him in, Uncas, and lay him on the sassafras. The longer his nap lasts, the better it will be for him, as I doubt whether he can find a proper cover for such a shape on these rocks. And singing won't do any good with the Iroquois. You believe, then, that the attack will be renewed? asked Hayward. Do I expect a hungry wolf to satisfy his craving with a mouthful? They have lost a man, and tis their fashion when they meet a loss, and fail in the surprise, to fall back. But we shall have them on again, with new expedients to circumvent us, and master our scalps. Our main hope, he continued, raising his rugged countenance across which a shade of anxiety just then passed like a darkening cloud, will be to keep the rock until Monroe can send a party to our help. God send it may be soon, and under a leader that knows the Indian customs. You hear our probable fortunes, Cora, said Duncan, and you know we have everything to hope from the anxiety and experience of your father. Come, then, with Alice into this cavern, where you at least will be safe from the murderous rifles of our enemies, and where you may bestow a care suited to your gentle natures on our unfortunate comrade. The sisters followed him into the outer cave, where David was beginning, by his sighs, to give symptoms of returning consciousness, and then, commending the wounded man to their attention, he immediately prepared to leave them. Duncan, said the tremulous voice of Cora, when he had reached the mouth of the cavern. He turned and beheld the speaker, whose color had changed to a deadly paleness, and whose lips quivered, gazing after him with an expression of interest which immediately recalled him to her side. Remember, Duncan, how necessary your safety is to our own, how you bear a father's sacred trust, how much depends on your discretion and care. In short, she added, while the tell-tale blood stole over her features, crimsoning her very temples, how very deservedly dear you are to all of the name and row. If anything could add to my own base love of life, said Hayward, suffering his unconscious eyes to wander to the youthful form of the silent Alice, it would be so kind an insurance. As Major the Sixtieth, our honest host will tell you I must take my share of the fray. But our task will be easy. It is merely to keep these bloodhounds at bay for a few hours. Without waiting for a reply, he tore himself from the presence of the sisters, and joined the scout and his companions, who still lay within the protection of the little chasm between the two caves. I tell you, Uncas, said the former, as Hayward joined them, you are wasteful of your powder, and the kick of your rifle disconcerts your aim. Little powder, light lead, and a long arm seldom fail of bringing the death screech from a mingo. At least, such has been my experience with the creatures. Come, friends, let us to our covers, for no man can tell when or where Maqua will strike his blow. Footnote. Mingo was the Delaware term of the five nations. Maquas was the name given them by the Dutch. The French, from their first intercourse with them, called them Iroquois. End footnote. The Indians silently repaired to their appointed stations, which were fissures in the rocks, whence they could command the approaches to the foot of the falls. In the center of the little island, a few short and stunted pines had found root, forming a thicket into which Hawkeye darted with the swiftness of a deer, followed by the act of Duncan. Here they secured themselves, as well as circumstances would permit, among the shrubs and fragments of stone that were scattered about the place. Above them was a bare rounded rock, on each side of which the water played its gambols and plunged into the abysses beneath, in the manner already described. As the day had now dawned, 
the opposite shores no longer presented a confused outline, but they were able to look into the woods and distinguish objects beneath a canopy of gloomy pines. A long and anxious watch succeeded, but without any further evidences of a renewed attack, and Duncan began to hope that their fire had proved more fatal than was supposed, and that their enemies had been effectually repulsed. When he ventured to utter his impression to his companions, it was met by Hawkeye, with an incredulous shake of the head. "'You know not the nature of Amaqua if you think he is so easily beaten back without a scalp,' he answered. "'If there was one of the imps yelling this morning, there were forty, and they know our number and quality too well to give up the chase so soon. Hist! Look into the water above, just where it breaks over the rocks. I am no mortal if the risky devils haven't swam down to the very pitch, and as bad luck would have it, they have hit the head of the island. Hist! Man, keep close, or your hair will be off your crown in the turning of a knife. Hayward lifted his head from the cover and beheld what he justly considered a prodigy of rashness and skill. The river had worn away the edge of the soft rock in such a manner as to render its first pitch less abrupt and perpendicular than is usual at waterfalls. With no other guide than the ripple of the stream where it met the head of the island, a party of their insatiable foes had ventured into the current and swam down upon this point, knowing the ready access it would give, if successful, to their intended victims. As Hawkeye ceased speaking, Four human heads could be seen peering above a few logs of driftwood that had lodged on these naked rocks, and which had probably suggested the idea of the practicability of the hazardous undertaking. At the next moment, a fifth form was seen floating over the green edge of the fall, a little from the line of the island. The savage struggled powerfully to gain the point of safety, and favored by the glancing water, he was already stretching forth an arm to meet the grasp of his companion, when he shot away again with the swirling current, appeared to rise into the air with uplifted arms and starting eyeballs, and fell with a sudden plunge into that deep and yawning abyss over which he hovered. A single wild despairing shriek rose from the cavern, and all was hushed again as the grave. The first generous impulse of Duncan was to rush to the rescue of the hapless wretch, but he felt himself bound to the spot by the iron grasp of the immovable scout. "'Would ye bring certain death upon us by telling the Mingos where we lie?' demanded Hawkeye sternly. "'Tis a charge of powder saved, and ammunition is as precious now as breath to a weary deer. Freshen the priming of your pistols.' The midst of the falls is apt to dampen the brimstone. And stand firm for a close struggle, while I fire on their rush. He placed a finger in his mouth, and drew a long, shrill whistle, which was answered from the rocks that were guarded by the Mohicans. Duncan caught glimpses of heads above the scattered driftwood, as the signal rose on the air, but they disappeared again, as suddenly as they had glanced upon his sight. A low rustling sound next drew his attention behind him, and turning his head, he beheld Uncas within a few feet, creeping to his side. Hawkeye spoke to him in Delaware, when the young chief took his position with singular caution and undisturbed coolness. To Hayward, this was a moment of feverish and impatient suspense. Though the scout saw fit to select it, as a fit occasion to read a lecture to his more youthful associates on the art of using firearms with discretion. Of all weapons, he commenced, the long-barreled, true-grooved, soft-metaled rifle is the most dangerous in skillful hands, though at once a strong arm, a quick eye, and great judgment in charging to put forth all its beauties. The gunsmiths can have but little insight into their trade, when they make their fowling pieces and short horsemen's. He was interrupted by the low but expressive oh! of Uncas. I see them, boy, I see them, continued Hawkeye. They are gathering for the rush, or they would keep their dingy backs down below the logs. 
Well, let them, he added, examining his flint. The leading man certainly comes to his death, though it should be Montcalm himself. At that moment the woods were filled with another burst of cries, and at the signal four savages sprang from the cover of the driftwood. Hayward felt a burning desire to rush forward to meet them, so intense was the delirious anxiety of the moment, but he was restrained by the deliberate examples of the scout and Uncas. When their foes, who had leaped over the black rocks that divided them with long bounds, uttering the wildest yells, were within a few rods, the rifle of Hawkeye slowly rose among the shrubs, and poured out its fatal contents. The foremost Indian bounded like a stricken deer, and fell headlong among the clefts of the island. "'Now, Uncas!' cried the scout, drawing his long knife, while his quick eyes began to flash with ardor. "'Take the last of the screeching imps. Of the other two, we are certain.' He was obeyed, and but two enemies remained to be overcome. Hayward had given one of his pistols to Hawkeye, and together they rushed down a little declivity toward their foes. They discharged their weapons at the same instant, and equally without success. "'I knowed it, and I said it,' muttered the scout, whirling the despised little implement over the falls in bitter disdain. "'Come on, ye bloody-minded hellhounds! Ye meet a man without a cross!' The words were barely uttered when he encountered a savage of gigantic stature, of the fiercest mien. At the same moment, Duncan found himself engaged with the other, in a similar contest of hand to hand. With ready skill, Hawkeye and his antagonist each grasped that uplifted arm of the other, which held the dangerous knife. For near a minute they stood looking one another in the eye and gradually exerting the power of their muscles for the mastery. At length, the toughened sinews of the white men prevailed over the less practiced limbs of the native. The arm of the latter slowly gave way before the increasing force of the scout, who suddenly, wrestling his armed hand from the grasp of the foe, drove the sharp weapon through his naked bosom to the heart. In the meantime, Hayward had been pressed in a more deadly struggle. His slight sword was snapped in the first encounter. As he was destitute of any other means of defense, his safety now depended entirely on bodily strength and resolution. Though deficient in neither of these qualities, he had met an enemy every way his equal. Happily, he soon succeeded in disarming his adversary, whose knife fell on the rock at their feet and from this moment it became a fierce struggle who should cast the other over the dizzy height into a neighboring cavern of the falls. Every successful struggle brought them nearer to the verge, where Duncan perceived the final and conquering effort must be made. Each of the combatants threw all his energies into that effort, and the result was that both tottered on the brink of the precipice. Hayward felt the grasp of the other at his throat, and saw the grim smile the savage gave under the revengeful hope that he hurried his enemy to a fate similar to his own, as he felt his body slowly yielding to a resistless power, and the young man experienced the passing agony of such a moment in all its horrors. At that instant of extreme danger, a dark hand and a glancing knife appeared before him, the Indian released his hold, as the blood flowed freely from around the severed tendons of the wrist, and while Duncan was drawn backward by the saving hand of Uncas, his charmed eyes still were riveted on the fierce and disappointed countenance of his foe, who fell sullenly and disappointed down the irrecoverable precipice. "'To cover! To cover!' cried Hawkeye, who just then had dispatched the enemy. To cover for your lives. The work is but half ended. The young Mohican gave a shout of triumph, and followed by Duncan, he glided up the acclivity they had descended to the combat, and sought the friendly shelter of the rocks and shrubs. End of chapter 7. This recording by Gary W. Sherwin of Yukon, Pennsylvania, in the summer of 2007.
Chapter 8 of The Last of the Mohicans A Narrative of 1757 by James Fenimore Cooper This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 8 Quote they linger yet, avengers of their native land. Unquote. By Gray. The warning call of the scout was not uttered without occasion. During the occurrence of the deadly encounter just related, the roar of the falls was unbroken by any human sound whatever. It would seem that interest in the result had kept the natives on the opposite shores in breathless suspense while the quick evolutions and swift changes in the positions of the combatants effectually prevented a fire that might prove dangerous alike to friend and enemy. But the moment the struggle was decided, a yell arose as fierce and savage as wild and revengeful passions could throw into the air. It was followed by the swift flashes of the rifles, which sent their leaden messenger across the rock in volleys, as though the assailants would pour out their impotent fury on the insensible scene of the fatal contest. A steady, though deliberate, return was made from the rifle of Chingachgook, who had maintained his post throughout the fray with unmoved resolution. When the triumphant shout of Uncas was borne to his ears, the gratified father raised his voice in a single responsive cry, after which... His busy peace alone proved that he still guarded his pass with unwearied diligence. In this manner, many minutes flew by with the swiftness of thought, the rifles of the assailants speaking at times in rattling volleys, and at others in occasional scattering shots. Though the rock, the trees, and the shrubs were cut and torn in a hundred places around the besieged, their cover was so close and so rigidly maintained that as yet David had been the only sufferer in their little band. Let them burn their powder, said the deliberate scout, while bullet after bullet whizzed by the place where he securely lay. There will be a fine gathering of lead when it is over, and I fancy the imps will tire of the sport before these old stones cry out for mercy. Uncas, boy, you waste the colonels by overcharging and a kicking rifle never carries a true bullet. I told you to take that loping miscreant under the line of white point. Now, if your bullet went a hair's breadth, it went two inches above it. The life lies low in a mingo, and humanity teaches us to make a quick end to the serpents. A quiet smile lighted the haughty features of the young Mohican betraying his knowledge of the English language, as well as of the other's meaning, but he suffered it to pass away without vindication of reply. I cannot permit you to accuse Uncas of want of judgment or of skill, said Duncan. He saved my life in the coolest and readiest manner, and he has made a friend who will never require to be reminded of the debt he owes. Uncas partly raised his body, and offered his hand to the grasp of Hayward. During this act of friendship, the two young men exchanged looks of intelligence, which caused Duncan to forget the character and condition of his wild associate. In the meanwhile, Hawkeye, who looked on this burst of youthful feeling with a cool but kind regard, made the following reply. Life is an obligation which friends often owe each other in the wilderness. I dare say I may have served Uncas some such turn myself before now, and I very well remember that he has stood between me and death five different times, three times from the Mingos, once in crossing the Horrigan, and— That bullet was better aimed than common, exclaimed Duncan, involuntarily shrinking from a shot which struck the rock at his side with a smart rebound. Hawkeye laid his hand on the shapeless metal and shook his head as he examined it, saying— Falling lead is never flattened. Had it come from the clouds, this might have happened. But the rifle of Uncas was deliberately raised toward the heavens, directing the eyes of his companions to a point 
where the mystery was immediately explained. A ragged oak grew on the right bank of the river, nearly opposite to their position, which, seeking the freedom of open space, had inclined so far forward that its upper branches overhung that arm of the stream which flowed nearest to its shore. Among the topmost leaves, which scantily concealed the gnarled and stunted limbs, a savage was nestled, partly concealed by the trunk of the tree, and partly exposed, as though looking down upon them to ascertain the effect produced by his treacherous aim. "'These devils will scale heaven to circumvent us to our ruins,' said Hawkeye. "'Keep him in play, boy, until I can bring Kildeer to bear, when we will try his mettle on each side of the tree at once.' Uncas delayed his fire until the scout uttered the word. The rifles flashed, and the leaves and bark of the oak flew into the air and were scattered by the wind. But the Indian answered their assault by a taunting laugh, sending down upon them another bullet in return that struck the cap of Hawkeye from his head. Once more the savage yells burst out of the woods, and the leaden hail whistled above the heads of the besieged as if to confine them to a place where they might become easy victims to the enterprise of the warrior who had mounted the tree. "'This must be looked to,' said the scout, glancing about him with an anxious eye. "'Uncas, call up your father. We have need of all of our weapons to bring the cunning varmint from his roost.' The signal was instantly given, and before Hawkeye had reloaded his rifle, they were joined by Chingachgook. When his son pointed out to the experienced warrior— the situation of their dangerous enemy, the usual exclamatory, oh! burst from his lips, after which no further expression of surprise or alarm was suffered to escape him. Hawkeye and the Mohicans conversed earnestly together in Delaware for a few moments, when each quietly took his post in order to execute the plan they had speedily devised. The warrior in the oak had maintained a quick though ineffectual fire, from the moment of his discovery, but his aim was interrupted by the vigilance of his enemies, whose rifles instantaneously bore on any part of his person that was left exposed. Still, his bullets fell in the center of the crouching party. The clothes of Hayward, which rendered him particularly conspicuous, were repeatedly cut, and once blood was drawn from a slight wound in his arm. At length, Emboldened by the long and patient watchfulness of his enemies, the Huron attempted a better and more fatal aim. The quick eyes of the Mohicans caught the dark line of his lower limbs, incautiously exposed through the thin foliage, a few inches from the trunk of the tree. Their rifles made a common report. When sinking on his wounded limb, part of the body of the savage came into view. Swift as thought, Hawkeye seized the advantage, and discharged his fatal weapon into the top of the oak. The leaves were unusually agitated. The dangerous rifle fell from its commanding elevation, and after a few moments of vain struggling, the form of the savage was seen swinging in the wind, while he still grasped a ragged and naked branch of the tree, with hands clenched in desperation. "'Give him in pity! Give him the contents of another rifle!' cried Duncan, turning away his eyes in horror from the spectacle of a fellow creature in such awful jeopardy. "'Not a carnal!' exclaimed the obdurate Hawkeye. "'His death is certain, and we have no powder to spare, for Indian fights sometimes last for days. "'Tis their scalps or ours, and God, who made us, has put into our natures the craving to keep the skin on the head.' Against this stern and unyielding morality, supported as it was by such visible policy, there was no appeal. From that moment, the yells in the forest once more ceased, the fire was suffered to decline, and all eyes, those of friends as well as enemies, became fixed on the hopeless condition of the wretch who was dangling between heaven and earth. The body yielded to the currents of the air and though no murmur or groan escaped the victim, there were instants when he grimly faced his foes, and the anguish of cold despair might be traced through the intervening distance in possession of his swarthy lineaments. Three several times the scout raised his piece in mercy, and as often 
prudence getting the better of his intention, it was again silently lowered. At length, one hand of the Huron lost its hold and dropped exhausted to his side. A desperate and fruitless struggle to recover the branch succeeded. And then the savage was seen for a fleeting instant, grasping wildly at the empty air. The lightning is not quicker than was the flame from the rifle of Hawkeye. The limbs of the victim trembled and contracted, the head fell to the bosom, and the body parted the foaming waters like lead. When the element closed above it in its ceaseless velocity, and every vestige of the unhappy Huron was lost forever. No shout of triumph succeeded this important advantage, but even the Mohicans gazed at each other in silent horror. A single yell burst from the woods, and all was again still. Hawkeye, who alone appeared to reason on the occasion, shook his head at his own momentary weakness, even uttering his self-disapprobation aloud. "'Twas the last charge in my horn and the last bullet in my pouch, and twas the act of a boy," he said. What mattered whether he struck the rock living or dead? Filling would soon be over. Uncas, lad, go down to the canoe and bring up the big horn. It is all the powder we have left, and we shall need it to the last grain, or I am ignorant of the Mingo nature. The young Mohican complied, leaving the scout turning over the useless contents of his pouch, and shaking the empty horn with renewed discontent. From this unsatisfactory examination, however, he was soon called by a loud and piercing exclamation from Uncas, that sounded even to the unpractised ears of Duncan as the signal of some new and unexpected calamity. Every thought filled with apprehension for the previous treasure he had concealed in the cavern. The young man started to his feet, totally regardless of the hazard he incurred by such an exposure. As if actuated by a common impulse, his movement was imitated by his companions, and together they rushed down the pass to the friendly chasm with a rapidity that rendered the scattering fire of their enemies perfectly harmless. The unwanted cry had brought the sisters together with the wounded David from their place of refuge, and the whole party at a single glance was made acquainted with the nature of the disaster that had disturbed even the practiced stoicism other youthful Indian protector. At a short distance from the rock, their little bark was to be seen floating across the eddy toward the swift current of the river, in a manner which proved that its course was directed by some hidden agent. The instant this unwelcome sight caught the eye of the scout, his rifle was leveled as by instinct, but the barrel gave no answer to the bright sparks of the flint. "'Tis too late! "'Tis too late!' Hawkeye exclaimed, dropping the useless piece in bitter disappointment. "'The miscreant has struck the rapid, and, had we powder, it could hardly send the lead swifter than he now goes.' The adventurous Huron raised his head above the shelter of the canoe, and while it glided swiftly down the stream, he waved his hand and gave forth the shout, which was the known signal of success. His cry was answered by a yell and a laugh from the woods, as tauntingly exulting as if fifty demons were uttering their blasphemies at the fall of some Christian soul. "'Well may you laugh, ye children of the devil,' said the scout, seating himself on a projection of the rock, and suffering his gun to fall neglected at his feet. For the three quickest and truest rifles in these woods are no better than so many stalks of mullen, or the last year's horns of a buck." "'What is to be done?' demanded Duncan, losing the first feeling of disappointment in a more manly desire for exertion. "'What will become of us?' Hawkeye made no other reply than by passing his finger around the crown of his head, in a manner so significant that none who witnessed the action could mistake its meaning. "'Surely our case is not so desperate,' exclaimed the youth. "'The Hurons are not here.' We may make good the caverns. We may oppose their landing. With what? coolly demanded the scout. The heirs of Uncas? Or such tears as women shed? No, no. You are young and rich and have friends. And at such an age, I know, 
It is hard to die. But, glancing his eyes at the Mohicans, let us remember we are men without a cross, and let us teach these natives of the forest that white blood can run as freely as red when the appointed hour is come. Duncan turned quickly in the direction indicated by the other's eyes, and read a confirmation of his worst apprehensions in the conduct of the Indians. Chingachgook, placing himself in a dignified posture on another fragment of the rock, had already laid aside his knife and tomahawk, and was in the act of taking the eagle plume from his head, and smoothing the solitary tuft of hair, in readiness to perform its last and revolting office. His countenance was composed, though thoughtful, while his dark gleaming eyes were gradually losing the fierceness of the combat, in an expression better suited to the change he expected momentarily to undergo. "'Our case cannot be so hopeless,' said Duncan. "'Even at this very moment succor may be at hand. I see no enemies. They have sickened of a struggle in which they risk so much with so little prospect of gain. It may be a minute, or it may be an hour, afore the wily serpents steal upon us. And it is quite in nature for them to be lying within hearing at this very moment, said Hawkeye. But come they will, and in such a fashion as will leave us nothing to hope. Chingachgook, he spoke in Delaware. My brother, we have fought our last battle together, and the Maquas will triumph in the death of the sage man of the Mohicans, and of the pale face, whose eyes can make night as day, and level the clouds to the mist of the springs. Let the Mingo women weep over the slain, returned the Indian, with characteristic pride and unmoved firmness. The great snake of the Mohicans has coiled himself in their wigwams, and has poisoned their triumph with the wailings of children, whose fathers have not returned. Eleven warriors lie hid from the graves of their tribes since the snows have melted, and none will tell where to find them when the tongue of Chingachgook shall be silent. Let them draw the sharpest knife, and whirl the swiftest tomahawk, for their bitterest enemy is in their hands. Uncas, topmost branch of a noble trunk, call on the cowards to hasten, or their hearts will soften, and they will change to women. They look among the fishes for their dead, returned the low, soft voice of the youthful chieftain. The Hurons float with the slimy eels. They drop from the oaks like fruit that is ready to be eaten, and the Delawares laugh. Ay, ay, muttered the scout, who had listened to this peculiar burst of the natives with deep attention. They have warmed their Indian feelings, and they'll soon provoke the Maquas to give them a speedy end. As for me, who am the whole blood of the whites, it is befitting that I should die as becomes my color. With no words of scoffing in my mouth, and without bitterness at the heart. "'Why die at all?' said Cora, advancing from the place where natural horror had until this moment held her riveted to the rock. "'The path is open on every side. Fly then to the woods, and call on God for succor. Go, brave men! We owe you too much already. Let us no longer involve you in our hapless fortunes. You know little of the craft of the Iroquois lady.' "'If you judge they have left the path open to the woods,' returned Hawkeye, "'who, however, immediately added in his simplicity, "'the downstream current, it is certain, "'might soon sweep us beyond the reach of their rifles, "'or the sound of their voices. "'Then try the river. "'Why linger to add to the number of the victims "'of our merciless enemies?' "'Why?' repeated the scout, looking about him proudly. Because it is better for a man to die at peace with himself than to live haunted by an evil conscience. What answer could we give Monroe when he asked us where and how we left his children? Go to him, and say that you left them with a message to hasten their aid, returned Cora, advancing nigher to the scout in her generous ardor. That the Hurons bear them into the northern wilds. But that by vigilance and speed they may be rescued, and if, after all, 
It should please heaven, in its assistance, come too late, bear to him. She continued, her voice gradually lowering, until it seemed nearly choked. The love, the blessings, the final prayers of his daughters. And bid him not mourn their early fate, but to look forward with humble confidence to the Christian's goal to meet his children. The hard, well-beaten features of the scout began to work, and when she had ended, he dropped his chin to his hand, like a man musing profoundly on the nature of the proposal. There is reason in her words, at length broke from his compressed and trembling lips. Aye, they bear the spirit of Christianity. What might be right and proper in a redskin may be sinful in a man who has not even a cross in blood to plead for his ignorance. Chinchgotchkuk! Uncas! Hear the talk of the dark-eyed woman! He now spoke in Delaware to his companions, and his address, though calm and deliberate, seemed very decided. The elder Mohican heard with deep gravity, and appeared to ponder on his words, as though he felt the importance of their import. After a moment of hesitation, he waved his hand in assent, and muttered the English word, Good, with the peculiar emphasis of his people. Then, replacing his knife and tomahawk in his girdle, the warrior moved silently to the edge of the rock, which was most concealed from the banks of the river. Here he paused a moment, pointed significantly to the woods below, and sang a few words in his own language, as if indicating his intended route, he dropped into the water and sank from before the eyes of the witnesses of his movements. The scout delayed his departure to speak to the generous girl, whose breathing became lighter as she saw the success of her remonstrance. Wisdom is sometimes given to the young as well as the old, he said, and what you have spoken is wise, not to call it by a better word, if you are led into the woods, that is, such of you as may be spared for a while, break the twigs on the bushes as you pass, and make the marks of your trail as broad as you can, when, if mortal eyes can see them, depend on having a friend who will follow to the ends of the earth before he deserts you. He gave Cora an affectionate shake of the hand, lifted his rifle, and after regarding it a moment, with melancholy solicitude, laid it carefully aside, and descended to the place where Chingachgook had just disappeared. For an instant he hung, suspended by the rock, and looking about him with a countenance of peculiar care, he added bitterly, Had the powder held out, this disgrace could never have befallen. Then, losing his hold, the water closed over his head, and he also became lost to view. All eyes now were turned on Uncas, who stood leaning against the ragged rock in immovable composure. After waiting a short time, Cora pointed down the river and said, Your friends have not been seen, and are now most probably in safety. Is it not time for you to follow? Uncas will stay, the young Mohican calmly answered in English. To increase the horror of our capture, and diminish the chances of our release? Go, generous young man, Cora continued, lowering her eyes under the gaze of the Mohican, and perhaps with an intuitive consciousness of her power. Go to my father, as I have said, and be the most confidential of my messengers. Tell him to trust you with the means to buy the freedom of his daughters. Go! "'Tis my wish, tis my prayer that you will go!' The settled, calm look of the young chief changed to an expression of gloom, but he no longer hesitated. With a noiseless step he crossed the rock and dropped into the troubled stream. Hardly a breath was drawn by those left behind, until they caught a glimpse of his head emerging for air far down the current, when he again sank and was seen no more. 
these sudden and apparently successful experiments had all taken place in a few minutes of that time which had now become so precious. After a last look at Uncas, Cora turned and with a quivering lip addressed herself to Hayward. "'I have heard you boasted skill in the water too, Duncan,' she said. "'Follow, then, the wise example set you by these simple and faithful beings.' "'Is such the faith that Cora Monroe would extract from her protector?' said the young man, smiling mournfully, but with bitterness. "'This is not a time for idle subtleties and false opinions,' she answered. "'But a moment when every duty should be equally considered. "'To us you can be of no further service here. "'But your precious life may be saved for other and nearer friends.' "'He made no reply.' though his eye fell wistfully on the beautiful form of Alice, who was clinging to his arm with the dependency of an infant. Consider, continued Cora, after a pause, during which she seemed to struggle with a pang even more acute than any that her fears had excited, that the worst to us can be but death, a tribute that all must pay for the good time of God's appointment. "'There are evils worse than death,' said Duncan, speaking hoarsely, and as if fretful at her importunity, "'but which the presence of one who would die in your behalf may avert.' Cora ceased her entreaties, and, veiling her face in her shawl, drew the nearly insensible Alice after her into the deepest recess of the inner cavern. End of chapter 8 This reading by Gary W. Sherwin of Yukon, Pennsylvania, in the summer of 2007. Chapter 9 of The Last of the Mohicans, a narrative of 1757 by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 9 Quote, Be gay securely, dispel my faith with smiles the timorous clouds that hang on my clear brow. Unquote. From Death of Agrippina The sudden and almost magical change from the stirring incidents of the combat to the stillness that now reigned around him acted on the heated imagination of Hayward like some exciting dream, while all the images and events he had witnessed remained deeply impressed on his memory, he felt a difficulty in persuading him of their truth. Still ignorant of the fate of those who had trusted to the aid of the swift current, he at first listened intently to any signal or sounds of alarm which might announce the good or evil fortune of their hazardous undertaking. His attention, however, was bestowed in vain, for with the disappearance of Uncas, every sign of the adventurers had been lost, leaving him in total uncertainty of their fate. In a moment of such painful doubt, Duncan did not hesitate to look around him, without consulting that protection from the rocks, which just before had been so necessary to his safety. Every effort, however, to detect the least evidence of the approach of their hidden enemies, was as fruitless as the inquiry after his late companions. The wooded banks of the river seemed again deserted by everything possessing animal life. The uproar which had so lately echoed through the vaults of the forest was gone, leaving the rush of the waters to swell and sink on the currents of the air in the unmingled sweetness of nature. A fish hawk, which secure on the topmost branches of a dead pine, had been a distant spectator of the fray, now swooped from his high and ragged perch and soared in wide sweeps above his prey, while a jay, whose noisy voice had been stilled by the hoarser cries of the savages, ventured again to open his discordant throat, as though once more in undisturbed possession of his wild domains. Duncan caught from these natural accompaniments of the solitary scene a glimmering of hope, and he began to rally his facilities to renewed exertions, with something like a reviving confidence of success. 
the Hurons are not to be seen, he said, addressing David, who had by no means recovered from the effects of the stunning blow he had received. Let us conceal ourselves in the cavern, and trust the rest to Providence. I remember to have united with two comely maidens in lifting up our voices in praise and thanksgiving, returned the bewildered singing master. Since which time I have been visited by a heavy judgment for my sins. I have been mocked with the likeness of sleep, while sounds of discord have rent my ears, such as might manifest the fullness of time, and that nature had forgotten her harmony. Poor fellow! Thine own period was, in truth, near its accomplishment. But arouse, and come with me. I will lead you where all other sounds but those from your own psalmody shall be excluded. There is melody in the fall of the cataract, and the rushing of many waters is sweet to the senses, said David, pressing his hand confusedly on his brow. Is not the air yet filled with shrieks and cries, as though the departed spirits of the damned? Not now, not now, interrupted the impatient Hayward. They have ceased, and they who raised them, I trust in God. They are gone too. Everything but the water is still and at peace in them, where you may create those sounds you love so well to hear. David smiled sadly, though not without a momentary gleam of pleasure at this allusion to his beloved vocation. He no longer hesitated to be led to a spot which promised such unalloyed gratification to his wearied senses, and leaning on the arm of his companion, he entered the narrow mouth of the cave. Duncan seized a pile of sassafras, which he drew before the passage, studiously concealing every appearance of an aperture. Within this fragile barrier, he arranged the blankets abandoned by the foresters, darking the inner extremity of the cavern, while its outer received a chastened light from the narrow ravine, through which one arm of the river rushed to form the junction with its sister branch, a few rods below. I like not the principle of the natives, which teaches them to submit without a struggle, in emergencies that appear desperate, he said, while busied in his employment. Our own maxim which says, while life remains there is hope, is more consoling and better suited to a soldier's temperament. To you, Cora, I will urge no words of idle encouragement. Your own fortitude and undisturbed reason will teach you all that may become your sex. But cannot we dry the tears of that trembling weeper on your bosom? I am calmer, Duncan, said Alice, raising herself from the arms of her sister, and forcing an appearance of composure through her tears. Much calmer now. Surely, in this hidden spot, we are safe, we are secret, free from injury. We will hope everything from those generous men who have risked so much already in our behalf. Now does our gentle Alice speak like the daughter of Monroe, said Hayward, pausing to press her hand as he passed toward the outer entrance of the cavern. With two such examples of courage before him, a man would be ashamed to prove other than a hero. He then seated himself in the center of the cavern, grasping his remaining pistol with a hand convulsively clenched while his contracted and frowning eye announced the sullen desperation of his purpose. The Hurons, if they come, may not gain our position so easily as they think, he slowly muttered, and propping his head back against the rock, he seemed to await the result in patience, though his gaze was unceasingly bent on the open avenue to their place of retreat. With the last sound of his voice, a deep, a long, and almost breathless silence succeeded. The fresh air of the morning had penetrated the recess, and its influence was gradually felt on the spirits of its inmates. As minute after minute passed by, leaving them in undisturbed security, the insinuating feeling of hope was gradually gaining possession of every bosom, though each one felt reluctant to give utterance to expectations that the next moment might so fearfully destroy. David alone formed an exception to these varying emotions. A gleam of light from the opening crossed his wan countenance and fell upon the pages of the little volume, 
whose leaves he was again occupied in turning, as if searching for some song more fitted to their condition than any that had yet met their eye. He was most probably acting all this time under a confused recollection of the promised consolation of Duncan. At length, it would seem, his patient industry found its reward, for, without explanation or apology, he pronounced aloud the words, Isle of White, drew a long sweet sound from his pitch-pipe, and then ran through the preliminary modulations of the air, whose name he had just mentioned, with the sweeter tones of his own musical voice. May this not prove dangerous? asked Cora, glancing her dark eye at Major Hayward. Poor fellow! His voice is too feeble to be heard above the din of the falls, was the answer. Beside, the cavern will prove his friend. Let him indulge his passions, since it may be done without hazard. Isle of Wight, repeated David, looking about him with that dignity with which he had long been wont to silence the whispering echoes of his skull. "'Tis a brave tune, and set to solemn words. Let it be sung with meet respect. After allowing a moment of stillness to enforce his discipline, the voice of the singer was heard in low, murmuring syllables, gradually stealing on the ear, until it filled the narrow vault with sounds rendered trebly thrilling by the feeble and tremulous utterance produced by his debility. The melody, which no weakness could destroy, gradually wrought its sweet influence on the senses of those who heard it. It even prevailed over the miserable travesty of the song of David, which the singer had selected from a volume of similar effusions, and caused the sense to be forgotten in the insinuating harmony of the sounds. Alice unconsciously dried her tears and bent her melting eyes on the pallid features of Gamut, with an expression of chastened delight that she neither affected nor wished to conceal. Cora bestowed an approving smile on the pious efforts of the namesake of the Jewish prince, and Hayward soon turned his steady stern look from the outlet of the cavern to fasten it with a milder character on the face of David, or to meet the wandering beams which at moments strayed from the humid eyes of Alice. The open sympathy of the listeners stirred the spirit of the votary of music, whose voice regained its richness and volume, without losing that touching softness which proved its secret charm. Exerting his renovated powers to their utmost, he was yet filling the arches of the cave with long and full tones, when a yell burst into the air without that instantly stilled his pious strains, choking his voice suddenly as though his heart had literally bounded into the passage of his throat. "'We are lost!' exclaimed Alice, throwing herself into the arms of Cora. "'No, not yet,' returned the agitated but undaunted Hayward. "'The sound came from the center of the island, and it has been produced by the sight of their dead companions. We are not yet discovered, and there is still hope.' Faint and almost despairing as was the prospect of escape, the words of Duncan were not thrown away, for it awakened the powers of the sisters in such a manner that they awaited the results in silence. A second yell soon followed the first. Then a rush of voices was heard pouring down the island from its upper to its lower extremity, until they reached the naked rock above the caverns, where, after a shout of savage triumph, the air continued full of horrible cries and screams, such as man alone can utter, and he only went in a state of the fiercest barbarity. The sounds quickly spread around them in every direction. Some called to their fellows from the water's edge and were answered from the heights above. Cries were heard in the startling vicinity of the chasm between the two caves, which mingled with hoarser yells that arose out of the abyss of the deep ravine. In short, so rapidly had the savage sounds diffused themselves over the barren rock that it was not difficult for the anxious listeners to imagine they could be heard beneath, as in truth they were above on every side of them. In the midst of this tumult, a triumphant yell was raised within a few yards of the hidden entrance to the cave. Hayward abandoned every hope with the belief it was the signal that they were discovered. Again, the impression passed away, as he heard the voices collect near the spot 
where the white man had so reluctantly abandoned his rifle. Amid the jargon of Indian dialects that he now plainly heard, it was easy to distinguish not only words, but sentences, in the patois of the Canadas. A burst of voices had shouted simultaneously, La Long Carabine! causing the opposite woods to re-echo with the name which Hayward well remembered, had been given by his enemies to a celebrated hunter and scout of the English camp, and who he now learned for the first time had been his late companion. La Long Carabine! La Long Carabine! passed from mouth to mouth, until the whole band appeared to be collected around a trophy which would seem to announce the death of its formidable owner. After a vociferous consultation, which was at time deafened by burst of savage joy, they again separated, filling the air with the name of a foe, whose body Haywood could collect from their expressions they hoped to find concealed in some crevice of the island. Now, he whispered to the trembling sisters, now is the moment of uncertainty. If our place of retreat escape this scrutiny, we are still safe. In every event, we are assured by what has fallen from our enemies that our friends have escaped, and in two short hours we may look for succor from Webb. There were now a few minutes of fearful stillness, during which Hayward well knew that the savages conducted their search with greater vigilance and method. More than once he could distinguish their footsteps as they brushed the sassafras, causing the faded leaves to rustle and the branches to snap. At length the pile yielded a little, a corner of a blanket fell, and a faint ray of light gleamed into the inner part of the cave. Cora folded Alice to her bosom in agony, and Duncan sprang to his feet. A shout was at that moment heard as if issuing from the center of the rock, announcing that the neighboring cavern had at length been entered. In a minute the number and loudness of the voices indicated that the whole party was collected in and around that secret place. As the inner passages of the two caves were so close to each other, Duncan, believing that escape was no longer possible, passed David and the sisters to place himself between the latter and the first onset of the terrible meeting. Grown desperate by his situation, he drew nigh the slight barrier which separated him only a few feet from his relentless pursuers, and placing his face to the casual opening, he even looked out with a sort of desperate indifference on their movements. Within reach of his arm was the brawny shoulder of a gigantic Indian, whose deep and authoritative voice appeared to give directions to the proceedings of his fellows. Beyond him again, Duncan could look into the vault opposite, which was filled with savages, upturning and rifling the humble furniture of the scout. The wound of David had dyed the leaves of sassafras with a color that the native knew well as anticipating the season. Over this sign of their success, they sent up a howl, like an opening from so many hounds who had recovered a lost trail. After this yellow victory, they tore up the fragrant bed of the cavern and bore the branches into the chasm scattering the boughs as if they suspected them of concealing the person of the man they had so long hated and feared. One fierce and wild-looking warrior approached the chief, bearing a load of the brush, and pointing exultingly to the deep red stains with which it was sprinkled, uttered his joy in Indian yells, whose meaning Hayward was only enabled to comprehend by the frequent repetition of the name, La Long Carabine. When his triumph had ceased, he cast the brush onto the slight heap Duncan had made before the entrance of the second cavern, and closed the view. His example was followed by others, who, as they drew the branches from the cave of the scout, threw them into one pile, adding, unconsciously, to the security of those they sought. The very slightness of the defense was its chief merit, for no one thought of disturbing a mass of brush which all of them believed, in that moment of hurry and confusion, had been accidentally raised by the hands of their own party. As the blankets yielded before the outward pressure, and the branches settled in the fissure of the rock by their own weight, forming a compact body, Duncan once more breathed freely. With a light step and a lighter heart, he returned to the center of the cave, 
and took the place he had left, where he could command a view of the opening next the river. While he was in the act of making this movement, the Indians, as if changing their purpose by a common impulse, broke away from the chasm in a body, and were heard rushing up the island again toward the point whence they had originally descended. Here another wailing cry betrayed that they were again collected around the bodies of their dead comrades. Duncan now ventured to look at his companions, for, during most of the critical moments of their danger, he had been apprehensive that the anxiety of his countenance might communicate some additional alarm to those who were so little able to sustain it. They are gone, Cora, he whispered. Alice, they are returned whence they came, and we are saved. To heaven that has alone delivered us from the grasp of so merciless an enemy, be all praise. Then to heaven I will return my thanks exclaimed the younger sister, rising from the encircling arm of Cora, and casting herself with enthusiastic gratitude on the naked rock. To that heaven which had spared the tears of a gray-headed father has saved the lives of those I so much love. Both Hayward and the more temperate Cora witnessed the act of involuntary emotion with powerful sympathy. The former, secretly believing that piety had never worn a form so lovely as it had now assumed in the youthful person of Alice. Her eyes were radiant with the glow of grateful feelings. The flush of her beauty was again seated on her cheeks, and her whole soul seemed ready and anxious to pour out its thanksgiving through the medium of her eloquent features. But when her lips moved, the words they should have uttered appeared frozen by some new and sudden chill. Her bloom gave place to the paleness of death. Her soft and melting eyes grew hard, and seemed contracting with horror, while those hands, which she had raised, clasped in each other toward heaven, dropped in horizontal lines before her, the fingers pointed forward in convulsed motion. Hayward turned the instant she gave a direction to his suspicions, and peering just above the ledge which formed the threshold of the open outlet of the cavern, he beheld the malignant, fierce, and savage features of Lurinard Subtil. In that moment of surprise, the self-possession of Hayward did not desert him. He observed by the vacant expression of the Indian's countenance that his eye, accustomed to the open air, had not yet been able to penetrate the dusky light which pervaded the depth of the cavern. He had even thought of retreating beyond a curvature in the natural wall, which might still conceal him and his companions, when by the sudden gleam of intelligence that shot across the features of the savage, he saw it was too late, and that they were betrayed. The look of exaltation and brutal triumph which announced this terrible truth was irresistibly irritating. Forgetful of everything but the impulses of his hot blood, Duncan leveled his pistol and fired. The report of the weapon made the cavern below like an eruption from a volcano, and when the smoke it vomited had been driven away before the current of air which issued from the ravine, the place so lately occupied by the features of his treacherous guide was vacant. Rushing to the outlet, Hayward caught a glimpse of his dark figure stealing around a low and narrow ledge, which soon hid him entirely from sight. Among the savages, a frightful stillness succeeded the explosion, which had just been heard bursting from the bowels of the rock. But when Le Renard raised his voice in the long and intelligible hoop, it was answered by a spontaneous yell from the mouth of every Indian within hearing of the sound. The clamorous noises again rushed down the island, and before Duncan had time to recover from the shock, his feeble barrier of brush was scattered to the winds. The cavern was entered at both its extremities, and he and his companions were dragged from their shelter and borne into the day, where they stood surrounded by the whole band of the triumphant Hurons. End of chapter 9 This reading by Gary W. Sherwin of Yukon, Pennsylvania, in the summer of 2007
The Last of the Mohicans, a narrative of 1757 by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 10 Quote, I fear we shall outsleep the coming morn, as much as we this night have overwatched. Unquote. From Midsummer Night's Dream The instant the shock of this sudden misfortune had abated, Duncan began to make his observations on the appearance and proceedings of their captors. Contrary to the usages of the natives in the wantonness of their success, they had respected not only the persons of the trembling sisters, but his own. The rich ornaments of his military attire had indeed been repeatedly handled by different individuals of the tribes, with eyes expressing a savage longing to possess the baubles. But, before the customary violence could be resorted to, a mandate in the authoritative voice of the large warrior, already mentioned, stayed the uplifted hand, and convinced Hayward that they were to be reserved for some object of particular moment. While, however, these manifestations of weakness were exhibited by the young and vain of the party, the more experienced warriors continued their search throughout both caverns, with an activity that denoted they were far from being satisfied with those fruits of their conquest which had already been brought to light. Unable to discover any new victim, these diligent workers of vengeance soon approached their male prisoners pronouncing the name La Long Carabine with a fierceness that could not be easily mistaken. Duncan affected not to comprehend the meaning of the repeated and violent interrogatories, while his companion was spared the effort of a similar deception by his ignorance of French. Wearied at length by their importunities, and apprehensive of irritating his captors by too stubborn a silence, the former looked about him in quest of Maqua, who might interpret his answers to questions, which were at each moment becoming more earnest and threatening. The conduct of this savage had formed a solitary exception to that of his fellows, while the others were busily occupied in seeking to gratify their childish passion for finery, by plundering even the miserable effects of the scout, or had been searching with such bloodthirsty vengeance in their looks for their absent owner. Le Renard had stood at a little distance from the prisoners, with a demeanor so quiet and satisfied as to betray that he had already effected the grand purpose of his treachery. When the eyes of Hayward first met those of his recent guide, he turned them away in horror at the sinister, though calm, look he encountered. Conquering his disgust, however, he was able, with an averted face, to address his successful enemy. Le Renaud Subtil is too much of a warrior, said the reluctant Hayward, to refuse telling an unarmed man what his conquerors say. They ask for the hunter, who knows the path through the woods returned Maqua, in his broken English, laying his hand at the same time, with a ferocious smile, on the bundle of leaves with which a wound on his shoulder was bandaged. La Long Carabine! His rifle is good, and his eye never shut. But like the short gun of the white chief, it is nothing against the life of Le Subtil. Le Renard, is too brave to remember the hurts received in war, or the hands that gave them. Was it war when the tired Indian rested at the sugar tree to taste his corn? Who filled the bushes with creeping enemies? Who drew the knife whose tongue was at peace while his heart was colored with blood? Did Maqua say that the hatchet was out of the ground and that his hand had dug it up? as Duncan dared not retort upon his accuser by reminding him of his own premeditated treachery, and disdained to deprecate his resentment by any words of apology, he remained silent. 
Makwa seemed also content to rest the controversy as well, as all further communication there, for he resumed the leaning attitude against the rock from which, in momentary energy, he had arisen. But the cry of, Le Long Carabine, was renewed the instant the impatient savages perceived that the short dialogue was ended. You hear, said Makwa with stubborn indifference, the Red Hurons call for the life of the Long Rifle, or they will have the blood of him that kept him hid. He is gone, escaped. He is far beyond their reach. Renard smiled with cold contempt as he answered. When the white man dies, he thinks he is at peace. But the red men know how to torture even the ghost of their enemies. Where is his body? Let the Huron see his scalp. He is not dead, but escaped. Marqua shook his head incredulously. Is he a bird to spread his wings, or is he a fish to swim without air? The white chief read in his books, and he believes the Hurons are fools. Though no fish, the long rifle can swim. He floated down the stream when the powder was all burned, and when the eyes of the Hurons were behind a cloud. And why did the white chief stay? demanded the incredulous Indian. Is he a stone that goes to the bottom, or does the scalp burn his head? That I am not stone, your dead comrade who fell into the falls might answer, were there still life in him, said the provoked young man, using in his anger that boastful language which was most likely to excite the admiration of an Indian. The white man thinks none but cowards desert their women. Mokwa muttered a few words inaudibly between his teeth, before he continued aloud. Can the Delaware swim, too, as well as crawl in the bushes? Where is Le Gros Serpent? Duncan, who perceived by the use of these Canadian appellations that his late companions were much better known to his enemies than to himself, answered reluctantly, He also is gone down with the water. Le Serfagil is not here. I know not whom you call the nimble deer, said Duncan gladly, profiting by any excuse to create delay. Uncas, returned Maqua, pronouncing the Delaware name with even greater difficulty than he spoke his English words. Bounding elk is what the white man says when he calls to the young Mohican. Here is some confusion in names between us, Le Renard, said Duncan, hoping to provoke a discussion. Dame is the French for deer, and surf for stag. Elon is the true term when one would speak of an elk. Yes, muttered the Indian in his native tongue. The pale faces are prattling women. They have two words for each thing, while a redskin will make the sound of his voice speak to him. Then, changing his language, he continued, adhering to the imperfect nomenclature of his provincial instructors. The deer is swift but weak. The elk is swift but strong. And the son of Le Serpent is Le Serf Hadjil. Has he leaped the river to the woods? If you mean the younger Delaware... He, too, has gone down with the water. As there was nothing improbable to an Indian in the manner of the escape, Maqua admitted the truth of what he had heard, with a readiness that afforded additional evidence how little he would prize such worthless captives. With his companions, however, the feeling was manifestly different. The Hurons had awaited the result of this short dialogue, with characteristic patience, and with a silence that increased until there was a general stillness in the band. When Hayward ceased to speak, they turned their eyes as one man on Maqua, demanding in this expressive manner an explanation of what had been said. Their interpreter 
pointed to the river, and made them acquainted with the result, as much by the action as by the few words he uttered. When the fact was generally understood, the savages raised a frightful yell, which declared the extent of their disappointment. Some ran furiously to the water's edge, beating the air with frantic gestures, while others spat upon the element to resent the supposed treason it had committed against their acknowledged rights as conquerors. A few, and they not the least powerful and terrific of the band, threw lowering looks in which the fiercest passion was only tempered by habitual self-command at those captives who still remained in their power while one or two even gave vent to their malignant feelings by the most menacing gestures against which neither the sex nor the beauty of the sisters was any protection. The young soldier made a desperate but fruitless effort to spring to the side of Alice, when he saw the dark hand of a savage twisted in the rich tresses, which were flowing in volumes over her shoulders, while a knife was passed around the head from which they fell, as if to denote the horrid manner in which it was about to be robbed of its beautiful ornament. But his hands were bound, and at the first movement he made, he felt the grasp of the powerful Indian who directed the band, pressing his shoulder like a vice. Immediately conscious how unavailing any struggle against such overwhelming force must prove, he submitted to his fate. Encouraging his gentle companions, by a few low and tender assurances, that the natives seldom failed to threaten more than they performed. But while Duncan resorted to these words of consolation to quiet the apprehensions of the sisters, he was not so weak as to deceive himself. He well knew that the authority of an Indian chief was so little conventional that it was oftener maintained by physical superiority than by any moral supremacy he might possess. The danger was, therefore, magnified exactly in proportion to the number of savage spirits by which they were surrounded. The most positive mandate from him who seemed the acknowledged leader was liable to be violated at each moment by any rash hand that might choose to sacrifice a victim to the manes of some dead friend or relative. While, therefore, he sustained an outward appearance of calmness and fortitude, his heart leaped into his throat whenever any of their fierce captors drew nearer than common to the helpless sisters, or fastened one of their sullen, wondering looks on those fragile forms, which were so little able to resist the slightest assault. His apprehensions were, however, greatly relieved, when he saw that the leader had summoned his warriors to himself in council. Their deliberations were short, and it would seem, by the silence of most of the party, the decision unanimous. By the frequency with which the few speakers pointed in the direction of the encampment of Webb, it was apparent they dreaded the approach of danger from that quarter. This consideration probably hastened their determination, and quickened the subsequent movements. During his short conference, Hayward, finding a respite from his gravest fears, had leisure to admire the cautious manner in which the Hurons had made their approaches, even after hostilities had ceased. It has already been stated that the upper half of the island was a naked rock, and destitute of any other defenses than a few scattered logs of driftwood. They had selected this point to make their descent, having borne the canoe through the wood around the cataract for that purpose. Placing their arms in the little vessel, a dozen men, clinging to its sides, had trusted themselves to the direction of the canoe, which was controlled by two of the most skillful warriors, in attitudes that enabled them to command a view of the dangerous passage. Favored by this arrangement, they touched the head of the island at that point which had proved so fatal to their first adventures, but with the advantages of superior numbers and the possession of firearms. That such had been the manner of their descent was rendered quite apparent to Duncan, 
for they now bore the light bark from the upper end of the rock, and placed it in the water near the mouth of the outer cavern. As soon as this change was made, the leader made signs to the prisoners to descend and enter. As resistance was impossible, and remonstrance useless, Hayward set the example of submission, by leading the way into the canoe, where he was soon seated with the sisters and the still wandering David. Notwithstanding the Hurons were necessarily ignorant of the little channels among the eddies and rapids of the streams, they knew the common signs of such a navigation too well to commit any material blunder. When the pilot chosen for the task of guiding the canoe had taken his station, the whole band plunged again into the river. The vessel glided down the current, and in a few moments the captives found themselves on the south bank of the stream, nearly opposite to the point where they had struck it the preceding evening. Here was held another short but earnest consultation, during which the horses, to whose panic their owners ascribed their heaviest misfortune, were led from the cover of the woods and brought to the sheltered spot. The band now divided, the great chief, so often mentioned, mounting the charger of Hayward, led the way directly across the river, followed by most of his people, and disappeared in the woods, leaving the prisoners in charge of six savages, at whose head was Le Renard Subtil. Duncan witnessed all their movements with renewed uneasiness. He had been fond of believing, from the uncommon forbearance of the savages, that he was reserved as a prisoner to be delivered to Montcalm, as the thoughts of those who were in misery seldom slumber, and the invention is never more likely than when it is stimulated by hope, however feeble and remote. He had even imagined that the parental feelings of Monroe were to be made instrumental in seducing him from his duty to the king. For, though the French commander bore a high character for courage and enterprise, he was also thought to be an expert in those political practices, which do not always respect the nicer obligations of morality, and which so generally disgraced the European diplomacy of that period. All those busy and ingenious speculations were now annihilated by the conduct of his captors. That portion of the band who had followed the huge warrior took the route toward the foot of the Horican, and no other expectation was left for himself and companions than that they were to be retained as hopeless captives by their savage conquerors. Anxious to know the worst, and willing, in such an emergency, to try the potency of gold, he overcame his reluctance to speak to Maqua, addressing himself to his former guide, who had now assumed the authority and manner of one who was to direct the future movements of the party. He said in tones as friendly and confiding as he could assume, I would speak to Maqua what is fit only for so great a chief to hear. The Indian turned his eyes on the young soldier scornfully as he answered, Speak. Trees have no ears, but the red Hurons are not deaf, and counsel that is fit for the great men of a nation would make the young warriors drunk. If Maqua will not listen, the officer of the king knows how to be silent. The savage spoke carelessly to his comrades, who were busied after their awkward manner in preparing the horses for the reception of the sisters, and moved a little to one side, whither by a cautious gesture he induced Hayward to follow. Now speak, he said, if the words are such as Maqua should hear. Le Renaud Subtil has proved himself worthy of the honorable name given to him by his Canada fathers, commenced Hayward. I see his wisdom, and all that he has done for us, and shall remember it when the hour to reward him arrives. Yes, Renard has proved that he is not only a great chief in council, but one who knows how to deceive his enemies. What has Renard done? 
coldly demanded the Indian. What? Has he not seen that the woods were filled with outlying parties of the enemies, and that the serpent could not steal through them without being seen? Then did he not lose his path to blind the eyes of the Hurons? Did he not pretend to go back to his tribe who had treated him ill, and driven him from their wigwams like a dog? And when he saw what he wished to do, did we not aid him by making a false face, that the Hurons might think the white man believed that his friend was his enemy? Is not all this true? And when Le Subtil had shut the eyes and stopped the ears of his nation by his wisdom, did they not forget that they had once done him wrong, and forced him to flee to the Mohawks? And did they not leave him on the south of the river with their prisoners, while they have gone foolishly to the north? Does not Renard mean to turn like a fox on his footsteps, and carry to the rich and grey-headed Scotchman his daughters? Yes, Maqua. I see it all, and I have already been thinking how so much wisdom and honesty should be repaid. First, the chief of William Henry will give as great chief should for such a service. The medal of Maqua will no longer be of tin. Footnote. It has long been a practice of the whites to conciliate the important men of the Indians by presenting medals which were worn in the place of their own rude ornaments. Those given by the English generally bear the impression of the reigning king, and those given by the Americans that of the president. End footnote. But of beaten gold. His horn will run over with powder. Dollars will be as plenty in his pouch as pebbles on the shore of Horican, and the deer will lick his hand for they will know it to be vain to fly from the rifle he will carry. As for myself, I know not how to exceed the gratitude of the Scotchman, but I, yes, I will. What will the young chief who comes from toward the sun give? demanded the Huron. Observing that Hayward hesitated in his desire to end the enumeration of benefits, with that, which might form the climax of an Indian's wishes. He will make the firewater from the islands in the Salt Lake flow before the wigwam of Maqua, until the heart of the Indian shall be lighter than the feathers of the hummingbird, and his breath sweeter than wild honeysuckle. Le Renard had listened gravely as Hayward slowly proceeded in this subtle speech. When the young man mentioned the artifice, he supposed the Indian to have practiced on his own nation. The countenance of the listener was veiled in an expression of cautious gravity. At the allusion to the injury which Duncan affected to believe had driven the Huron from his native tribe, a gleam of such ungovernable ferocity flashed from the other's eyes, as induced the adventurous speaker to believe he had struck the proper chord. And by the time he reached the part where he so artfully blended the thirst of vengeance with the desire of gain, he had at least obtained a command of the deepest attention of the savage. The question put by Le Renard had been calm, and with all the dignity of an Indian, but it was quite apparent by the thoughtful expression of the listener's countenance that the answer was most cunningly devised. The Huron mused a few moments, and then laying his hand on the rude bandages of his wounded shoulder, he said, with some energy, Do friends make such marks? Would La Longue Carbine cut one so slight on an enemy? Do the Delawares crawl upon those they love like snakes, twisting themselves to strike? Would Le Gros Serpent have been heard by the ears of one he wished to be deaf? Does the white chief burn his powder in the faces of his brothers? Does he ever miss his aim, when seriously bent to kill? Returned Duncan, smiling with well-acted sincerity. Another long and deliberate pause succeeded these sententious questions and ready replies. 
Duncan saw that the Indian hesitated. In order to complete his victory, he was in the act of recommencing the enumeration of the rewards, when Maqua made an expressive gesture and said, Enough! Le Renard is a wise chief, and what he does will be seen. Go and keep the mouth shut. When Maqua speaks, it will be the time to answer. Hayward, perceiving that the eyes of his companion were warily fastened on the rest of the band, fell back immediately, in order to avoid the appearance of any suspicious confederacy with their leader. Maqua approached the horses, and affected to be well pleased with the diligence and ingenuity of his comrades. He then signed to Hayward to assist the sisters into the saddles, for he seldom deigned to use the English tongue, unless urged by some motive of more than usual moment. There was no longer any plausible pretext for delay, and Duncan was obliged, however reluctantly, to comply. As he performed this office, he whispered his reviving hopes in the ears of the trembling females, who through dread of encountering the savage countenances of their captors, seldom raised their eyes from the ground. The mayor of David had been taken with the followers of the large chief. In consequence, its owner, as well as Duncan, was compelled to journey on foot. The latter did not, however, so much regret this circumstance as it might enable him to retard the speed of the party, for he still turned his longing looks in the direction of Fort Edward, in the vain expectation of catching some sound from that quarter of the forest which might denote the approach of succor. When all were prepared, Maqua made the signal to proceed, advancing in front to lead the party in person. Next followed David, who was gradually coming to a true sense of his condition as the effects of the wound became less and less apparent. The sisters rode in his rear, with Hayward at their side, while the Indians flanked the party and brought up the close of the march, with a caution that seemed never to tire. In this manner they proceeded in uninterrupted silence, except when Hayward expressed some solitary word of comfort to the females or David gave vent to the moanings of his spirit in piteous exclamations, which he intended should express the humility of resignation. Their direction lay toward the south, and in a course nearly opposite to the road to William Henry. Notwithstanding this apparent adherence in Maqua to the original determination of his conquerors, Hayward could not believe his tempting bait was so soon forgotten and he knew the windings of an Indian's path too well to suppose that its apparent course led directly to its object, when artifice was at all necessary. Mile after mile was, however, passed through the boundless woods, in this painful manner, without any prospect of a termination of their journey. Hayward watched the sun as he darted his meridian rays through the branches of the trees and pined for the moment when the policy of Maqua should change their route to one more favorable to his hopes. Sometimes he fancied the weary savage, despairing of passing the army of Montcalm in safety, was holding his way toward a well-known border settlement, where a distinguished officer of the crown and a favored friend of the Six Nations held his large possessions as well as his usual residence. To be delivered into the hands of Sir William Johnson was far preferable to being led into the wilds of Canada, but in order to effect even the former it would be necessary to traverse the forest for many weary leagues, each step of which was carrying him further from the scene of the war, and consequently from the post not only of honor, but of duty. Cora alone remembered the parting injunctions of the scout, and whenever an opportunity offered, she stretched forth her arm to bend aside the twigs that met her hands. But the vigilance of the Indians rendered this act of precaution both difficult and dangerous. She was often defeated in her purpose by encountering their watchful eyes, 
when it became necessary to feign an alarm she did not feel, and occupy the limb by some gesture of feminine apprehension. Once, and once only, was she completely successful when she broke down the bow of a large sumac, and by a sudden thought let her glove fall at the same instant. This sign, intended for those that might follow, was observed by one of her conductors, who restored the glove, broke the remaining branches of the bush in such a manner that it appeared to proceed from the struggling of some beast in its branches, and then laid his hand on his tomahawk, with a look so significant that it put an effectual end to those stolen memorials of their passage. As there were horses to leave the prints of their footsteps in both bands of the Indians, this interruption cut off any probable hopes of assistance being conveyed through the means of their trail. Hayward would have ventured a remonstrance had there been anything encouraging in the gloomy reserve of Maqua, but the savage, during all this time, seldom turned to look at his fellows, and never spoke. With the sun for his only guide, or aided by such blind marks as are only known to the sagacity of a native, he held his way along the barrens of pine, through occasional little fertile vales, across brooks and rivulets, and over undulating hills, with the accuracy of instinct, and nearly with the directness of a bird. He never seemed to hesitate. Whether the path was hardly distinguishable, whether it disappeared, or whether it lay beaten and plain before him made no sensible difference in his speed or certainty. It seemed as if fatigue could not affect him. Whenever the eyes of the wearied travelers rose from the decayed leaves over which they trod, his dark form was to be seen glancing among the stems of the trees in front. His head immovably fastened in a forward position, with the light plume on his crest fluttering in a current of air made solely by the swiftness of his own motion. But all his diligence and speed were not without an object. After crossing a low vale, through which a gushing brook meandered, he suddenly ascended a hill so steep and difficult of ascent that the sisters were compelled to alight in order to follow. When the summit was gained, they found themselves on a level spot, but thinly covered with trees, under one of which Maqua had thrown his dark form, as if willing and ready to seek that rest, which was so much needed by the whole party. End of Chapter 10 This reading by Gary W. Sherwin of Yukon, Pennsylvania, in the summer of 2007. Chapter 11 of The Last of the Mohicans, a narrative of 1757, by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 11 Quote Cursed be my tribe if I forgive him. Unquote. Shylock. The Indian had selected for this desirable purpose one of those steep pyramidal hills which bear a strong resemblance to artificial mounds and which so frequently occur in the valleys of America. The one in question was high and precipitous, its top flattened as usual, but with one of its sides more than ordinarily irregular. It possessed no other apparent advantage for a resting place than in its elevation and form, which might render defense easy and surprise nearly impossible. As Hayward, however, no longer expected that rescue which time and distance now rendered so improbable, he regarded these little peculiarities with an eye devoid of interest, devoting himself entirely to the comfort and condolence of his feebler companions. The Narragansetts were suffered to browse on the branches of the trees and shrubs that were thinly scattered over the summit of the hill, while the remains of the provisions were spread under the shade of a beech that stretched its horizontal limbs like a canopy above them. Notwithstanding the swiftness of their flight, 
one of the Indians had found an opportunity to strike a straggling fawn with an arrow, and had borne the more preferable fragments of the victim patiently on his shoulders to the stopping place. Without any aid from the science of cookery, he was immediately employed, in common with his fellows, in gorging himself with this digestible sustenance. Magua alone sat apart without participating in the revolting meal, and apparently buried in the deepest thought. This abstinence, so remarkable in an Indian, when he possessed the means of satisfying hunger, at length attracted the notice of Hayward. The young man willingly believed that the Huron deliberated on the most eligible manner of eluding the vigilance of his associates. With a view to assist his plans by any suggestion of his own, and to strengthen the temptation, he left the beach, and straggled, as if without an object, to the spot where Le Renard was seated. "'Has not Magua kept the sun in his face long enough to escape all danger from the Canadians?' he asked, as though no longer doubtful of the good intelligence established between them. "'And will not the chief of William Henry be better pleased to see his daughters before another knight may have hardened his heart to their loss, to make him less liberal in his reward?' Do the pale faces love their children less in the morning than at night? asked the Indian coldly. By no means, returned Hayward, anxious to recall his heir, if he had made one. The white man may, and does often, forget the burial place of his fathers. He sometimes ceases to remember those he should love, and is promised to cherish. But the affection of a parent for his child is never permitted to die. And is the heart of the white-headed chief soft? And will he think of the babes that his squaws have given him? He is hard on his warriors, and his eyes are made of stone. He is severe to the idle and wicked, but to the sober and deserving he is a leader, both just and humane. I have known many fond and tender parents, but never have I seen a man whose heart was softer toward his child. You have seen the gray head in front of his warriors, Makwa, but I have seen his eyes swimming in water when he spoke of those children who are now in your power. Hayward paused, for he knew not how to construe the remarkable expression that gleamed across the swarthy features of the attentive Indian. At first it seemed as if the remembrance of the promised reward grew vivid in his mind while he listened to the sources of parental feeling which were to assure its possession. But, as Duncan proceeded, the expression of joy became so fiercely malignant that it was impossible not to apprehend it proceeded from some passion more sinister than avarice. Go, said the Huron, suppressing the alarming exhibition in an instant, in a death-like calmness of countenance. Go to the dark-haired daughter and say, Mako wants to speak. The father will remember what the child promises. Duncan, who interpreted this speech to express a wish for some additional pledge that the promised gifts should not be withheld, slowly and reluctantly repaired to the place where the sisters were now resting from their fatigue, to communicate its purport to Cora. You understand the nature of an Indian's wishes, he concluded as he led her toward the place where she was expected, and must be prodigal of your offers of powder and blankets. Ardent spirits are, however, the most prized by such as he, nor would it be amiss to add some boon from your own hand, with that grace you so well know how to practice. Remember, Cora, that on your presence of mind and ingenuity, even your life, as well as that of Alice, may in some measure depend. Hayward, and yours! Mine is of little moment. It is already sold to my king, and is a prize to be seized by any enemy who may possess the power. I have no father to expect me, and but few friends to lament a fate which I have courted with the insatiable longings of youth after distinction. But hush! we approach the Indian. Makwa, 
The lady with whom you wish to speak is here. The Indian rose slowly from his seat and stood for near a minute silent and motionless. He then signed with his hand for Hayward to retire, saying coldly, When the Huron talks to the women, his tribe shut their ears. Duncan still lingering, as if refusing to comply. Cora said with a calm smile, You hear, Hayward? And delicacy, at least, should urge you to retire. Go to Alice, and comfort her with our reviving prospects. She waited until he had departed, and then, turning to the native, with a dignity of her sex in her voice and manner, she added, What would Le Renard say to the daughter of Monroe? Listen, said the Indian, laying his hand firmly upon her arm, as if willing to draw her utmost attention to his words, a movement that Cora as firmly but quietly repulsed by extricating the limb from his grasp. Maqua was born a chief and a warrior among the Red Hurons of the Lakes. He saw the sons of twenty summers make the snows of twenty winters run off in the streams before he saw a pale face, and he was happy. Then his Canadian fathers came into the woods and taught him to drink the fire water, and he became a rascal. The Hurons drove him from the graves of his fathers, as they would chase the hunted buffalo. He ran down the shores of the lakes, and followed their outlet to the city of Cannon. There he hunted and fished, till the people chased him again through the woods into the arms of his enemies. The chief, who was born a Huron, was at last a warrior among the Mohawks. Something like this I had heard before, said Cora, observing that he paused to suppress those passions which began to burn with too bright a flame, as he recalled the recollection of his supposed injuries. Was it the fault of Le Renard that his head was not made of rock? Who gave him the firewater? Who made him a villain? "'Twas the pale faces, the people of your own color. "'Am I answerable that thoughtless and unprincipled men exist, "'whose shades of countenance may resemble mine?' "'Cora calmly demanded of the excited savage. "'No. Maqua is a man and not a fool. "'Such as you never opened their lips to the burning stream. "'The Great Spirit has given you wisdom.' What, then, have I to do or say in the matter of your misfortunes, not to say of your errors? Listen, repeated the Indian, resuming his earnest attitude. When his English and French fathers dug up the hatchet, Le Renard struck the war-post of the Mohawks and went out against his own nation. The pale faces have driven the redskins from their hunting grounds. And now, when they fight, a white man leads the way. The old chief at Horican, your father, was the great captain of our war party. He said to the Mohawks, Do this and do that. And he was minded. He made a law that if an Indian swallowed the fire water and came into the cloth wigwams of his warriors, it should not be forgotten. Maqua foolish opened his mouth, and the hot liquor led him into the cabin of Monroe. What did the gray head let his daughter say? He forgot not his words and did justice. But punishing the offender, said the undaunted daughter. Justice, repeated the Indian, casting an oblique glance of the most ferocious expression at her unyielding countenance. Is it justice to make evil and then punish for it? Makwa was not himself. It was the firewater that spoke and acted for him. But Monroe did believe it. The Yaron chief was tied up before all the pale-faced warriors and whipped like a dog. Cora remained silent, for she knew not how to palliate this imprudent severity on the part of her father in a manner to suit the comprehension of an Indian. See, continued Maqua, 
tearing aside the slight calico that very imperfectly concealed his painted breast. Here are scars given by knives and bullets. Of these a warrior may boast before his nation. But the gray head has left marks on the back of the Huron chief that he must hide like a squaw under this painted cloth of the whites. I had thought, resumed Cora, that an Indian warrior was patient, and that his spirit felt not, and knew not the pain his body suffered. When the Chippewas tied Makwa to the stake and cut this gash, said the other, laying his finger on a deep scar, the Huron laughed in their faces and told them, Women struck so light. His spirit was then in the clouds. But when he felt the blows of Monroe, his spirit lay under the perch. The spirit of a Huron is never drunk. It remembers forever. But it may be appeased. If my father has done you this injustice, show him how an Indian can forgive an injury and take back his daughters. You have heard from Major Hayward. Mockwa shook his head, forbidding the repetition of offers he so much despised. What would you have? continued Cora, after a most painful pause, while the conviction forced itself on her mind that the too sanguine and generous Duncan had been cruelly deceived by the cunning savage. What a Huron loves! Good for good, bad for bad. You would then revenge the injury inflicted by Monroe on his helpless daughters? Would it not be more like a man to go before his face and take the satisfaction of a warrior? The arms of a pale face are long and their knives sharp, returned the savage with a malignant laugh. Why should Le Renard go among the muskets of his warriors when he holds the spirit of the gray head in his hand? Name your intention, Magua, said Cora, struggling with herself to speak with steady calmness. Is it to lead us prisoners to the woods, or do you contemplate some greater evil? Is there no reward, no means of palliating the injury? and of softening your heart? At least release my gentle sister, and pour out your malice on me. Purchase wealth by her safety, and satisfy your revenge with a single victim. The loss of both his daughters might bring the aged man to his grave, and where would then be the satisfaction of Le Renard? Lesson! said the Indian again. The light eyes go back to the horican and tell the old chief what has been done if the dark-haired woman will swear by the great spirit of her fathers to tell no lie. What must I promise? demanded Cora, still maintaining a secret ascendancy over the fierce native by the collected and feminine dignity of her presence. When Makwa left his people, his wife was given to another chief. He has now made friends with the Hurons, and will go back to the graves of his tribe on the shores of the Great Lake. Let the daughter of the English chief follow, and live in his wigwam forever. However revolting a proposal of such a character might prove to Cora, she retained, notwithstanding her powerful disgust, sufficient self-command to reply, without betraying the weakness. And what pleasure! would Makwa find in sharing his cabin with a wife he did not love, one who would be of a nation and color different from his own. It would be better to take the gold of Monroe and buy the heart of some Huron maid with his gifts. The Indian made no reply for near a minute but bent his fierce looks on the countenance of Cora in such wavering glances that her eye sank with shame under an impression that for the first time they had encountered an expression that no chaste female might endure. 
while she was shrinking within herself, in dread of having her ears wounded by some proposal still more shocking than the last, the voice of Maqua answered, in its tones of deepest malignancy, When the blows scorched the back of Huron, he would know where to find a woman to feel the smart. The daughter of Monroe would draw his water, hoe his corn, and cook his venison. The body of the gray head would sleep among his cannon, but his heart would lie within reach of the knife of Le Subtil. Monster! Well dost thou deserve thy treacherous name, cried Cora in an ungovernable burst of filial indignation. None but a fiend could mediate such a vengeance, but thou overratest thy power. You shall find it is, in truth, the heart of Monroe you hold, and that it will defy your utmost malice. The Indian answered this bold defiance by a ghastly smile that showed an unaltered purpose, while he motioned her away, as if to close the conference forever. Cora, already regretting her precipitation, was obliged to comply, for Maqua instantly left the spot, and approached his gluttonous comrades. Hayward flew to the side of the agitated female, and demanded the result of a dialogue that he had watched at a distance with so much interest. But unwilling to alarm the fears of Alice, she evaded a direct reply, betraying only by her anxious looks fastened on the slightest movements of her captors. To the reiterated and earnest questions of her sister concerning their probable destination, she made no other answer than by pointing toward the dark group with an agitation she could not control, and murmuring as she folded Alice to her bosom, There, there, read our fortunes in their faces. We shall see, we shall see. The action and the choked utterance of Cora spoke more impressively than any words, and quickly drew the attention of her companions on that spot where her own was riveted with an intenseness that nothing but the importance of the stake could create. When Mako reached the cluster of lolling savages, who, gorged with their disgusting meal, lay stretched on the earth in brutal indulgence, he commenced speaking with the dignity of an Indian chief. The first syllables he uttered had the effect to cause his listeners to raise themselves in attitudes of respectful attention. As the Huron used his native language, the prisoners, notwithstanding the caution of the natives had kept them within swing of their tomahawks, could only conjecture the substance of his harangue from the nature of those significant gestures with which an Indian always illustrates his eloquence. At first, the language as well as the action of Maqua appeared calm and deliberative. When he had succeeded in sufficiently awakening the attention of his comrades, Hayward fancied, by his pointing so frequently toward the direction of the Great Lakes, that he spoke of the land of their fathers and of their distant tribe. Frequent indications of applause escaped the listeners, who, as they uttered the expressive huh! looked at each other, in commendation to the speaker. Le Renard was too skillful to neglect his advantage. He now spoke of the long and painful route by which they had left those spacious grounds and happy villages to come in battle against the enemies of their Canadian fathers. He enumerated the warriors of the party, their several merits, their frequent services to the nation, their wounds, the number of scalps they had taken, Whenever he alluded to any present, and the subtle Indian neglected none, the dark countenance of the flattered individual gleamed with exultation. Nor did he even hesitate to assert the truth of the words, by gestures of applause and confirmation. Then the voice of the speaker fell and lost the loud animated tones of triumph with which he had enumerated their deeds of success and victory. He described the cataract of glens, the impregnable position of its rocky island, with its caverns and its numerous rapids and whirlpools. 
he named the name of La Longue Carabine, and paused until the forest beneath them had sent up the last echo of a loud and long yell, with which the hated appellation was received. He pointed toward the youthful military captive, and described the death of a favorite warrior, who had been precipitated into the deep ravine by his hand. He not only mentioned the fate of him who, hanging between heaven and earth, had presented such a spectacle of horror to the whole band, but he acted anew the terrors of his situation, his resolution, and his death on the branches of a sapling. And, finally, he rapidly recounted the manner in which each of their friends had fallen, never failing to touch upon their courage and their most acknowledged virtues. When this recital of events was ended, his voice once more changed, and became plaintive and even musical in its low guttural sounds. He now spoke of the wives and children of the slain, their destitution, their misery, both physical and moral, their distance, and at last of their unavenged wrongs. Then, suddenly lifting his voice to a pitch of terrific energy, he concluded by demanding, Are the Huron's dogs to bear this? Who shall say to the wife of Nanaqua that the fishes have his scalp, and that his nation have not taken revenge? Who will dare meet the mother of Wasatimi? That scornful woman, with his hands clean? What shall be said to the old men when they ask us for scalps? And we have not a hair from a white head to give them. The women will point their fingers at us. There's a dark spot on the name of the Hurons, and it must be hid in blood. His voice was no longer audible in the burst of rage which now broke into the air, as if the wood, instead of containing so small a band, was filled with the nation. During the foregoing address, the progress of the speaker was too plainly read by those most interested in his success through the medium of the countenances of the men he addressed. They had answered his melancholy in mourning by sympathy and sorrow, his assertions by gestures of confirmation, and his boasting with the exultation of savages. When he spoke of courage, their looks were firm and responsive. When he alluded to their injuries, their eyes kindled with fury. When he mentioned the taunts of the women, they dropped their heads in shame. But when he pointed out their means of vengeance, he struck a chord which never failed to thrill in the breast of an Indian. With the first intimation that it was within their reach, the whole band sprang upon their feet as one man. Giving utterance to their rage in the most frantic cries, they rushed upon their prisoners in a body with drawn knives and uplifted tomahawks. Hayward threw himself between the sisters and the foremost, whom he grappled with a desperate strength that for a moment checked his violence. The unexpected resistance gave Maqua time to interpose, and with rapid enunciation and animated gesture, he drew the attention of the band again to himself. In that language he knew so well how to assume, he diverted his comrades from their instant purpose, and invited them to prolong the misery of their victims. His proposal was received with acclamations, and executed with the swiftness of thought. Two powerful warriors cast themselves on Hayward, while another was occupied in securing the less active singing master. Neither of the captives, however, submitted without a desperate, though fruitless struggle. Even David hurled his assailant to the earth, nor was Hayward secured until the victory over his companion enabled the Indians to direct their united force on that object. He was then bound and fastened to the body of the sapling, on whose branches Maqua had acted the pantomime of the falling Huron. When the young soldier regained his recollection, he had the painful certainty before his eyes that a common fate was intended for the whole party. On his right was Cora, in a durance similar to his own, pale and agitated, but with an eye whose steady look still read the proceedings of their enemies. On his left, the wives which bound her to a pine 
performed that office for Alice, which her trembling limbs refused, and alone kept her fragile form from sinking. Her hands were clasped before her in prayer, but instead of looking upward, toward the power which alone could rescue them, her unconscious looks wandered to the countenance of Duncan, with infantile dependency. David had contended, and the novelty of the circumstance held him silent, in deliberation of the propriety of the unusual occurrence. The vengeance of the Hurons had now taken a new direction, and they prepared to execute it with that barbarous ingenuity with which they were familiarized by the practice of centuries. Some sought not to raise the blazing pile. One was riving the splinters of pine, in order to pierce the flesh of their captives with the burning fragments, and others bent the tops of two samplings to the earth, in order to suspend Hayward by the arms between the recoiling branches. But the vengeance of Maqua sought a deeper and more malignant enjoyment. While the less refined monsters of the band prepared before the eyes of those who were to suffer those well-known and vulgar means of torture, he approached Cora, and pointed out, with the most malign expression of countenance, the speedy fate that awaited her. Ha! he added, what says the daughter of Monroe? Her head is too good to find a pillow in the wigwam of Le Renard. Will she like it better? when it rolls about this hill, a plaything for the wolves? Her bosom cannot nurse the children of a Huron. She will see it spit upon by Indians. What means the monster? demanded the astonished Hayward. Nothing, was the firm reply. He is a savage, a barbarous and ignorant savage, and knows not what he does. Let us find leisure with our dying breath, to ask for him penitence and pardon. Pardon! echoed the fierce Chiron, mistaking in his anger the meaning of her words. The memory of an Indian is no longer than the arm of the pale faces. His mercy shorter than their justice. Say, shall I send the yellow hair to her father, and will you follow Maqua to the Great Lakes to carry his water and feed him with corn? Cora beckoned him away, with an emotion of disgust she could not control. "'Leave me!' she said, with a solemnity that for a moment checked the barbarity of the Indian. "'You mingle bitterness with my prayers. You stand between me and my God!' The slight impression produced on the savage was, however, soon forgotten, and he continued, pointing with taunting irony toward Alice. "'Look, the child weeps!' She's too young to die. Send her to Monroe to comb his gray hairs and keep life in the heart of the old man. Cora could not resist the desire to look upon her youthful sister, in whose eyes she met an imploring glance that betrayed the longings of nature. What says he, dearest Cora? asked the trembling voice of Alice. Did he speak of sending me to her father? For many moments the elder sister looked upon the younger, with a countenance that wavered with powerful and contending emotions. At length she spoke, though her tones had lost their rich and calm fullness, in an expression of tenderness that seemed maternal. Alice, she said, the Huron offers us both life. Nay, more than both, he offers to restore Duncan, our invaluable Duncan, as well as you to our friends, to our father, to our heart-stricken, childless father, if I will bow down this rebellious, stubborn pride of mine, and consent. Her voice became choked, and clasping her hands she looked upward, as if seeking, in her agony, intelligence from a wisdom that was infinite. Say on, cried Alice. To what, dearest Cora? Oh, that the proffer were made to me, to save you, to cheer our aged father, to restore Duncan. How cheerfully would I die! Die, repeated Cora, with a calmer and firmer voice. That were easy. Perhaps the alternative may not be less so. He would have me 
she continued, her accents sinking under a deep consciousness of the degradation of the proposal. Follow him to the wilderness. Go to the habitations of the Hurons, to remain there, in short, to become his wife. Speak then, Alice, child of my affections, sister of my love, and you too, Major Hayward, aid my weak reason with your counsel. Is life to be purchased by such a sacrifice? Will you, Alice, receive it at my hands at such a price? And you, Duncan, guide me, control me between you, for I am wholly yours. Would I? echoed the indignant and astonished youth. Cora, Cora, you jest with our misery. Name not the horrid alternative again. The thought itself is worse than a thousand deaths. That such would be your answer I well knew, exclaimed Cora, her cheeks flushing, and her dark eyes once more sparkling with the lingering emotions of a woman. What says my Alice? For her I will submit without another murmur although both Hayward and Cora listened with painful suspense and the deepest attention. No sounds were heard in reply. It appeared as if the delicate and sensitive form of Alice would shrink into itself as she listened to this proposal. Her arms had fallen lengthwise before her, the fingers moving in slight convulsions, her head dropped upon her bosom, and her whole person seemed suspended against the tree, looking like some beautiful emblem of the wounded delicacy of her sex, devoid of animation and yet keenly conscious. In a few moments, however, her head began to move slowly, a deep sign of unconquerable disapprobation. No, no, no! Better that we die as we have lived, together! Then die! shouted Maqua, hurling his tomahawk with violence at the unresisting speaker, and gnashing his teeth with a rage that could no longer be bridled at this sudden exhibition of firmness in the one he believed the weakest of the party. The axe cleaved the air in front of Hayward, and cutting some of the flowing ringlets of Alice, quivered in the tree above her head. The sight maddened Duncan to desperation. Collecting all his energies in one effort, he snapped the twigs which bound him, and rushed upon another savage, who was preparing, with loud yells and a more deliberate aim, to repeat the blow. They encountered, grappled, and fell to the earth together. The naked body of his antagonist afforded Hayward no means of holding his adversary, who glided from his grasp, and rose again with one knee on his chest, pressing him down with the weight of a giant. Duncan already saw the knife gleaming in the air, when a whistling sound swept past him, and was rather accompanying than followed by the sharp crack of a rifle. He felt his breast relieved from the load it had endured. He saw the savage expression of his adversary's countenance change to a look of vacant wildness, when the Indian fell dead on the faded leaves by his side. End of Chapter 11 This reading by Gary W. Sherwin of Yukon, Pennsylvania, in the summer of 2007. Chapter 12 of The Last of the Mohicans, a narrative of 1757 by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 12 Quote, Clo, I am gone, sire, and anon, sire, I'll be with you again. Unquote. From Twelfth Night The Hurons stood aghast of this sudden visitation of death on one of their band. But as they regarded the fatal accuracy of an aim which had dared to immolate an enemy at so much hazard to a friend, the name of Le Long Carabine 
burst simultaneously from every lip, and was succeeded by a wild and sort of plaintive howl. The cry was answered by a loud shout from a little thicket, where the incautious party had piled their arms, and at the next moment Hawkeye, too eager to load the rifle he had regained, was seen advancing upon them, brandishing the clubbed weapon, and cutting the air with wide and powerful sweeps. Bold and rapid was the progress of the scout. It was exceeded by that of a light and vigorous form, which, bounding past him, leaped with incredible activity and daring into the very center of the Hurons, where it stood, whirling a tomahawk and flourishing a glittering knife, with fearful menaces, in front of Cora. Quicker than the thoughts could follow those unexpected and audacious movements, an image, armed in the emblematic panoply of death, glided before their eyes, and assumed a threatening attitude at the other side. The savage tormentors recoiled before these warlike intruders, and uttered as they appeared in such quick succession the often repeated and peculiar exclamations of surprise, followed by the well-known and dreaded appellations of Les Serfagils! Les Gros Serpent! But the wary and vigilant leader of the Hurons was not so easily disconcerted. Casting his keen eyes around the little plain, he comprehended the nature of the assault at a glance, and encouraging his followers by his voice, as well as by his example, he unsheathed his long and dangerous knife, and rushed with a loud hoop upon the expected Chinchkachkok. It was the signal of a general combat. Neither party had firearms, and the contest was to be decided in the deadliest manner, hand to hand, with weapons of offense and none of defense. Uncas answered the hoop, and leaping on an enemy, with a single well-directed blow of his tomahawk, cleft him to the brain. Hayward tore the weapon of Maqua from the sapling, and rushed eagerly toward the fray. As the combatants were now equal in number, each singled an opponent from the adverse band. The rush and blows passed with the fury of a whirlwind, and the swiftness of lightning. Hawkeye soon got another enemy within reach of his arm, and with one sweep of his formidable weapon, he beat down the slight and inartificial defenses of his antagonist, crushing him to earth with the blow. Hayward ventured to hurl the tomahawk he had seized too, ardent to await the moment of closing. It struck the Indian he had selected on the forehead, and checked for an instant his onward rush. Encouraged by this slight advantage, the impetuous young man continued his onset, and sprang upon his enemy with naked hands. A single instant was enough to assure him of the rashness of the measure, for he immediately found himself fully engaged, with all his activity and courage, in endeavoring to ward the desperate thrust made with the knife of the Huron. Unable longer to foil an enemy so alert and vigilant, he threw his arms about him, and succeeded in pinning the limbs of the other to his side, with an iron grasp, but one that was far too exhausting to himself to continue long. In this extremity he heard a voice near him shouting, Exterminate the varlets! No quarter to an accursed Mingo! At the next moment the breech of Hawkeye's rifle fell on the naked head of his adversary, whose muscles appeared to wither under the shock, as he sank from the arms of Duncan, flexible, and motionless. When Uncas had brained his first antagonist, he turned like a hungry lion to seek another. The fifth and only Huron disengaged at the first onset had paused a moment, and then seeing that all around him were employed in the deadly strife, he had sought, with hellish vengeance, to complete the baffled work of revenge. Raising a shout of triumph, he sprang toward the defenseless Cora sending his keen axe as the dreadful precursor of his approach. The tomahawk grazed her shoulder, and cutting the withes which bound her to the tree, left the maiden at liberty to fly. She eluded the grasp of the savage, and reckless of her own safety, threw herself on the bosom of Alice, striving with convulsed and ill-directed fingers to tear asunder the twigs which confined the person of her sister. Any other than a monster would have relented at such an act of generous devotion to the best and purest affection. 
but the breast of the Huron was a stranger to sympathy. Seizing Cora by the rich tresses which fell in confusion about her form, he tore her from her frantic hold, and bowed her down with brutal violence to her knees. The savage drew the flowing curls through his hand, and raising them on high with an outstretched arm, he passed the knife around the exquisitely molded head of his victim, with a taunting and exulting laugh. But he purchased this moment of fierce gratification with the loss of the fatal opportunity. It was just then the sight caught the eye of Uncas. Bounding from his footsteps, he appeared for an instant darting through the air, and descending in a ball, he fell on the chest of his enemy, driving him many yards from the spot, headlong and prostrate. The violence of the exertion cast the young Mohican at his side. They arose together, fought, and bled, each in his turn. But the conflict was soon decided. The tomahawk of Hayward and the rifle of Hawkeye descended on the skull of the Huron at the same moment that the knife of Uncas reached his heart. The battle was now entirely terminated, with the exception of the protracted struggle between Le Renard Septil and Le Gros Serpent. Well did these barbarous warriors prove that they deserved those significant names, which had been bestowed for deeds in former wars. When they engaged, some little time was lost in eluding the quick and vigorous thrust which had been aimed at their lives. Suddenly darting on each other, they closed and came to the earth, twisted together like twining serpents in pliant and subtle folds. At the moment when the victors found themselves unoccupied, the spot where these experienced and desperate combatants lay could only be distinguished by a cloud of dust and leaves, which moved from the center of the little plain toward its boundary, as if raised by the passage of a whirlwind. Urged by the different motives of filial affection, friendship, and gratitude, Hayward and his companions rushed with one accord to the place, encircling the little canopy of dust which hung above the warriors. In vain did Uncas dart around the cloud, with a wish to strike his knife into the heart of his father's foe. The threatening rifle of Hawkeye was raised and suspended in vain while Duncan endeavored to seize the limbs of the Huron, with hands that had appeared to have lost their power. Covered as they were with dust and blood, the swift evolutions of the combatants seemed to incorporate their bodies into one. The death-like looking figure of the Mohican and the dark form of the Huron gleamed before their eyes in such quick and confused succession that the friends of the former knew not where to plant the succoring blow. It is true that there were short and fleeting moments when the fiery eyes of Mokwa were seen glittering like fabled organs of the basilisk through the dusty wreath by which he was enveloped, and he read by those short and deadly glances the fate of the combat in the presence of his enemies. Ere, however, any hostile hand that could descend on his devoted head, its place was filled by the scowling visage of Chingachgook. In this manner, the scene of the combat was removed from the center of the little plain to its verge. Though Mohican now found an opportunity to make a powerful thrust with his knife, Maqua suddenly relinquished his grasp, and fell backward without motion, and seemingly without life. His adversary leaped on his feet making the arches of the forest ring with the shouts of triumph. "'Well done for the Delawares! Victory to the Mohicans!' cried Hawkeye, once more elevating the butt of the long and fatal rifle. "'A finishing blow from a man without a cross will never tell against his honor, nor rob him of his right to the scalp.' But at the very moment when the dangerous weapon was in the act of descending, the subtle Huron rolled swiftly from beneath the danger, over the edge of the precipice, and falling on his feet, was seen leaping with a single bound into the center of a thicket of low bushes that clung along its sides. The Delawares, who had believed their enemy dead, uttered their exclamation of surprise, and were following with speed and clamor like hounds in open view of the deer when a shrill and peculiar cry from the scout instantly changed their purpose, 
and recalled them to the summit of the hill. "'Twas like himself!' cried the inveterate forester, whose prejudice contributed so largely to veil his natural sense of justice in all matters which concerned the Mingos. "'A lying and deceitful varlet as he is! An honest Delaware now, being fairly vanquished, would have lain still, and been knocked on the head. But these navy schmaquas cling to life like so many cats of the mountain. Let him go, let him go. Tis but one man, and he without rifle or bow, many a long mile from his French comrades. And like a rattler that lost his fangs, he can do no further mischief, until such time as he and we too may leave the prints of our moccasins over a long reach of sandy plain. See, Uncas, he added in Delaware, your father is flaying the scalps already. It may be well to go around and fill the vagabonds that are left, or we may have another of them loping through the woods, and screeching like a jay that has been winged. So saying, the honest but implacable scout made the circuit of the dead, into whose senseless bosoms he thrust his long knife, with as much coolness as though they had been so many brute carcasses. He had, however, been anticipated by the elder Mohican, who had already torn the emblems of victory from the unresisting heads of the slain. But Uncas, denying his habits, we had almost said his nature, flew with instinctive delicacy, accompanied by Hayward, to the assistance of the females, and quickly releasing Alice, placed her in the arms of Cora. We shall not attempt to describe the gratitude of the almighty disposer of events, which glowed in the bosoms of the sisters, who were thus unexpectedly restored to life and to each other. Their thanksgivings were deep and silent, the offerings of their gentle spirits burning brightest and purest on the secret altars of their hearts, and their renovated and more earthly feelings exhibiting themselves in long and fervent, though speechless, caresses. As Alice rose from her knees, where she had sunk by the side of Cora, she threw herself on the bosom of the latter, and sobbed aloud the name of their aged father, while her soft and dove-like eyes sparkled with rays of hope. "'We are saved! We are saved!' she murmured. "'To return to the arms of our dear, dear father, and his heart will not be broken with grief!' And you too, Cora, my sister, my more than sister, my mother, you too are spared. And Duncan, she added, looking around upon the youth with a smile of ineffable innocence, even our own brave and noble Duncan has escaped without a hurt. To these ardent and nearly innocent words, Cora made no other answer than by straining the youthful speaker to her heart as she bent over her in melting tenderness. The manhood of Hayward felt no shame in dropping tears over this spectacle of affectionate rapture, and Uncas stood, fresh and blood-stained from the combat, a calm and apparently an unmoved looker-on, it is true, but with eyes that had already lost their fierceness, and which were beaming with a sympathy that elevated him far above the intelligence, and advanced him probably centuries before the practices of his nation. During this display of emotions, so natural in their situation, Hawkeye, whose vigilant distrust had satisfied itself that the Hurons who disfigured the heavenly scene no longer possessed the power to interrupt its harmony, approached David and liberated him from the bonds he had, until that moment, endured with the most exemplary patience. There, exclaimed the scout, casting the last wife behind him. You are once more master of your own limbs, though you seem not to use them with much greater judgment than that in which they were first fashioned. If advice from one who is not older than yourself, but who, having lived most of his time in the wilderness, may be said to have experience beyond his years, will give no offense, you are welcome to my thoughts, and these are, to part with the little tooting instrument in your jacket to the first fool you meet with, and buy some weapon with the money, 
if it only be the barrel of a horseman's pistol. By industry and care you might thus come to some preferment, for by this time, I should think, your eyes would plainly tell you that a carrion crow is a better bird than a mocking thresher. The one will at least remove foul sights from before the face of man, while the other is only good to brew disturbances in the woods, by cheating the ears of all that hear them. Arms and clarion for the battle, but the song of thanksgiving to the victory, answered the liberated David. Friend, he added, thrusting forth his lean, delicate hand toward Hawkeye, in kindness, while his eyes twinkled and grew moist, I thank thee that the hairs of my head still grow, where they first rooted by providence. For though those of other men may be more glossy and curling, I have ever found mine own well suited to the brain they shelter. That I did not join myself in the battle was less owing to disinclination than to the bonds of the heathen. Valiant and skillful hast thou proved thyself in the conflict, and I hereby thank thee, before proceeding to discharge other and more important duties, because thou hast proved thyself well worthy of a Christian's praise. The thing is but a trifle, and what you may often see if you tarry long among us, returned the scout, a good deal softened toward the man of song by this unequivocal expression of gratitude. I have got my old companion, Kildeer, he added, striking his hand on the breech of his rifle, and that in itself is a victory. These Iroquois are cunning, but they outwitted themselves when they placed their firearms out of reach. And, had Uncas or his father been gifted with only their common Indian patience, we should have come in upon the knaves with three bullets instead of one, and that would have made a finish of the whole pack, yon loping varlet as well as his comrades. But twas all forwarded, and for the best. Thou sayest well, returned David, and hast caught the true spirit of Christianity. He that is to be saved will be saved and he that is predestined to be damned will be damned. This is the doctrine of truth, and most consoling and refreshing it is to the true believer. The scout, who by this time was seated, examining into the state of his rifle with a species of parental assiduity, now looked up at the other in a displeasure that he did not effect to conceal, roughly interrupting further speech. Doctrine or no doctrine, said the sturdy woodsman, tis the belief of knaves and the curse of an honest man. I can credit that yonder Huron was to fall by my hand, for with my own eyes I have seen it. But nothing, short of being a witness, will cause me to think he has met with any reward, or that Chingachcook there will be condemned at the final day. You have no warranty for such an audacious doctrine, nor any covenant to support it, cried David, who was deeply tinctured with the subtle distinctions which in his time, and more especially in his province, had been drawn around the beautiful simplicity of revelation, by endeavoring to penetrate the awful mystery of the divine nature, supplying faith by self-sufficiency and by consequence involving those who reason from such human dogmas in absurdities and doubt. Your temple is reared on the sands, and the first tempest will wash away its foundation. I demand your authorities for such an uncharitable assertion. Like other advocates of a system, David was not always accurate in his use of terms. Name chapter and verse. In which of the holy books do you find language to support you? Book, repeated Hawkeye, with singular and ill-concealed disdain. Do you take me for a whimpering boy at the apron string of one of your old gals, and this good rifle on my knee for the feather of a goose's wing, my ox's horn for a bottle of ink, and my leathern pouch? for a cross-barred handkerchief to carry my dinner? 
Book? What have such as I, who am a warrior of the wilderness, though a man without a cross, to do with books? I never read but in one, and the words that are written there are too simple and too plain to need much schooling, though I may boast that of forty long and hard-working years. What call you the volume? said David, misconceiving the other's meaning. "'Tis open before your eyes,' returned the scout, "'and he who owns it is not a niggard of its use. "'I have heard it said that there are men who read in books "'to convince themselves there is a God. "'I know not but man may so deform his works in the settlement "'as to leave that which is so clear in the wilderness "'a matter of doubt among traders and priests. "'If any such there be, and he will follow me from sun to sun, through the windings of the forest, he shall see enough to teach him that he is a fool, and the greatest of his follies lies in striving to rise to the level of one he can never equal, be it in goodness or be it in power. The instant David discovered that he battled with a disputant who imbibed his faith from the lights of nature, eschewing all subtleties of doctrine, he willingly abandoned a controversy from which he believed neither profit nor credit was to be derived. While the scout was speaking, he had also seated himself, and producing the ready little volume and the iron-rimmed spectacles, he prepared to discharge a duty which nothing but the unexpected assault he had received in his orthodoxy could have so long suspended. He was, in truth, a minstrel of the western continent, of a much later day. Certainly than those gifted bards, who formerly sang the profane renown of baron and prince, but after the spirit of his own age and country, he was now prepared to exercise the cunning of his craft, in celebration of, or in rather thanksgiving of, the recent victory. He waited patiently for Hawkeye to cease, then, lifting his eyes together with his voice, he said aloud, I invite you, friends, to join in praise for the signal deliverance from the hands of barbarians and infidels to the comfortable and solemn tones of the tune called Northampton. Next he named the page and verse where the rhymes selected were to be found, and applied the pitch-pipe to his lips, with a decent gravity that he had been wont to use in the temple. This time he was, however, without any accompaniment, for the sisters were just then pouring out those tender effusions of affections which have already been alluded to. Nothing deterred by the smallness of his audience, which in truth consisted only of the discontented scout, he raised his voice, commencing and ending the sacred song without accident or interruption of any kind. Hawkeye listened while he coolly adjusted his flint and reloaded his rifle. But the sounds, wanting the extraneous assistance of scene and sympathy, failed to awaken his slumbering emotions. Never minstrel, or by whatever more suitable name David should be known, drew upon his talents in the presence of more insensible auditors. Though, considering the singleness and sincerity of his motive, it is probable that no bard of profane song ever uttered notes that ascended so near to that throne where all homage and praise is due. The scout shook his head, and muttering some unintelligible words, among which throat and Iroquois were alone audible, he walked away to collect and to examine into the state of the captured arsenal of the Hurons. In this office, he was now joined by Chingachgook, who found his own as well as the rifle of his son among the arms. Even Hayward and David were furnished with weapons, nor was ammunition wanting to render them all effectual. When the foresters had made their selection and distributed their prizes, the scout announced that the hour had arrived when it was necessary to move. By this time, the song of Gamut had ceased and the sisters had learned to still the exhibition of their emotions. Aided by Duncan and the younger Mohican, 
the two latter descended the precipitous sides of that hill, which they had so lately ascended under so very different auspices, and whose summit had so nearly proved the scene of their massacre. At the foot they found the Narragansetts browsing the herbage of the bushes, and having mounted, they followed the movements of a guide, who in the most deadly straits had so often proved himself their friend. The journey was, however, short. Hawkeye, leaving the blind path that the Hurons had followed, turned short to his right, and entering the thicket, he crossed a babbling brook, and halted in a narrow dell, under the shade of a few water-elms. Their distance from the base of the fatal hill was but a few rods, and the steeds had been serviceable only in crossing the shallow stream. The scout and the Indians appeared to be familiar with the sequestered place, where they now were. For, leaning their rifle against the trees, they commenced throwing aside the dried leaves, and opening the blue clay out of which a clear and sparkling spring of bright glancing water quickly bubbled. The white men then looked about him as though seeking for some object, which was not to be found as readily as he expected. Them careless imps, the Mohawks, with their Tuscarora and Onondaga brethren, have been here slaking their thirst, he muttered, and the vagabonds have thrown away the gourd. This is the way with benefits, when they are bestowed on such dismembering hounds. Here has the Lord laid his hand in the midst of the howling wilderness for their good, and raised a fountain of water from the bowels of the earth that might laugh at the richest shop of apothecaries ware in all the colonies. And see, the knaves have trodden in the clay, and deformed the cleanliness of the place, as though they were brute beasts instead of human men. Uncas silently extended toward him the desired gourd, which the spleen of Hawkeye had hitherto prevented him from observing on a branch of an elm. Filling it with water, he retired a short distance to a place where the ground was more firm and dry. Here he coolly seated himself, and after taking a long and apparently a grateful draught, he commenced a very strict examination of the fragments of food left by the Hurons, which had hung in a wallet on his arm. "'Thank you, lad,' he continued, returning the empty gourd to Uncas. Now we will see how these rampaging Hurons lived when outlying in ambushments. Look at this. The varlets know the better pieces of the deer, and one would think they might carve and roast a saddle equal to the best cook in the land. But everything is raw, for the Iroquois are thorough savages. Uncas, take my steel and kindle a fire. A mouthful of tender boil will give nature a helping hand after so long a trail. Hayward, perceiving that their guides now set about their repast in sober earnest, assisted the ladies to alight, and placed himself at their side, not unwilling to enjoy a few moments of grateful rest, after the bloody scene he had just gone through. While the culinary process was in hand, curiosity induced him to inquire into the circumstances which had led to their timely and unexpected rescue. "'How is it that we see you so soon, my generous friend?' he asked. "'And without aid from the garrison of Edward. Had we gone to the bend of the river, we might have been in time to rake the leaves over your bodies. But too late to have saved your scalps,' coolly answered the scout. "'No, no. Instead of throwing away strength and opportunity by crossing to the fort, we lay by under the bank of the Hudson.' waiting to watch the movements of the Hurons. "'You were, then, witnesses of all that passed?' "'Not of all, for Indian sight is too keen to be easily cheated. And we kept close. A difficult matter it was, too, to keep this Mohican boy snug in the ambushment. Ah, Uncas, Uncas, your behavior was more like that of a curious woman.' than of a warrior on his scent. Uncas permitted his eyes to turn for an instant on the sturdy countenance of the speaker, but he neither spoke nor gave any indication of repentance. On the contrary, Hayward thought the manner of the young Mohican was disdainful 
if not a little fierce, and that he suppressed passions that were ready to explode, as much in compliment to the listeners as from the deference he usually paid to his white associate. "'You saw our capture?' Hayward next demanded. "'We heard it,' was the significant answer. An Indian yell is plain language to men who have passed their days in the woods. But when you landed, we were driven to crawl like serpents beneath the leaves, and then we lost sight of you entirely, until we placed eyes on you again, trust to the trees, and ready bound for an Indian massacre. Our rescue was the deed of providence. It was nearly a miracle that you did not mistake the path, for the Hurons divided and each band had its horses. Aye, there we were thrown off the scent, and might, indeed, have lost the trail, had it not been for Uncas. We took the path, however, that led into the wilderness, for we judged, and judged rightly, that the savages would hold that course with their prisoners. But when we had followed it for many miles, without finding a single twig broken, as I had advised, my mind misgave me, especially as all the footsteps had the prints of moccasins. Our captors had the precaution to see us shod like themselves, said Duncan, raising a foot and exhibiting the buckskin he wore. Aye, t'was judgmatical, and like themselves, though we were too expert to be thrown from a trail by so common an invention. To what, then, are we indebted for our safety? To what, as a white man who has no taint of Indian blood, I should be ashamed to own? To the judgment of the young Mohican, in matters which I should know better than he, but which I can now hardly believe to be true, though my own eyes tell me it is so. "'Tis extraordinary! Will you not name the reason?" Uncas was bold enough to say that the beast ridden by the gentle ones, continued Hawkeye, glancing his eyes not without curious interest on the fillies of the ladies, planted the legs of one side on the ground at the same time, which is contrary to the movements of all trotting four-footed animals of my knowledge except the bear. And yet here are horses that always journey in this manner as my own eyes have seen, and as their trail has shown for twenty long miles. "'Tis the merit of the animal. They come from the shores of Narragansett Bay, in the small province of Providence Plantations, and are celebrated for their hardihood and the ease of this peculiar movement, though other horses are not unfrequently trained to the same. It may be, it may be, said Hawkeye, who had listened with singular attention to this explanation. Though I am a man who has the full blood of the whites, my judgment in deer and beaver is greater than in beast of burden. Major Effingham has many noble charges, but I have never seen one travel with such a siding gait. True, for he would value the animals for very different properties. Still is this a breed highly esteemed and, as you witness, much honored with the burdens it is often destined to bear. The Mohicans had suspended their operations about the glimmering fire to listen, and, when Duncan had done, they looked at each other significantly, the father uttering the never-failing exclamation of surprise. The scout ruminated, like a man digesting his newly acquired knowledge and once more stole a glance at the horses. "'I dare say there are even stranger sights to be seen in the settlements,' he said at length. "'Nature is sadly abused by man when he once gets the mastery. But go, siding or go straight, Uncas has seen the movement, and their trail led us on to the broken bush. The elder branch near the prince of one of the horses was bent upward, as a lady breaks a flower from its stem, but all the rest were ragged and broken down, as if the strong hand of a man had been tearing them. So I concluded that the cunning varmints 
had seen the twig bent, and had torn the rest to make us believe a buck had been feeling the boughs with his antlers. I do believe your sagacity did not deceive you, for some such thing occurred. That was easy to see, added the scout, in no degree conscious of having exhibited any extraordinary sagacity, and a very different matter it was from a waddling horse. It then struck me the Mingos would push for the spring, for the knaves well know the virtue of its waters. It is then so famous, demanded Hayward, examining with a more curious eye the secluded dell with its bubbling fountain, surrounded, as it was, by earth of a deep, dingy brown. Few redskins who travel south and east of the Great Lakes but have heard of its qualities. Will you taste for yourself? Hayward took the gourd, and after swallowing a little of the water, threw it aside with grimaces of discontent. The scout laughed, in his silent but heartfelt manner, and shook his head with vast satisfaction. Ah, you want the flavor that one gets by habit. The time was when I liked it as little as yourself. But I have come to my taste, and I now crave it as a deer does the licks. Footnote. Many of the animals of the American forest resort to those spots where salt springs are found. These are called licks, or salt licks, in the language of the country, for the circumstances that the quadruped is often obliged to lick the earth in order to obtain the saline particles. These licks are great places of resort with the hunters, who waylay their game near the paths that lead to them. End quote. Your high-spiced wines are not better light than a redskin relishes this water, especially when his nature is ailing. But Uncas has made his fire, and it is time we think of eating, for our journey is long and all before us. Interrupting the dialogue by this abrupt transition, the scout had instant recourse to the fragments of food which had escaped the veracity of the Hurons. A very summary process completed the simple cookery when he and the Mohicans commenced their humble meal with the silence and characteristic diligence of men who ate in order to enable themselves to endure great and unremitting toil. When this necessary and happily grateful duty had been performed, each of the foresters stooped and took a long and parting draught at that solitary and silent spring. Footnote. The scene of the foregoing incidents is on the spot where the village of Boston now stands, one of the two principal watering places of America. End footnote. Around which, and its sister fountains, within fifty years, the wealth, beauty, and talents of a hemisphere were to assemble in throngs, in pursuit of health and pleasure. Then Hawkeye announced his determination to proceed. The sisters resumed their saddles, Duncan and David grasped their rifles and followed on footsteps, the scout leading the advance and the Mohicans bringing up the rear. The whole party moved swiftly through the narrow path toward the north, leaving the healing waters to mingle unheeded with the adjacent brooks, and the bodies of the dead to fester on the neighboring mount. Without the rites of sepulchre, a fate but too common to the warriors of the woods, to excite either commiseration or comment. End of chapter 12. This reading by Gary W. Sherwin of Yukon, Pennsylvania, in the summer of 2007.